hold down your costs. They must be tied to something that's reasonable and not excessive. We've seen the example with credit card companies that when they were allowed the space to do it, they charged increased interest rates. We don't want the same thing to happen with insurance companies when it comes to Americans' health care. And that combined with, you know, really important provisions in this legislation that deal with attaching 85, ensuring that uh, insurance companies spend 85 percent um, on actual medical services and only 15 percent on overhead. This combination of enforcement mechanisms will make sure that whether you are participating in the exchange with a public option or you have individual health care coverage outside of that exchange with a private insurer that we will not see the We leave this recorded event to take you live back to the House Rules Committee now as the committee resumes its work on the House health care bill. Live coverage on C-SPAN 2. I believe I heard you, Mr. Chairman, 
uh, Rangel, uh, state that uh, 3962 saves uh, over $100 billion. Yes, I do. How much does it tax? The, what, what, what is the total tax amount in 3962? $556 billion. Mr. Rangel, would you mind speaking in the mic? I can't hear you because there's people in between. Okay, how's that? Better. I didn't hear your answer. $556 billion. dollars uh, Over $500 billion. Yes. And uh, how much, because I've heard different reports, and obviously you know, I'm doing my best to, to study the very extensive, very long uh, bill, um, at least the one that we have before us and have had it for now since uh, I believe it was Tuesday, uh, late Tuesday. Um, with regard to cuts to Medicare, uh, w w what is that number? About the same amount. What's the exact number? <laughs> So, so, so I mean, we're under a trillion dollars, but what we try to do is bring some balance in terms of taxing and uh, 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 cuts in uh, what we have waste. So about half and half, about five hundred billion and five hundred billion dollars exactly. tax increases and cuts to Medicare. Um, Chairman Yield. Sure, of course. Yeah, I, I just want, I, so that no one misunderstands what we're talking about with regard to Medicare. We're not talking about cutting uh, programs in Medicare or services in Medicare. We're talking about cutting fraud and waste and abuse in Medicare. Exactly. Thank as you. As a matter of fact, we are really not only cleaning up, but modernizing and taking advantage of a lot of recommendations that have been made. Some of them really political uh, things that we should have done a long time ago. But at the end of the day, uh, Medicare has a lost uh, a, a nickel of support, uh, but rather it, we have shifted around to make certain that we have savings where we should, where, where we have uh, uh, mismanagement, and to make the program stronger. Thank you. Like closing well, the 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 old things of that nature. Thank you. Uh, reclaiming my time and. Uh, uh, yeah, would just you very like? briefly, if, if the gentleman yield very briefly, let me just say, as we hear this talk about waste, fraud, and abuse within Medicare, I'm immediately reminded of an effort that we put together that should have been bipartisan, and I know that all of my colleagues will remember it. It was the reconciliation package in which we tried desperately to bring about very, very strong cuts that were focused on waste, fraud, and abuse within Medicare. And our we ultimately were only able to bring about $40 billion. We had about a 66 level at the House. It was uh, less than that in the Senate. We ended up, if you all recall, with $40 billion. We tried, it, it was like pulling teeth to try and get those cuts to deal with the issue of waste, fraud, and abuse. And guess what? And, and guess what, Mr. Chairman? I will tell you, I thank my friend for yielding. We were not able to have the support of Democratic members in that. So it's going to be very interesting to see as you look at $500 billion when we were barely able to get $40 billion passed in that reconciliation package uh, about five years ago, uh, what kind of success you're going to have. And our concern, of course, is that these cuts are going to be made right. into meaningful programs. I thank my friend. Well, no, I, no, and I... Well, and I Mr. Dreyer, that doesn't say much for effectiveness in getting the money in order to improve the system. We have to say a lot to our staff. We have to say a lot to agencies that take care of the agent and the poor. Right. So that, that's yeah. the reason why... Well, what support did we have back then to bring about these kinds of cuts is the question. I don't and know what you think you've done right, but the reason we think that we're right is because the private agencies and the people that uh, are anxious to improve the system, like AARP, have said you're doing the right thing. We've, we've had so many hearings. We've had people that come in that have this responsibility. So I can appreciate your frustration in not being successful, but those- Well, we were are. successful yeah. at $40 billion. I, yeah. I'm sorry. No, no, no problem, no, no problem. And, and of course. Look, when you talk about these Medicare savings, um, you know, 
And we are trying to implement what Med had and what we recommended as ways to cut back on waste for abuse. Now they're scored, of course, by the CBO. We're relying on the CBO score. I, mean, I, I don't have to tell anybody here that I think there are a lot of things that are in this bill that save a lot more than what CBO is telling us. And you can disagree with you know where that's whether CBO scores are accurate, but that's what we're using. I mean, we're using things that we've right. had hearings on and we of think. Course. How, how much in the dock fix? And by the way, and I appreciate very much, you know, the, the explanation on that other bill, which is separate. And Mr. Barton had a very, I think, interesting uh, uh, theory that I, I, I would uh, share uh, with regard to, to, to the reason of it. But, you know, the, I guess Mr. Barton and I may be speculating on that. With regard to the dock fix, which is something that we face periodically here, the, 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 the need to to shore up Medicare, how, how, how much of that is going uh, to uh, uh, precisely shore, shore up Medicare and its relation with physicians and other providers? In other words, how much are we helping Medicare in the doc fix? Oh. Fine. Very good. So that's the real world that I know here. The, no, if I may. The real world that I see here, I've been here, here 17 years, is that periodically under the Democrat, Republican Congress, Republican administration, now Democrat administration, we have a doc fix to provide more resources for Medicare. To provide more resources for Medicare, for payments, Medicare payments. Yeah. Yeah. Providing money for our right, uh, and through, that are participating in the Medicare program. Yes, yes. but that's necessarily deals directly with Medicare. No. We don't have doctors. We can't of, doctors. Course. of course, of course. But that's what I'm saying. The real world is where we have to come up, and we and we often do, with additional resources for people that are participating in the Medicare program. So when so when we talk about fraud and abuse that we're all supportive of reducing. It's a separate issue. I, come, I, I thank Chairman Rangel for having put on the record, admitted, that 3962 raises taxes by over or approximately 500 billion or more dollars uh, and uh, reduces funding for Medicare and also hundreds of billions of dollars. So I, I appreciate you put that on the record. Because the real, the real world that we see is dealt with with the other bill. But I'm trying to say that, now, that, that Medicare was reduced <coughs> that the amounts of money fraud, has been fraud and abuse. And all that. For example, for example, if I may, if I may. Uh, the uh, the uh, president's uh, Chief Medicare Actuary uh, predicts that as a result of the reductions to Medicare in this legislation, 3962, um, specifically cuts to the Mer Medicare Advantage program, which uh, I believe is a total of approximately $170 billion. That, um, Enrollment in plans, Medicare Advantage plans, will decline from approximately 13 million seniors uh, in 2014 uh, to less than 5 million uh, in, the, in a few years later. That's a significant, a significant decline. I, well, I, I was going to ask a question, and then, you want, and of course, you know, keep your thought because, my, when when there's a significant reduction because of cuts, for example, to Med Medicare Advantage, in the amount of seniors who are enrolled, and over 50,000 of them, you were in my district, uh, Mr. Pallone, we were happy to have you there. Fif over 50,000 seniors in my district are enrolled in Medicare Advantage programs. They will, they'll be more. I'm going to tell you why when you finish. Well, I look forward to you telling me why. Because, because what I saw the president 
pledge was that if you like your current plan, you can keep it. Now, when you have the administration's actuary say that there will be such a significant reduction that I just pointed out uh, in, in people participating in, in, in such plans, um, I see there a contradiction with the pledge of you can keep your current plan if you like it. Mr. Pallone. Let me give you why I love your example. I'm going to tell you why. Um, we have a commission that acts, and you can talk to this or not, but, you know, we listen to it periodically, that comes in and says Medicare Advantage is getting paid too much because so much of this extra money, 14%, I think it is, is going to pay for administration and executive salaries and not for actual benefits for the, for the uh, Medicare recipients. Okay, so based on that, we come up with that 170 billion. That if you eliminate the differential between Medicare Advantage and fee for service, you'll save the 170 billion dollars. I only have a CBO to go by. Right? What else am I going to use? Okay. Now, I know that in many parts of the country, including in Dade County, where you have that wonderful facility that I visited, that they're actually have a Medicare Advantage program that comes in at less than fee for service, okay? And they are able to do it because we, you know, I'm not trying, I know it sounds partisan, but I'm trying not to be. When this was put into place, you guys on the Republican side initially said, we want to have Medicare Advantage, but if we, if we pay the same, there'll be competition, capitalism, and we think that the private plans can compete even by getting paid the same. Well, in your, in Dade County, not only do they have Medicare Advantage, great plan, they come in at less than fee for service, right? Yes. So that's what we're saying here. We can save this 170, we get rid of all those bad Medicare Advantage plans that get paid administrative and, and, yeah. and using it for their own executive salaries, and we encourage the good guys like you have in Dade right. County who come in at less, they don't care because they're going to get, they're going to get their money and they're going to well, have the plan. In fact, I need to go further. In this bill, what I'm saying is what we're doing in this bill is we're saving this 170 by saying that whether you're private or you're public, Medicare Advantage or fee for service, we're going to pay you the same. And by doing that, we save $170 billion. There are a lot of Medicare Advantage plans, and, and, and the best one I've ever seen is in your county, that come in at less than fee for service and will, will be able to thrive if they continue to be paid the same. In fact, in the bill, if you're a good performing uh, Medicare Advantage plan that actually pays the benefits instead of paying for administration, we even give you, I think it's a two or three percent performance plus up. So somebody like you in Dade County who's doing a good job, they'll still get a little more because they're actually paying for additional benefits, not having that money go right. to the well, you know, that's, the... that's that's very interesting. And, right. And and as and as, I you, think as you saw, be more. as you saw when you visited Dade County, Miami Dade County, one of the reasons why plans like Leon, or uh, that family has been in that business for decades and decades and decades from Cuba, right? Where the concept of the HMO, the clinic, was this, uh, invented, right? Now it's a cultural, it's a cultural identification, prestige, you saw how they treat the patients. Yeah, but, what, I, but, but one I thing, but, 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 no, 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 by the way, and I'm glad, you know, and I'm glad, and I, and I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, you recognize and that you point out that in the legislation, plans like uh, the one that we all support in Miami-Dade County uh, are uh, but only if they're are, good performing and they're good. providing more. Of course, benefits. but what I'm trying to say is what I heard Mr. Rangel say before. And that is that it's a very diverse nation. And that, for example, when I've spoken to colleagues in this body from rural areas who have also visited us in Miami-Dade County and seen the spectacular success of plans like the one of Leon, for example. They say, we, 
in our rural area, because of the economic realities, the distances, et cetera, et cetera, other factors of which I'm not an expert, but they can't do it, in, it as efficiently as I don't, uh, in my I don't believe so, so, what I'm saying is, I agree with the point of, I think the chairman said, uh, one shoe doesn't fit all, or you, you, you know, you, yes. your language was, was very appropriate. That's one of the reasons why precisely I think this legislation is problematic. Now, another, another problem that I, I see in, the, uh, in 3962. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Is it possible to get one answer in so that at my age, you know, you can move it fast, but Go ahead. I just, the Go ahead. point that you make is yes. so near and dear to me because I have a district with Dominicans, uh, uh, Europeans, uh, everything, and, and also to this Congress, I, I was amazed how many caucuses that we have with people that have special needs and, and have to be treated in a special way by people who are familiar not just with the medicines, but with the people and the culture. So just to make certain that we are sensitive to that. We have pilot projects in here by the National Institution of Medicine to report back to whom? To us, to see how diverse are all these communities and what can we do, not just to provide medicine, but to have people who understand their culture, understand their problems. And, and Florida and New York are, are just communities that attract these people from different backgrounds. Now, we have a lot to do because not all of us know all of the differences that people feel. But believe me, uh, as long as I'm chairman, that committee is going to reflect our great country. Well, I appreciate this. Sir, uh, I, I just want to make a couple of points about Medicare Advantage, and that was one of the things I left out when the chair asked me what were some of the reforms Republicans did, and one was Medicare Advantage, which yes. for many rural, low-income, and minority Americans, that is their Medicare. We know 90 percent of seniors have some supplemental coverage, and for those who can't afford it, Medicare Advantage is that supplemental coverage. It gets them eye care, it gets them the coordination of care that we all want to try to advance in health care, the personalized treatment that they can get. And what this bill does is guts Medicare Advantage. And so millions of seniors are going to be displaced from the health care plan they have. This is actually a program that has been working. And I just want to say to Mr. Pallone, it is not 14 percent. We know that. What they do is they take those, that margin and plow that back in to benefits as they're required to do by law. Their margin is more about 4 percent. And that's been established in testimony before committees in the Congress. And so that is a margin that is very similar to what other nonprofit plans have. So I just think we need to set the record straight on what Medicare Advantage does. I, I, the millions of seniors who, take, who, who have extra benefits that they can't afford to pay because they don't have retirement through their corporate job or they don't have any other supplemental form of benefit. The other thing I would say is the cuts to Medicare are, are going to be devastating. Mm -hmm. And yet here this bill creates another government-run plan that is going to end up with the same problems in Medicare, where the only thing the government can do is come in and slice off choice, at which Medicare Advantage gives, benefits, uh, restricts payments to providers. Maybe they give them to the primary care doctors, but they don't give them to the hospitals or to the surgeons. So I think we have a real concern with the structure of this bill and what it does and the devastation it will do to Medicare Advantage and seniors across and I agree. this country. And I agree, because Medicare Advantage, one of the reasons it's been so successful is because it takes into account and adapts to the great differences that exist throughout America. It's interesting you, 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 you talk about the new entitlements, the new uh, uh, programs uh, being, being created. When, when Medicare was initially passed, this is, a, this is a, a, a statistic that impressed me and impacted me so much. It, the the uh, actuaries for the House Ways and Means Committee, they projected that by 1990, Medicare Part A would spend $9 billion, $9.1 billion on hospital service. The actual spending that took place in 1990 was almost $70 billion. In other words, almost 10 times the original estimate. So your point is very well taken, Mr. Kemp. When, when new programs are created, sometimes even with very good intentions, uh, we have to be cognizant of what we are creating and the costs 
that may be entailed for the future. Uh, yes, Mr. Pallone. Well, in Michigan, uh, 300,000 seniors will lose their Medicare Advantage plan. 81% of the seniors in Michigan, with our state unemployment rate of 15.3%, it's, it's going to wreak further havoc on a state that's struggling. And uh, I just wanted to put that number in the record. The well, I'd like to make sure that we have the opportunity to put in the record for every congressional district the increase in health care costs that will be given. We keep talking about the cut in Medicare. We should be talking about the increase in health care for any congressional district that we have. And so, and we have savings. I just wanted to briefly say, look, in response to what Mr. Camp said, all we're trying to do here is level the playing field. <coughs> what I'm saying is that there should be competition in a true capitalist sense between Medicare Advantage, which is private, and fee-for-service, okay? And there shouldn't be more money going to the private sector, meaning the Medicare Advantage, than there is to fee-for-service. And I believe strongly that if you have true competition at a level playing field, all right, you can still have some, you'll still have private that compete and are able to provide a benefit, a better benefit package like in your Dade County. And they, those good ones will thrive and will even get a little more money. You know, Dave, Mr. Kant mentioned, uh, you know, the, the public option versus the private. The same thing is true there. With this health exchange, we're saying level playing field. You've got the public option, you've got the private plans in the health exchange. Let them compete. You know, I think, frankly, a lot of the private plans will do a better job than public options, and people will choose them over the public option. And we have in the bill that they're getting negotiated rates as their reimbursement rate. They're both having negotiated rates. Level playing field. That's all we're asking. And if you look at CBO, they say you have the level playing field between Medicare Advantage and fee-for-service. You save that $170 billion. So take advantage of those savings and, and get it, let everybody compete at a level playing field. Well, it's a nice theory. Uh, the, the, uh, the problem that uh, many of us see with the concept of the public option competing, uh, the, the, the government competing, uh, is uh, uh, that ultimately uh, there will not be but competition. The, but I don't think, let me tell you why I don't think that's true. Some people, when they go out and buy a plan, they don't just necessarily buy the one that's cheaper. They want to know what doctors are in the plan, what it covers. The competition is going to be on every level. Private, some private plans may come in at less and charge less than the public option. Some may have more doctors, doctors you like or don't like, benefits you like or don't like. This is the kind of competition, the same thing you're going to get between Medicare Advantage and, and fee-for-service. Fee we're, you play that, you have that level playing field in both of these arenas. You will have competition and choice thrive. Let's see who wins out. We can come well, back five years later. I you know? respect your, your, uh, the belief in your, in your theory. You know, uh, however, we disagree. Uh, and the, one of the most, I think, concerning measures right now in this legislation um, especially when we see the economic situation we're in and the rising unemployment, is what I, I believe this legislation, if it passes, is going to do to small business and jobs. Uh, 
to create, in effect, an incentive, as I think this legislation does, for a small business to keep a low payroll uh, is exactly in the opposite, going in the opposite direction where I think we should be going to spur job growth. Uh, and, and I see that happening. I see that happening with this legislation. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a threshold in the legislation. If, you're, if your payroll is, is uh, uh, you know, under $500,000, I believe, you know, you don't have the mandates uh, that, uh, that you uh, otherwise would have if it's, it's, if it's over that. Imagine the incentive for a small business to keep the payroll low, either by firing people, reducing salaries. It's the wrong kind of incentive. I really believe that it's a fundamental, a structural problem with this legislation that's really going to hurt our employment situation. Let me ask it just one, one question that I, I and, and I appreciate uh, and I thank the colleagues for the consideration uh, of uh, uh, the consideration shown me, the fact that I've taken so much time in the panel. Uh, one final question. I see that if, if a business uh, is providing insurance that does not meet the requirements, the minimum requirements, minimal requirements of the mandate uh, to that business's workers, that there will be a, an 8% penalty applied to the, to the payroll. Now, is that to the payroll part paid for to the worker whose policy does not satisfy the mandate or to the entire small business's payroll? Small business payroll. The entire payroll. If, for example, now let, let's say that the small business has eight workers. Eight workers. Uh, uh, eight. What I'm trying to say, what, what I see in the legislation is that each worker's policy is going to have to meet a certain guideline, okay, a, a, a minimal requirement. Right. So what, I, what I'm trying to find is, determine is, is if a small business has some workers whose policies do meet the requirements, are, are sufficient pursuant to the requirement that will be set up, the mandate. No, no, not necessarily the same policy. A small business, let's say, let's say uh, 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 a, a, a small business has, uh, you know, they have different workers with different, uh, with different needs and different, different roles and, and, and with different policies. What if, my question is, if, or do you know, maybe, maybe this is to be let up, left up to the bureaucracy to determine later which is possible, I don't know. Do you know if some of the workers' policies are, do not meet the requirements of the mandate, are you going to set a penalty for what those workers are paid or for the entire payroll of the business of 8%? I, just, I don't understand the, the situation you're describing where a small business with a few employees, a handful of employees, would have different policies for each employee. No, no, but gentlemen, yield, yes. Oh, you. I used to work in the private sector for 16 years. I know that's a rare thing for members of Congress. Mr. Chairman, there are lots of businesses that have options mm -hmm. in their insurance. You can be given an option. Well, I'm yeah. trying to explain since yeah. you didn't understand it the first time. Me first, so go ahead and do whatever you want. Well, so the question is, for a clarification. well, I'm going to give it to you right now then. I didn't ask you first of all. Well, I'm, I'm helping him out because you directed at him. There are different options that are available, and the gentleman's asking a very simple question. If an employee chooses among the options that are available for the health care that they would choose to, and that is not one of the preferred or government-approved insurance plans, does the employer pay the 8% penalty, for, or does the employee... Yes, is the penalty paid for what that worker is paid, or is the penalty paid for for the entire payroll of the work, of the, of the business? That's a good question. Right. It's not hard. It, maybe, let me see if I can say it this way, and, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong. My understanding is that at some point, not in the beginning, but at some point 
after this goes into effect, five years, I think. Then there's a requirement that even within, even employer-sponsored plans have to have a minimum benefit package. So the option of buying a plan that does not have a minimum benefit package doesn't exist anymore. See, you're getting it exactly at the, the extent, the extent of the mandate the from Washington. And the detail of the mandate from Washington. Yeah, no, no, really. The German yield. I think Mr. Barton, and point, point, let me get a point. Five five years, years. Every package yeah. that's offered has to have a minimum benefit, and that 8% is, is what is, is, uh, would be charged if the employer decided not to offer that and the employees went into the Right. So what you're saying is that basically every existing policy is going to have to be changed. At some point, they're going to have to meet that minimum benefit. That's, that, that's, you know, that candor, that, that candor, that candor is appreciated. Well, just like the chairman, well, the candor with well, the, uh, the 500 billion plus tax increase. Every existing policy no. will be changed. No, no, no. Would, would the gentleman yield? Anyways, I, I, Mr. Camp would like to speak. Mr. Barton would like to speak. The panel. I just, I think. policies in the employer, uh, you know, the employers give now. Are, are at least out of not above, like over 90%. It's, it's, the problem isn't for people that are getting their insurance through their employer for the most part, it's for people that can't. So I mean, I don't know why you're-, you're No, no, about. my question was a, what I thought was a simple question. If, if you're a, sm a business and you have, you know, let's say you have 25 workers and the, the, the process that's being created by this legislation, the bureaucracy ends up determining that three of the workers' policies do not satisfy the minimal required to the mandate, that 8% penalty, is it charged on the, what those three workers are paid, or is it charged on the entire business' I I payroll? This. I believe it is on the, the, entire individual, business. the individual worker. If you've got a business that offers a plan, but one employee doesn't take that plan, for example, I believe the 8% is only based on that one employee. I think that's the question. Look, it doesn't work that way. But the authors, I would like the authors to confirm that. The way it works is that at that point, when you're offering this benefit package as an employer, you meet the minimum standards, which 90% do right now. If you don't offer the, if you don't offer your employees health insurance, and then they, you send them into the exchange, that's what you pay the 8%. As long as you're offering them insurance, you're just paying for that insurance. You're not paying the 8%. The whole idea of well, I appreciate you know, Mr. Camp pointing out what the authors, I think, are trying to get at. Uh, Mr. Barton. Imagine, first of all, these two good fellows <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, you better I run, Joe. <laughs> I, I didn't. First of all, they create a health benefits advisory committee who will recommend to a health choices administrator what the minimum benefit package will be. Which one we, we don't even that, know now. That right. could be something considerably different right. than the packages that have been negotiated between the employer and the insurance company. That's number one. Number two, if you're in a plan where it's not mandatory that you participate. And there are employer plans where, especially if you're single and don't have a family, uh, you don't have to participate in the plan, and, and so you get a little bit more in your paycheck because it's not deductible that's going to the, uh, going to, to pay for the premium. Then the question would be, under their mandate, since you have, there is an employer mandate, you have to provide the insurance unless you're below these minimums. And there is also an individual mandate that everybody has to have it. If you have an employee at a company who has not opted to be a part of the benefit plan for that company, and they choose a plan differently, who pays the differential in the premium then? That's, that would be the question I would ask my friends that negotiated this, this package, yeah, I, I, because that is a different I, I don't understand is why you're focusing on these things. I mean, the, the bottom no, line is... I want to know what's in the legislation, Yeah, right? but what I'm saying is, what you're trying... <laughs> 
Right now, the, the problem is that a lot of people can't get insurance through their employer. I know, I, the I, people I, that get insurance through employer, most of them, 90-some percent, have very good plans that are better than this minimum benefit well, package. Anyways. So you're focusing on, you know... Well, look, what I'm trying to do is to learn what's in the 2,000 pages, okay. to the best of my ability. Anyways, I thank you all, and Mr. Camp, thank you for proposing an alternative that significantly increases health care coverage uh, for, for Americans who do not have health care coverage and uh, does not raise taxes, does not hurt our economy. Thank you, and thank you all for your courtesy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you much, oh, very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm sure that this moment in history for you is particularly significant. Uh, in light of the fact that you do have a background in science and many of the issues uh, that are the worthwhile matters in this legislation you have uh, championed, as has Mr. Rangel, um, uh, for uh, the whole period of your careers. Added to that would be Mr. Miller and Mr. Dreyer, who have been here a long time and have seen the development of many of uh, the health care concerns uh, that have been addressed by legislation. And so I thank you all um, as I listen to you um, in your exchanges. And I'm here now a long time, too, being 18 years, my good friend and colleague, uh, Mr. diaz Villard, and I came here together. And among the things uh, that I think we do is complicate matters that are pretty uh, straightforward. Jane Lunchbucket, in my opinion, wants affordable health care and access to it. Uh, there are those that argue um, uh, that achieving comprehensive health care uh, reform is a way uh, that we can have sustainable, fiscally responsible um, uh, kinds of undertakings in our health care system. The facts are clear. Despite this country, uh, for the moment, being the richest country on earth, the United States ranks 45th in life expectancy and has startlingly high rates of infant mortality, depression, and chronic diseases. What's more, employer-sponsored health insurance premiums have grown six times faster than cumulative wage increases. And the recent economic crisis had made, has obviously made things much worse. This issue hits close to home, and it hits Mr. diaz Ballard and I, as many of you. I represent the third poorest congressional district in the United States of America and have one of the 14 particularly unique districts in that they are rural and urban. When my colleague speaks of rural hospitals and rural concerns, I know them. And I have that mix of urban and rural hospitals and concerns. Uh, toward that end, um, uh, Florida has the sixth highest number in this nation of uninsured people in the country. And the majority of those uninsured live down there where Mr. diaz Villard and I live. All of these uninsured people and the tens of million who are underinsured really are the prime justification for us to be here. And rightly, we should be addressing their concerns. However, despite the questionable need for intervention, some have sought to dominate the health care debate. Uh, and I've witnessed it, as have many of you with fear-mongering, misinformation, and really blind opposition to key reform elements or without offering substantive and high-quality alternatives. This perpetuation of fiction and misinterpretation is off-base and has steered the health care discussion off course. Let me add a moment of levity I did with my colleagues uh, a little while back. Dana Milback in the Washington Post reports today uh, that the persons that were here, and I applaud all of them yesterday for being here, and my colleagues in the minority uh, for their participation with that. I think that's the American way. 
and in a representative democracy, it was good to see people come here and express themselves in opposition to this bill, as is their right. But at the same time, five of them fell ill, and one had a heart, a heart attack, and all of them were treated by government uh, uh, health care. Uh, I, and I don't think any of them turned it down, and they're all alive today because our people here that protect us are protected them. What's true is that the United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, and yet the high cost of care has not brought a high standard of health care uh, for millions of Americans, and all of us know that. What's true is that Medicare which is a federal government program. And how many of you had people tell you, I don't want the government in my um, uh, business. I don't want them in my health care. And, uh, and I don't want them in my Medicare, as if the government doesn't run it. And I asked people in August, if you say the government can't do things, I guess we should get rid of uh, the National Institute of Health. I guess we should get rid of the Center for Disease Control. And I could go on and on. Um, but all things considered, What's true is that the bill does not facilitate um, yours, cost containment or fair competition in the insurance company market and increases, this one increases consumer access to medical providers. Now, I want to depart from that kind of scripted reference to just talk to you for a uh, hot second and then ask Mr. Camp and uh, Mr. Klein a question. First off, when we're talking about a trillion dollars, most people don't have a clue what you're talking about. And it's as if you're going to throw money into vapor. Um, uh, the money is going into the health care system. And the health care system is one of the only growth industries in America as we speak. And therefore, it isn't as if we are talking about waste. The tightening up of things, you talk about the cuts. The cuts are, are that are being offered are the exact same cuts that were offered during uh, the uh, balanced budget amendment under the Clinton administration that led us to a balanced budget. And therefore, don't come here talking about uh, pay-fors when, in fact, what you had in the minority when you were in the majority is a pres prescription drug uh, program uh, that was $400 billion that you didn't pay for. And it's almost as if we revise history around here and don't remember things. Toward that end, let me make one other thing clear. There are spin masters in this Congress, and we represent about 535 and six uh, uh, delegates, all who are masters of the English language. Uh, some better than others, and some that stay on message um, when they um, um, uh, decide to do something. I have heard uh, since the inception of this critical legislation from 3200 to where we are now, Nancy Pelosi's name used in every way. I said to someone um, about myself, if my dead mama was to see the things that people have said about me, she wouldn't even recognize me. So toward that end, this is not the Pelosi health care bill. She happens to be the speaker. Your substitute is not the Boehner substitute. He happens to be the minority leader. This is my bill. This is Charlie's bill. This is George's bill. This is Mr. Dingell's bill. It's going to be 220 more um, uh, Democrats' bill when all is said and done, and a whole lot of Americans' bill when uh, it comes down to it. Now, I want to straighten my colleague out, and he'll react, but I want Mr. Dreyer uh, to know that when he began this hearing, he said, first and only hearing that will be held on this issue. Well, Mr. McGovern rightly pointed out the deliberate, transparent, and open process that led to 100 hearings <coughs> on health care. I don't know any subject in the 18 years that I'm here, I don't know any subject in the entirety of my 73 years on life, in life that have consumed this much legislative time. So for anyone to argue, particularly those of you, Mr. Barton, that would argue that you have amendments that you were shut out of, Republican amendments were made in order and are a part of this bill. Those amendments that are here this evening that are going to take us absolutely too much time to deal with because it's useless and members know that, coming up here with what amounts to political stunts, those measures could have been in your substitute. And you're going to get a substitute. You heard the chair lady say that. So you could get a vote on the wonderful things that you are offering by way of amendment. And in addition to that, you're going to get a motion to recommit. And in the motion to recommit, you will surprise us or come up with whatever it is you wish to jack us up on. 
But when, uh, when Mr. Dreyer began, he, I'm sorry he's out of the room, he began saying this is the first and only hearing. I ask of him, Madam Chair, you've been here on the Rules Committee longer than all the rest of us. Tell me today that we have had multiple hearings on substantive le legislation in this body. I can tell you a time that we had a day and then another day, but we haven't had multiple hearings on substantive legislation. What kind of nonsense of the, uh, is that? And then about the television. One of the things that will make us make better uh, legislation in this Congress is if we didn't have no television. <laughs> um, they made better legislation when you and Charlie and George and those of you that have been here didn't have television. You didn't spend your time around here trying to do anything other than help the American people, other than trying to show off and say things that in the final analysis uh, are not just uh, according to Hoyle. Now, this gentleman right back here that's deceased was a good friend of all of us that knew Jerry. I travel both ways around the world while he was on um, uh, uh, the chair of this committee. And I wasn't on the committee, and he sought me out because we were friends. I bring Jerry up because to argue that television isn't in here, um, Jerry used this rules committee, this same room, and I sat in that corner the first time that I came up here during the Clinton impeachment uh, to use the stuff that was coming out from the grand jury to be utilized here. I don't begrudge him that. But to argue, as David did, that this is C-SPAN and this is the first time nobody has denied reporters an opportunity to be here late on into the night when we are here. One of the reasons the reporters aren't here is because all members is because what we do sometimes is boring. <laughs> and it's just that simple. So for people to argue differently uh, uh, troubles me greatly. Now, I've been here waiting to have universal health care, and let me ask a question of, uh, um, of Mr. Camp. Does your substitute, uh, and I mean the minority substitute, not Mr. Boehner, so I sure hope y'all stop throwing Ms. Pelosi's name around. It's my bill, too. So, um, uh, so then say it's the Hastings bill, then, along with Pelosi, or maybe just the two of us. But does your substitute um, in the minority leave people uninsured? Let me just say this about... You, could you about say our, yes about, or no, and then... Well, we believe that health care is too important to risk on one gigantic bill. And this bill, according to CBO, is a million, is a trillion two, a, a trillion four, if you add in the doctor bill that will be passed. And taxes are raised, the chairman said $500 billion. I would use the CBO score, which also includes the employer mandate tax, which really puts the number no. about 700, over 700. Mr. Camp, I'll take dollars. that as a no. But let me just say that what we're concerned about is the costs are going to go to government, to the 111 bureaucracies that are, are created by I hear you. Bill. Does your substitute what, leave what people do, uninsured? What we do is get on a step-by-step -step approach to comprehensive health care. And we do that by lowering premiums. We insure millions more. Does, does, does your matter leave like, people like, uninsured? Like your bill, which leaves 26 million people uninsured. How Our, many does yours? This bill does not get to universal coverage. It is a step-by-step -step to get to comprehensive coverage. But what we do... How, 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 long, how long would that take? Do, how long would well, that take? Well, it would take additional legislation. No, this not is necessarily. Not, let me, let, me, let me answer it a different way. Under the Republican substitute, anybody, in, and I mean anybody in America, that doesn't have insurance through their private workplace, that is, does not covered under Medicare or Medicaid, regardless of pre-existing condition, and wants to purchase or receive insurance, can get it. Can get it. Now, it's not mandated. We leave it up to the individual to make a decision. We don't have the individual mandate, we don't have the employee mandate, but we do say you are guaranteed coverage regardless of pre-existing conditions, and if you have coverage, it cannot be rescinded. Well, but we depend on the individual to make that decision okay, Mr. whether Martin. they want it or not. But, yeah, Ms. Barton, gentlemen, gentlemen I don't have the limited time. Though. Let me tell you something. Um, there's no question that your substitute is cheap, uh, but it does little 
in the final analysis to help uninsured people. And um, uh, the budget estimates, and I'll stop with this, Madam Chair, the budget estimates uh, allow uh, that you extend coverage to a few people um, who would otherwise be uninsured until uh, 2019. That's their analysis, not mine, not the Hastings-Pelosi bill. Um, uh, you leave 52 million citizens and legal residents below the Medicare age without coverage or about really 17% of the American population. Listen, guys and gals, the American public, the people in this country are people that are willing to share. There are people in Belglade and in South Bay and in Pahokee and all over this country that are hurting. And we need to get on with the business of trying to do what we can for them, not in 2013, 2019, but right now. And failure to do that is failure for all of us, Democrats, Republicans, the Pelosi, Hastings bill, and the Boehner and the rest of them, if we can't do that somehow or another. I thank you all. Will thank my friend you, yield, my friend I yield back my time. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Before we turn to Mr. Sessions, I would ask unanimous consent to put the statement of administrative policy in the record. I hate dry up with here. Madam Chairwoman, could we respond to some of what Congressman Hastings That was an uh, opening statement. Time, so please, I have to Thank you. That's a no. Uh, I think we're generous here. Uh, you have two. Uh, I didn't take a 15 minutes. Lincoln took 35. <laughs> and I thank you for your uh, courtesy. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. That I appreciate it. Uh, in the spirit of trying to allow response to gentlemen, uh, Mr. Barton, did you have? I, I just want to ask my friend, Mr. Bologna, a question in response to what Mr. Congressman Hastings said. He talked about this open, transparent process. Mr. McGovern also mentioned it. It is true that they have been a a number of hearings, and in the Energy and Commerce Committee, we had an extensive markup. That's allowed by the rules, and to some extent, should be required. That if you're going to, if it, it, you don't always take bills to the committee, but in this case, uh, Speaker Pelosi and, and the chairman and chairwomen did take the bills to the committee, and that's a good thing. So that's not a gift. That's just the regular order. But in the bill that's been put together by the committees and in the bill that was put together before we went to markup, my question to Mr. Pallone is, how many times did Mr. Waxman or you talk to me or Mr. Deal and invite us to actually participate in drafting those bills? Well, look, many times. Yeah, you, you may disagree with me, but look, this is what I would say. First of all, there were many times when we asked to, to sit down and actually did sit down. But I think it became clear at some point that, you know, that that wasn't fruitful. But that didn't mean that we were not constantly trying. As far as the hearings were concerned, I mean, there were six weeks of hearings. There was extensive markups. But, I mean, I'm always willing to sit down with you. You know that. Well, reclaiming, <laughs> reclaiming Mr. Sessions' time, we, we – I talked to Chairman Waxman, or Chairman Waxman talked to me several times about having a serious – negotiation to see if we could agree. And we had one meeting that you and Nathan and I, all four, were in, and we all agreed that we wanted to do it. That kept getting postponed until the day we were actually going to do it at 1230. And Chairman Waxman called me about 10 o'clock and said, we can't do the meeting. And I said, why not? He said, because we're announcing our bill. Now, don't sit here and tell the public that, that we, were, we chose not to participate. The only part we were allowed to participate in was the public part in the committee, which in the, in the case of the Energy and Commerce Committee, we did have about two weeks of markup. I, look, we I think I don't want to. I just think it's abundantly clear that as much as you and I and Nathan and Henry wanted to keep meeting, that it, we just weren't coming to an agreement. So. We never had a substantive discussion. Uh, I know. I was And I would. Uh, then I'll reclaim my time, and I appreciate feedback from the committee. I think that these are some substantive points that are made. Mr. Chairman Rangel, uh, when you had your uh, talk with us uh, several hours ago, you said you shouldn't have to worry about, people shouldn't have to worry about losing their coverage. And yet, 
the models that come out of the White House tells 4.7 to 5.5 million people are going to lose their job. Earlier when you spoke, yeah, I, I just repeated it. People shouldn't have to worry about losing their coverage. I'm talking about insurance. And yet we know in this bill that's going to get voted on, 4.7 to 5.5 million people are going to lose their jobs. Oh, you've never seen the economic outlook from the White House about 4.7 to 5.5 million? That this bill is going to lose yes, sir. jobs. No, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's not what we're selling. As a matter of fact, this yeah. bill is going to create jobs. It's going to create physicians, nurses. And you cannot put this much money out there and ensure people do not have an investment in the providers. Well, the, the society just could not digest. Okay, well, then, then let me try it another way. The gentleman says we're going to gain, we're not going to lose any jobs. We're going to gain jobs. We're going to gain jobs. Yeah. Because uh, if you put that much money out there, you got to gain jobs. No, in, in order to provide the services that we're promising under this bill, we're going to have a lot of people, some, some 40 million people who have no insurance, we're going to give them an opportunity to get insurance. Now, we're talking about jobs. We're going to have to have uh, physicians, we're going to have nurses, we're going to have professional care tired. specialists. So you can see all of the things that AARP and other groups said that they would need in order to observe the services that are going to be provided will increase the number of people that will be working. Oh, and okay. those people who are not providing any services and those people that, of course, if you watch 60 Minutes that you can see... I don't. <laughs> well, it was most important, just quite frankly, I didn't see it either. But <laughs> most people... <laughs> No, oh, I, 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 I assume I assume that the tax implications that came out of the Ways and Means Committee said, and I know we had a hard time choking this out, total tax increases seven hundred and thirty billion dollars. You know, no one's gonna lose their jobs that we collect taxes from just one fraction, one percent of the American people are gonna be affected by it. Most of them don't even the millionaire. And so nobody's going to lose their job over the $730 billion tax. I wouldn't say in any well, No, that's what you said. You said just a small sliver. Even in the House of Representatives, some people lose their job. Okay. But this is a job created. Small sliver. Mr. Camp? Well, I, I was going to touch on another point, which is no, that of the... Touch on this one. Well, of the... Of the people who get coverage under this bill, half of them are because of the expansion of Medicare, and this is according to the Congressional Budget Office. And so I would say, where is the reform in that that is simply an entitlement expansion? And we all know, and I think we would all agree, that the long, uh, Medicaid, I'm sorry, the long-term sustainability of Medicaid is not there, that we have long-term yes, financial problems. Mr. But then on the tax issue, when you talk about the medical device tax, or the small business, I call it a small business. How about the small business surtax, $460.5 billion? They, they would call that, as I heard members on, on that side say, that's a millionaire's tax that hits small businesses. Because as we know, many small businesses file as individuals. And so that will actually cause people to lose their jobs. Is there any economic data to support what you just said? If you use the methodology of Dr. Christina Romer, who is chairman of the President's Council on Economic Advisors, this is where you get to the nearly 5 million jobs will be lost as a result of this bill, and that's because of not just the tax increases, but the government mandates, which we know bring a cost along with them. Was this part of any testimony in Ways and Means? She did not it's testify. It's I'm sorry? She did not testify. But before. how about the, the, this viewpoint? The chairman's acting like, oh, my gosh, I've never heard of anybody losing their job over this. Well, this is a job creator, actually. A lot well, of so was the do. stimulus. I, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> it did. And it saved jobs, too. Okay, so, so let me say this. This is 
know more about health care than the stimulus was for jobs. No, I'm saying in addition to health care, it will create jobs. You don't provide health care for 48 million people that don't have insurance. You don't provide health care for 48 I hope we're around both of us long enough to find out what this is about, because I'm sure somebody will blame it on George Bush. Yes, sir. Well, I meant it very sincerely because I added myself in there also. Okay, but the fact is that what you're saying doesn't surprise me because reading what the Republicans said about well, I hope you read what we said about the stimulus, what it would do also. Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, you had a chance to say that there, this bill represented bringing ideas back to Washington, D.C. from the August town hall meetings. Uh, what Republican ideas did you include in this bill? Because the reason why I say that, because in July, during the markups, there were a number of Republican amendments that were in the various three bills, and uh, eight of them were gutted or taken out. So that was from July. Let's go to your statement about August. Well, I think we put in systemic care after that. I think that a number of our colleagues on the Democratic side, uh, Republicans came to their town hall meetings. People made suggestions. They brought those back. And what were those Republican ideas? Well, I have to go through. Well, I, I, I am. Yes. Uh, I will. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, I had uh, 24 town halls and a number of newer members probably uh, held a even larger number and many of us talked amongst ourselves. Three specific suggestions that uh, a number of us actually put forward in a letter to the speaker. Uh, I'm talking about Republican bill. ideas. Well, these are from people. Let me, let me tell you the ideas. I think they right. No, okay. So these are from people, many of whom were Republicans, Independents. I didn't ask the party. Uh, one, one was tort reform. Uh, one was tort reform. Uh, one is interstate competition. We heard okay. that suggestion from a number of people. And the third was they, they weren't satisfied with the deficit neutrality in 3200. 3962 actually reduces the deficit. So reducing the deficit, tort reform, and interstate competition are three ideas that I heard, that other members heard, that have been incorporated into 3962. Okay, so uh, you take and tax people $730 billion. You take $250 billion out that is not paid for, and then you say it's saving money. Is that what I heard you say? Uh, the gentleman, Mr. Colos. What was, your, what was your question then? Well, you talk about saving money. You yeah. tax $730 billion. You take $426 billion out of a Medicare Advantage, and then you don't pay for $240 billion worth of doctors, and now you claim you're saving $100 billion. Yeah, your How is that? Your question was how it changed through the process. This bill costs less than the initial bill. There are less tax increases than there were in House Bill 30. Oh, there are just less now. And there is a deficit reduction that is uh, over $100 billion over 10 years in House, in House uh, in, in 3962. Oh. That, again, 3,200 was also, basically even. This one actually reduces the deficit. So that's the type of thing that I heard from many constituents, some of whom were independent, some of whom were Republican, and some of whom were probably Democrat. So it's not as bad, as, it's not as large of a cost as it was before. So uh, that's what you heard from the summit. Pa passing this bill would reduce the deficit over $100 billion more than not passing this bill before us. And then taking out the $243 billion also, that helped. Well, again, p passing this bill would reduce the deficit by $100 billion more than not passing this right. bill. But before, in July, you had the 243 in there. You had to get it scored, so you take it out, and now you made it. The input that was incorporated included reducing the cost of the overall size of the bill. Yeah. I heard that. Other members heard that. Yeah. In fact, some of the people who said that were probably Republicans. That has been incorporated. The size of this bill is significantly lower by over $200 billion in the initial bill. Mr. Pallone, um, you talked about that you would see this dynamic marketplace where choices thrive. Choices thrive. And in particular, what we were talking about is Medicare Advantage at the time. 
Tell me about starting, I believe, January 1st under this bill, the, the types of mandates that will go on every single insurance policy starting January 1st, and then two years later, the government plan picks up. How does that create choices to where people can thrive? Well, the, the, the regulations that go in effect immediately refer to the discriminatory practices like Is it discriminatory? Women. Are they against the law today? When you say discriminatory. Not, not federally. They are in some states. So it's not against the law today. You just don't like them. Well, right now, it, it, not in my state, but mo in most states, because there's no federal law, they can charge more for a pre-existing condition. They can charge women more than men. They can say there's a cap on a year on how much. But that's not against the law. No, but we would make it against the law. You would make it against the law. Right. Why do you have a problem with that? It's not, to my knowledge, against the law. Insurance companies do it all the time. Now, maybe they're not, maybe you're saying... Uh, we don't enforce it, but it definitely happens all the time. Look, I, I'm for doing some We're things too. That all I'm trying to suggest that. here is, is that you're so you're going to go in and make these things that you call discriminatory. Would one of those be making every insurance program cover health? No, no, you're talking about two different things. Good, to help the benefit out. package is different. What I what I was saying, what goes into effect immediately. Are the anti are the anti-discriminatory practices? You can't charge more because of a pre-existing condition. You can't charge women more than men. You can't, uh, you know, have a total uh, amount that's paid per year or lifetime rescissions. The benefit package is different. The, the basic benefit package is uh, something that's in the health exchange for people who are buying insurance through the health exchange, both, both private and public. And that goes into effect in 2013, so that whatever you buy in that exchange will have at least certain benefits. Those don't go into effect for uh, people who have insurance, you know, on the job for five years until five years later. Tell me, but 90 something percent of the reason I said to Mr. Diaz Balart that uh, I don't know why, you know, about the uh, people that have insurance through their job is that most people who get benefits through their job have at least as good a benefit package that we're probably going to provide. And so I don't think it's so much an issue. But there are some that don't. And in five years after 2013, they would have to meet the minimum benefit package. So not next year. Immediately you go into Only practice. the discriminatory yes, practices. That's correct. That's my understanding. Only the discriminatory. Well, you're talking about these mandates in terms of what... I am talking about the mandates. I'm talking about things that will jack substantial uh, insurance substantially. But I don't think that those anti-discriminative practices are going to jack insurance up. They're going to they're going to basically even things out so that we'll people... Even them out. Yeah, in other words, you, why should the person... Why should a woman pay more than a man? That well, not, what, we, we're all different. I, why should a smoker should. pay more than a non so, so a woman should pay more than a man? Yeah. Uh, all, all I'm trying to suggest to you is, is that if there are actuarial tables, oh. there are men, oh, men, men that live oh, in the thank you. thank you very much for that answer. Wow. Good. Good. I'm glad we got that. As an example, you're saying that this is a discriminatory practice where people are charged different rates. Yes. Good. And with Good. So those are going to be added in next year. When do those anti-discriminatory practices? That's what I asked. Mr. Sessions, would you they yield a minute? affect either upon enactment or at the latest in 2013. Okay. Mr. Sessions, would you yield for a moment? I would yield to this. It gentleman. is legal in some states to consider domestic violence a, uh, a pre-existing condition. It is legal in some states to have considered a C-section a, a pre-existing condition, so you can't have another one if you need it. Uh, and it, pregnancy, in some cases, is con considered a pre-existing condition because you may have been pregnant before. Well, now these I, and 48 percent. Am I correct? 48 percent more for women's health insurance in many places than for men's. And we, if we haven't gone past that, we well, are. I think that's we, we will never said. have any meeting of the minds here. Uh, that's. Well, I, I don't know because I think our bill does many of the same things. Well, uh, you should know. Does it? Well, then let's not argue over that. Let's move on. I asked a question about what's going to kick in, 
Mr. Well, Colon. it's and in you, you, timetables, but basically these anti-discriminatory <coughs> practices are being illegal immediately after enactment, and they're all out by 2013. All done by 2013. Yeah, we can give you a document that tells Why you. Why look on the smokers? Yeah. Well, I just, uh, I, I don't know where this choice uh, issue is going to come to play then of a marketplace if they're all essentially What I'm the saying same. is with the choice is, I don't, I don't have an ideology. You may think I do, but I really don't, okay? I love capitalism. Everybody should make all the money they want. But what we're saying right now is that with insurance market that exists now, a lot of people can't get affordable insurance, and they have all these discriminatory practices. So we set up this health exchange that if private insurance can offer insurance, you'll have Blue Cross, Aetna, whatever, and you'll also have a public option, and they'll all compete based on how much they charge, what they provide. Because they're the same. Well, they won't be the same because they'll, they'll have a level playing field, but they might charge more, provide better benefits, have different doctors, you know, and you make those choices, and that's the competition. So in other words, if I wanted to say that I don't have to have mental health coverage, or if I didn't want to have a child, <coughs> uh, that I could go in and say, the, I'm not going to have a no, child. All the insurance offered in that health exchange has to have basic benefit package, which includes mental health. But you can pay more for like dental coverage or uh, you know other things that are not part of. Well, that's that's certainly way different than than uh, a, a, a basic coverage. Uh, I, I will tell you that I, going back to the conversation that you were having about this Medicare Advantage, uh, the government loses ninety billion dollars a year in Medi Medicare fraud. Okay. Do you include that when you talk about how, you know, these at Medicare Advantage, you know, no, people, the this administrative cost and all this stuff and all these Medicare people Medicare Advantage make... is only one savings. There are other things. Let me give you another one, which I'm very proud of. I mean, not that I was the author, but I was happy it was in there. And that's, you know, where hospitals make mistakes. In other words, what we have, I'm just giving you a general idea. We can get more specific if you want. But what we say in here is that if you're discharged from a hospital too early because they didn't do certain things, and we'd establish the guidelines, right? And then you three We establish the guidelines. Well, not me, but the secretary. Three or four days later, you come back in. And the reason you came back is because they didn't do certain things that they should have. They made mistakes, errors. Then we won't pay the hospital for when you come back for certain days because we want to discourage those kinds of mistakes. So that's another savings. I don't know how much it's scored at, but it's given a number based on, again, uh, you know, uh, information from MedPAC or some other reliable group. And that's another way to save money. I mean, there are a lot of things like that. Would you, would you, um, what would you say if I told you that from a CBO score that the Democrats' fraud savings is $1.3 billion in the bill? And that the Republican, uh, I'm not supposed to call it John Boehner, Dave Camp, everybody, Pete Sessions' bill, saves $4.4 billion worth of savings from fraud. What would you say about that? I, I mean, the information, the information that Charlie gave you about the savings is based on CBO figures. I don't know what you're looking at. Well, I'm looking at CBO. Well, my understanding based on what Mr. Ryan said before is about half of the savings. Okay. Okay. Mr. Pallone, have you looked at the uh, estimates? CBO savings. Have you looked at the cost estimates uh, as a result of the Republican alternative? No, I have not. Have not looked at those. Not the Republican alternative. Really don't care, do you? I'll be working on that. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I'll see it when you present it. Okay. I'd, for, I'd like Certainly. to make sure that we get these Xerox then, because I think people who come here are going to try and give and take. So the gentleman just have to know that CBO said the Democrat bill found fraud savings $1.3 billion from this massive bill and from the Republicans $4.4 billion. Um, I, I am concerned also, and as the gentleman Mr. Pallone knows, from a couple of years ago we spent a lot of time talking about physician-owned hospitals. And evidently, and <laughs> I know Charlie. And by the way, the chairman, <laughs> the chairman, well, Charlie, you know I was up here. The gentleman, Mr. Rangel, was very kind uh, a few weeks ago to allow a rather large meeting 
of members where we talked about how important physician owned hospitals are. Uh, in looking at page 23 through 24 of the manager's amendment, it looks like that there were several what I would call earmarks. I'll let you decide what they're called, but a carve out that specifically addresses three <coughs> Democrat members, specific districts only. Now, I didn't know they were Democrat. As a matter of fact, from a very political point of view, I was pleased that we were going to do any of those. So, are, is the gentleman aware, and I've got the pages right here. Well, it doesn't surprise me because the speaker did say that I said if you're going to do one or do two, you have to do the more than about 50 of them. Uh, she came back and she instantly said that what staff could look, and it wasn't, never, this is one thing we had by partisan support on in terms of. Well, I think so. The hospital, she said, if staff can show that these doctors' hospitals were taking care of Medicaid patients, uh, a large number of Medicaid patients, and she never said Democrats, and she never said votes. <laughs> so it would not surprise me if one or more of those, what you call earmarks, were there are Republicans, because staff did not go after the name, they went after the guidelines. Given to us by by, by the speaker. And by the speaker. All had to do with Medicaid. So without knowing which ones you have, I can give you assurances that with all of the people that represented the physicians hospital at the meetings that we've had, that they would be different from the rest of the hospitals. So speaker drew the line, speaker put together the circumstances and yes, decided what would be done. And it was yes. non political. Yes. It was just Pick, picking the line. It, I am telling you right now, Mr. Session, it would not surprise me if one or more of those hospitals are not Republicans. It would not surprise you, no. but it was a non-political way. Mr. Camp, how would you answer the question? Well, this, I believe, is in the manager's amendment. It is, page 22, 23, 24. It, it's my understanding that all, all of those hospitals are in Democrat Mr. Sessions, there are hundreds of doctor-owned hospitals around the country, and this bill prohibits any of the existing ones from growing, number one. Uh, most of the ones that are currently adding on or under construction uh, are stopped, and the carve-out is based on a percentage of disproportionate share reimbursement under Medicaid that I was told only two hospitals uh, com complied with, and it was carefully crafted so that only those hospitals would comply. So, but that was non-political. Well, now, I'll take Chairman Rangel's word that he didn't know which districts. I think he's telling the truth about that. I, I'm not trying to suggest anything else. He said it was dish compliant. Dish is well, dish, he, uh, 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 disproportionate share of the poor folks. And so if you want to call it club out, he said if there is a doctor's hospital, and to include that type of language, I guess, dish, but certainly it said Medicaid, was those hospitals that serve Medicaid no. people as majority. And without knowing which hospitals they are, I'm suggesting to you, you have Republican staff here, that I am confident that they will be the hospitals that are in the... Uh, in the uh, well, what I'm saying, Mr. Center. Chairman, is that there are hundreds of these doctor-owned hospitals that are currently in existence, and there are dozens that are currently under construction, and somebody very carefully went in to protect a very small number and came out with a carve out uh, that did that. Now, if you, if, and I, look, Congressman Rangel and I have a good relationship. He's a man of integrity. I don't doubt his word one bit. I, I don't either. Said. I don't either, but I am going to know, I am gonna ask a further question of the gentleman. If you know the target, you can craft something that meets the target okay. and excludes everybody else. Okay. Well, the, the question... And that's I'd, what this appears to do. Well, I, can I, you I, imagine the number of Democrats that are annoyed because this was going to come up? Well, so I, I, know, I know several in the Texas delegation that are very so, annoyed. So I want to ask the gentleman a question yes. because we know it's not political. 
I, my question to you is, if this was done and intended to, as a quid pro quo or to gain a vote, would that, would you consider that an ethical violation? I don't know. You don't know. I to do with any negotiations with any members. So you've not been negotiating anything in this bill with any member? I have not. You have not. I have negotiated in terms of, uh, of listening to the the concerns that members had, and in many cases, we've changed all kinds of things that we're not built to accommodate members, Republicans and Democrats, that have special concerns. And but never in exchange for a vote. I don't know about that. Or support. All I'm saying is if I can tell you, you don't know now, about that. If I can tell you now honestly, <laughs> without being a contradiction, that I have no clue of members who service those three hospitals that you're talking about, then clearly it was his foreboding. I do not know under oath, not under oath the names of any member that you are telling me for the first time have been included. But I do know that in talking with the leadership, she made it abundantly clear that some of the stories that she heard, that the existing law in warning these hospitals not to expand, giving deadlines, sunshine laws under all of these hospitals that have been extended over and over and over again, that she told me, which I was pleased to hear since I didn't have to listen to members, Democrat or Republican, that there are some horror stories out here. So I'm Welcome suggesting up. that you follow through, Good as I will follow Thank through, you. to find out where those hospitals are. And I can give you assurances that their needs will be dramatically different in terms of the small folks. Dramatically. Dramatically different. Dramatically different. Well, the reason why I say is because uh, November 7th, New York Times, it says, in an effort to attract votes, House leaders revised their bill to help certain doctor-owned hospitals that serve large numbers of low-income people on Medicaid, exactly what you said. The change was intended to win support for the bill from Democrats like Representative Harry Teague of New Mexico. So that's what's in here, and you've assured me that is there would be substantial differences of how that was drawn, and I appreciate that. You heard Harry Teague's story. It would move me to you. I, I move. Uh, I, I welcome the opportunity because I, I did hear a lot of stories, and that was one uh, that I concluded that uh, it was a terrible situation that he found himself in. It had a lot to do with county lines. It was hundreds of miles before you can get to another Sounds hospital. Sounds a whole lot like Doc Hastings hospital that is hundreds of miles away from the next one I'm saying this in the state of Washington. In terms of the, what, what was the staff was directed to do, they didn't ask me to pick them out. Right. Because I'm going to pick it out, you know, whatever I thought was in the best interest of, of me getting the bill through, which would have meant either all of them or none of them. But never for a vote. Well, then put that in the manager's are amendment, Mr. Chairman. All of them or none of them. It's my understanding, and the gentleman, Mr. Camp or Mr. Barton, may know that there are two members. I said three earlier. I thought it was three. The gentleman, Mr. Barton, says two members. It may be no members. Well, it's a member. I don't know. Be because it was added for a specific reason it's in, in the a very detailed way. It's well, in the New listen, York Times. <laughs> Now he gets it too, and got me agreeing with you that it was actually done. You know, what's that? Say the manager's to, amendment. Let me give you a second. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll talk, and I'll be better able to tell Great. you what Thank it you. is. Thanks. Okay. Now, can you tell me about the retroactivity of? this legislation as it relates to the physician-owned hospitals. The gentleman, Mr. Barton, to the date. The gentleman, Mr. Barton, talked about a good number of hospitals, and you'll recall from the meeting that we have where a bipartisan meeting, where a number of us spoke, and as an example, we said 124 developments in 22 states that have 25,000 jobs right now waiting and over $4.9 billion already invested. And they have started down that pathway. By the way, they're in California. Uh, Mr. Cardoza had some. Mr. Perlmutter has 
at least one, I have a number. What's going to happen to those? Whatever retroactivity is involved in these hospitals for those that were passed previous legislation, which we know the chip so there's no new ones that are involved in this. It's merely a carry forward of those that have legislated before. So it sounds like what you're addressing is anything after January 1st of this year. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, can you speak into the mic? The oh, I'm sorry. sorry. What I was saying is that this decision was made in a previous past bill in the House. And that's those that are retroactive in this bill were retroactive in an earlier bill that was passed. Uh, I know that everybody has their own uh, reasons for supporting or not supporting uh, this committee. Is it uh, has lots of time to study lots of bills. Uh, I, I am uh, very worried about uh, figures and numbers that evidently were not presented. I was led to believe that the economic uh, forecast would have been done on this. It was done uh, in the budget. We knew the budget when it was passed that we would be at 10 percent unemployment. That was a guesstimation. Uh, you're telling me that there is no estimate of economic on jobs that was done by your committee as a result of this massive bill. Is that what you're... That's exactly what that's I'm exactly saying. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, I, I think I took it one step further and said that we're projecting that there will be an increase in employment as a result of the additional needs of people that we will be servicing that, that had so far uh, gone unserviced. It just uh, makes sense if you think. Oh, it does? <laughs> well, a massive bill and don't even do a guesstimate about what the expectation Oh, listen, be. I'm not saying this hasn't been done. I mean, that's why we have AA. But it wasn't done team. asked for by the committee or presented in evidence. I'm not saying it wasn't. All I'm saying is that we had well, enough I'm asking if it was. Well, I'll check what's there. Good, I'll, I'll let. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, CBO, to my surprise, said they couldn't give an estimate. But I think you and I, since you were talking about a guesstimate, mm -hmm. if you can see the number of people that we have to train and that will be trained in this bill, uh, when you can see the physicians uh, that uh, will be taking care of, of primary care, mm -hmm. when you can think of, 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 of 40, 50 million people now being able to say, I can now have preventive care. When I was a kid, none of us had a chance to go to the doctor before we got sick. I mean, anybody went to the doctor in my neighborhood had to be sick. Under this, you can go see your doctor, get Just going to any time you want. Well, I assume that people don't, if they, those kind of people that like to go see doctors, I don't think we had any testimony on that. But... There are certain things that we are encouraged to do as members of Congress to have a physical annually, and you reach a certain age, other type of examination you should have. This means an increased burden on those people that provide those services. And it, it, it just wouldn't make sense to tell people that they will be entitled to these services and then fire people instead of training and hiring people. It's got to be an exciting revolution in the medical delivery uh, system. And I, quite frankly, was, uh, I learned a whole lot in terms of quality and not volume and, uh, and, and making it better, not for Democrats, but Democrats and Republicans. People get sick, they don't ask what your party registration is. And I know that you know we're trying to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Camp, we've already heard the chairman say this uh, four, $730 billion tax increase will not lose, or if it does, just a minuscule amount of jobs in this country. There was so much so that we didn't even worry about going and doing a study. Is, is that something that... There was no economic analysis presented on the job loss Bill, and we have had that from the CEO, and actually from the CNS action. 
sanctuary, the present sanctuary, that says this will put not only stress on, on Medicare, but on the entire system because of the way that the building structure is designed and it much more let the record indicate my response as it relates to who loses jobs. If there are people out there reporting, American citizens out there, if there are people in the insurance company, if people are not providing the services, if people are building the federal government and they're not doing this, it, those people that are involved in this fraud I hope and trust will be fine under this bill. And this, the, uh, not guesstimates, but estimates that we got from CBO and indicating what they will be able to do with the authority given to the secretary to get rid of the things that we all would like to get rid of. So it's only, so, only fraud. Uh, uh, people who are, are, not people who are associated with fraud will lose their job. All people who are not providing a service <laughs> Your constituents and to mine should be fired. And how about the government-run system that is not providing a service? Of course we should get rid of it. That's uh, there's been a lot of waste in government under Republican and Democratic administrations. And I think, even though you and I didn't watch 60 Minutes, that they were pretty uh, if, precise areas that we should look into. If, 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 if you still have more questions? I mean, I'm just saying I, this panel has been I, here for I over would, four hours. I would ask for two more minutes. Uh, two more minutes, but I just urge the panel. Um, I, that, Mr. No, Chairman, if, if I, could I hope you're not suggesting that I'm not keeping my questions to the guts and heart of the bill. No, what, 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 I am, what I am suggesting with respect is that you're, we're asking the same questions over and over and over well, and over again. And, well, and, and I would just remind the panel, Democrats and Republicans, that this panel, that this group has been here for over four hours, well, and I, I know there's lots of questions, but I would urge people to contain their questions and well, stick them to, to stick well, to the point. I, 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 I yield the gentleman another two minutes. I think I'm sticking to the point, and that is that I am shocked that there was not an economic analysis that was done that would tell us what the impact of jobs would be, that would be right there where we completely understand it and we're able to say, this is what the guesstimate is. And I intend to write with every Republican who will sign the letter and any Democrat to say that before this bill, notwithstanding its vote here tomorrow, before it moves forward, we should have an honest estimate that is done by CBO that gives us a succinct answer because people in this body are going to be held liable for what we do. And I think it's a darn bad answer to say, you know, we really didn't ask that question and it's really not anywhere in the testimony. So I'm going to do that, Mr. Chairman. Would you sign on that letter with I me? I wish you would. I was going to suggest that you. All right, I'm going to. I'm going to. We're going to do the Wrangell Sessions letter tomorrow. Well, no you, matter how you do it, I think that the direction in which you go in makes a lot of sense. We we just sign the letter with me, Mr. Chairman. I haven't seen the letter. Okay, I'll get you a copy of the letter. Let him write That's it. what I was asking. Let him write it. <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much, and I intend to. I thank you the, the, the time, and I re refer back. Uh, yield back my time. Ms. Matsui, are you still over there? I'm still here. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to thank all of you, not only for being here today and sitting for the four hours so far, um, but for all your hard work. I do know on both sides of the aisle how hard this is. Um, I think that all of us realize that health care is personal. I mean, we realize that. So when we have our town halls or meeting with our constituents or even our family members, all of the questions are personal, too. So as we look at some of these policy things, we're really looking at it from a personal angle also. So I do really appreciate all the hard work. And I have to attest to what uh, Mr. Barton was saying. We had many, many days of uh, energy and commerce hearings. And uh, I guess one of them went 12 hours. I think Mr. Miller did, too. We're hoping this doesn't go that long. <laughs> but. But I would like to, I, there's a few things I want to ask here. Um, when I go home and talk and listen to my constituents, the one message I really hear loud and clear is that we can't afford the status quo. That's just the way it is. And the Kaiser Family Foundation has said that health 
insurance premiums have gone up three times faster than wages in the last nine years. And health care costs in general doubled between 1996 and 2006, and this is from CBO. And half of all personal bankruptcies are due to health costs, according to the well-respected journal Health Affairs. That is really tragic. Now, just earlier today, we received a letter from a set of well-respected economists from places like Harvard, MIT, in, uh, University of Southern California. This letter says, in part, the legislation the House will vote on in the coming days will guarantee security of coverage, limit the cost of care, create incentives for improved quality of care, and set us on the path for sustainable economic growth. These are not my words. They are directly from this letter. I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of this letter into the official record. Without objection. Now, Mr. Miller, can you speak to how H.R. 3962 will make it more affordable for small businesses to afford coverage for their workers? Well, first of all, uh, we, uh, we exempt uh, very, very significant number. I don't know. 86% of small businesses uh, from, from, from this legislation. That means that their, uh, Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but that means that their employees can go to the exchange. They can get, uh, uh, they can get uh, 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 health insurance through the exchange, whether they pick private or public. And they will get assistance depending upon their income, family income, and paying for those, uh, paying the premiums to pay for that plan. And uh, uh, obviously, that's, that's a, a I, when I tour small businesses in my district and I say to them, you, uh, if you do have to pay on a sliding scale after half, uh, half a million dollars in payroll, we start out at 2% and I think at 750000 we get we get to 8%. Most of the businesses in, in my district think, gee, that, that sounds okay to them. And uh, because they talk about 13, 14, 15, mm -hmm. 16%. Now, CBO says a lot of those people are going to continue to offer we, we argue back and forth in politics whether that will happen or not. The CEO says there's a stickiness. Businesses like yeah. to do this. Uh, even some of the people I've talked to said that. And so small business, that we hear all the time about how this is either crushing them or they can't keep, they can't keep workers. And people had to leave to go find health care. Health care derives a huge amount of economic decisions that people make. It's interesting that the Wall Street Journal ran a long article a couple of weeks ago on the impact of the absence of health care on innovation because people are locked in their jobs, they won't start a business, they won't, they won't uh, make an effort you know, to, to, to do something new, and that's the cost of the nation. The, the current system, you said it, Congresswoman Matsui, the current system, by all measures, is inconsistent with a healthy economy and a place that America has to go in a new globalized world. It's just, it's just that simple. I mean, when we get all done, I came here, you know, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with, under Gerald Ford, and I'm here under Barack Obama, and we've tried a lot of different ways to do this. We've had step-by-step, -step, we've had comprehensive, we've tried all this. And at the end of the day, there's 37 million people in this country that don't have insurance. And there's, there's, there's 500,000 people a month who are losing their insurance. That simply is not smart economics. That the transactional cost of that happening, you mentioned the bankruptcy. Now, not only do you, you might lose your job, you lose your health care, you start to try to pay for it on your, on your credit card, then you're into credit trouble. You're in the bankruptcy, you're home. I mean, we just can't accept this any longer. And, 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 and small businesses are, in fact, uh, certainly for, for new businesses, new startups, uh, this is a burden that they don't have to. Well, my small businesses, I've had several small business workshops, and they have told me how we need to fix this health care system because they really want to retain their employees. It's like a family for them. And they want to be able to offer good health care. They'll, they'll get additional tax credits right. to do that. Under exactly. This, under this bill. Exactly. That's the choice that they make. That's right. Thank you for that answer. Um, I want to talk about Medicare. It's a great example of a government-run health insurance that does work. And seniors everywhere in districts all across America really like their health, their Medicare. I mean, that's something that, thank goodness, people in the 60s took the chance and did that. Thank goodness for that. Um, that is why our legislation invests in Medicare by extending the solvency of the Medicare trust fund by five years. 
eliminating the donut hole, and making preventive services free. Now, um, probably Mr. Pallone, when we look at what this bill does for Medicare, how do we think about what this program will look like in five years, considering how does it differ from the way the Medicare program will look under the status quo with the costs going up and with a baby boomer generation about to retire? So what is it going to look like five years from now under this bill versus what it'll look like if we let it go the way it is now? Well, I think you mentioned some of the things, but I mean, and we've talked about it before, but I'll, I'll try to summarize by saying this, which is that, you know, on the one hand, we have these savings in the Medicare program that are financing the bill, uh, at least had a, a good part of it, uh, which go against, you know, go to the waste, fraud, and abuse. And so when we talk about uh, Medicare Advantage savings, savings for things like, uh, you know, hospital mistakes that I talked about before, those savings are contributing to reducing costs and basically extending the life of the program. Because, you know, at some point, if we continue with the status quo, we'd have to worry about whether the money is there. So there's that. But all these savings are essentially being, uh, you know, some of them are reducing the overall cost and extending the life of the program. Others are being pumped back into uh, actually providing better benefits. And you mentioned, uh, all that you mentioned today, you mentioned filling the donut hole, not having co-pays for preventive services. And, you know, the other thing, which uh, is a separate bill now, but uh, making sure that the reimbursement rate for providers is adequate because I have the honest. Mr. Plum, would you mind putting your hand down? Your I'm hand sorry. up sure. the words from God. I, I can't emphasize enough the last thing, which is that, you know, I have a lot of doctors right now that will tell me that they're not taking Medicare mm -hmm. anymore because the reimbursement rate is not high enough. And I've had hospitals close uh, in New Jersey uh, because of the inadequate uh, payment. You know, for, I, I don't want to keep talking, but let me give you an example. It, it, we have these retirement communities in New Jersey, you, you have in California, where there may be a hospital there that has 80 or 90 percent of its patients are Medicare. Now, right now in New Jersey, that reimbursement rate is about 80%. And then there's some that are on Medicaid, which, as I said before, is only 30%. Well, you have to close. Yeah. You cannot possibly continue to operate uh, if you've got to uncompensated care from people that have no insurance, Medicare at 80%, and Medicaid at 30%. You close the door. And that's what we're preventing by, you know, covering everyone so that uncompensated care disappears raising the Medicaid and the Medicare rate so that there's enough money coming back to the hospital so they can continue to operate. Well, I'm also um, very happy in the Medicare part of this bill that we're actually making some good delivery system reform changes, that, yes. uh, which is going to be necessary yes. to look at lowering the cost in the right. future. Um, one of them is, uh, you mentioned accountable care organizations, right. which you know, doctors can join together in groups and be paid um, if they provide high quality, more efficiently, you know, more efficiently run uh, and uh, coordinated care. And that saves uh, both money and improves the quality of health care. And that is part of what we're doing here in order to reform the system. And I, you know, I have to apologize. I mean, the reason I haven't mentioned, you know, I, I keep forgetting the preventative care, the wellness, the different models like the the, uh, the Medicare home model, the accountable, mm -hmm. is because a lot of those don't get the score, you know. Yeah. But I believe you're talking about trillions of dollars here that are not scored because, you know, the CBO tends not to score these things. Right. And I know another good um, thing this bill does is train the doctors for the future. And um, the, Medi the Medicare graduate medical education program, GME, is one the hospitals in my district love because it allows them to train the next generation of physicians. And we know we're going to need more doctors uh, to treat an expanded population of covered people. So um, how do you see as a main difference between how HR 3962 invests in the future of uh, the medical workforce and how the Republican substitute might do? Well, this goes to back to the job issue that was mentioned between Mr. Sessions and um, Mr. Rangel. I mean, in order to um, accommodate, and I'm just repeating what Mr. Rangel said, in order to accommodate the fact that so many more people are going to be covered now, and that a lot of preventative services and other things that are not offered now because people can't afford them are going to be, are going to be provided, uh, we have 
a number of provisions in the bill that train more people in the healthcare workforce, whether it's physicians, um, you know, nurses, mm -hmm. home health aides, whatever it happens to be. And, and, and rather than, I mean, I, I, I would even go beyond what Mr. Rangel said. I would say um, the concern shouldn't be about uh, job losses. The concern should be uh, this huge bonanza of jobs and, uh, you know, how we're going to train all these people because there's going to be a, a need for, there's going to be an explosion of jobs in the healthcare workforce. And we're trying to do that with some of those provisions you mentioned. We may have to do more mm -hmm. as time goes on. Well, I'd also like to touch on the community health centers and because we're talking about emergency care at hospitals and that's the most expensive care you can ever get. And um, I have to say the community health centers just work. I mean, in my district, we, we really recently received our first uh, FQHC, the Federal Qualified Health uh, Center, and it has done wonders for the primary care system in Sacramento. And it just really stepped in where the um, local health centers were really failing, and um, they've taken up a vulnerable population, which is the model I think we're looking at here because instead of going to the um, emergency rooms of the hospital, you can go to the uh, health center, the community health center, where there is a primary care doctor and there's an abundance of other people there that can actually help you with your care. Um, and I also know that they're big in Mr. Cardozo's off, um, district also too. Now we make major investments in community health centers. Um, can you just kind of summarize how you think putting more money behind the community health centers will ultimately save money um, in, in the future. Yeah, and, and I would point out, you know, one question was asked about, you know, Republican ideas. You know, I don't usually say nice things about George Bush, but one of the things that he did, and particularly in the beginning of his term, the second George Bush, was that he greatly expanded community mm. health centers because he believed that they were very valuable tools. Now, he ended up giving less money as his term went on, but he was a big supporter of it because they work. And basically what we're doing is providing additional funding actually to the community right. health centers, grants, whatever, you know, that they would use to hire people, to expand their facilities, to do more in terms of health information technology. A lot of them are not up to snuff on HIT. But in addition to that, um, when we expand the amount of money for, for Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid, so that it's now, uh, you know, generating instead of that 30% in New Jersey, you know, 80 or 90 or 100% for primary care, then you're, you're going to have those community health centers getting a lot of more money because they have a lot of these people that are of the uncompensated care, so to speak. That's right. So they're going to get money to uh, improve their buildings, their resources, hire more people directly under this bill, as well as get more money through reimbursement rates for Medicaid primarily. And then they're just going to, they're going to provide a lot more primary care services for people, better services, and better quality care, which means a lot of people now who don't get primary care services will get it. And you'll save more because they don't have to go to the emergency room or the hospital. Right. Mr. Miller? Well, I just make that point. A lot of people think the community, the community uh, clinics is, is a standalone. Okay. East Bay, you know, Kaiser is a major partner. Is a major partner in our community clinic, as are the other hospitals up and down the east side of San Francisco Bay. They view these as, as absolutely necessary resources in terms of managing their own casework, their emergency work, and, 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 and all the rest of it. And obviously, in this economic downturn, a lot of families that maybe never thought they were going to go to a community clinic find this really helpful in terms of the care of, of, of their families, their in, individuals, and children, and, all, and the rest of that in, in that community. So. These are assets. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, we had a meeting here with, with people from the National Institute of Health and others, and they said, if you will, if you pass comprehensive legislation, this was two years ago. If you pass this kind of legislation, you don't have community health clinics in this legislation. You will not improve the health status of Americans. You might improve coverage. You might improve a lot of things. You will not improve the health status of Americans because that's where you have to go in terms of getting into the community to change people's habits, to have them take responsibility uh, for, the, for their activities. And that's the front line here on that, uh, on that effort. Republicans are big supporters of community-based health clinics. 
And Mr. Pallone was kind enough to admit that. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have Dr. Burgess take my place to represent well, the you. Commerce yeah. Committee. We're, we're thinking of renaming this committee Guantanamo. I think I've been here. I think I've been here long enough to qualify to vote as a member of the committee. As we've Mr. Got Chairman, I've been to Guantanamo. This is worse. Yeah. That's worse. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I, I just have to follow up on that because um, Sacramento has, uh, I mean, I think the health care industry is number two after the state. It might be number one after what the state's going through now, you know. But uh, you mentioned the fact that this is important for the whole community. In fact, uh, my big hospital, Center Hospital, has, come, has gone into a partnership with the effort, which is the Federal Quality Health Center and giving them a million dollars because they understand the importance of being able to have that type of care that goes so that they won't have to have the emergency care for people who just come over there. And quite frankly, now in this bill also is having some the behavior qualified for the mental health as part of this too. As we know, uh, that is a huge population of people too. So this is something that I feel is really very important and I, I truly believe that we're on a, uh, you know, we're on the brink of doing something very historic. And uh, I'm just very privileged to be here at this time. And I know this is hard because it is, it affects everybody. And there aren't very many times in our career that we can do this. And we all happen to be here at this time. And I think it's really important, um, not only for our seniors, which, you know, most of us will become eventually, but I'm thinking ahead about our children, our grandchildren, so we have a sustainable system for all of them. So I thank all of you, and on your side, the all too, because this is something that we're working on together, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So much to say in so little time. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we should start with the premise that I have felt all along, despite being questioned on this by my colleagues, that all of us want all Americans to have health insurance and access to good health care. Again, despite accusations made against me, I think we would be all better off if we accepted that assumption. We want to go about it in different ways, but I think accusing each other of things that aren't true isn't a good way to start out this meeting. And so I, I want to say I, I believe everybody wants all Americans to have uh, affordable health insurance and good quality health care. I just take that assumption. Now, how we go about it is, I think, where we obviously diverge. Most of us believe this is the greatest country in the world. It's gotten to be the greatest country in the world because of our Judeo-Christian heritage and capitalism and freedom. And I think that, that what I'm afraid of, and most of us on our side of the aisle are afraid of, is, is we fear the loss of that freedom and the government takeover of health care in this country. And it's obvious that this 2,000-page bill, sponsored by the Democrats, is a takeover of health care in this country. And I think that's where our major disagreement is. We see no reason to take the greatest health care system in the world and turn it in the wrong direction. And that's, I think, our big argument. And I, I'm, I'm going to ask some questions about what evidence, again, you have that, that all this is going to happen given the failures that have occurred in government programs in the past. Um, and I, I think we should have um, uh, evidence-based information, which is something coming from an academic background I have always done all my life. I, I think you've got to have your sources cited. And I think coming in here and making broad general statements about 47 million people not having insurance, and we know that even amongst you all, you've put out different numbers on that. As I said before, President Obama said that. 30 million people didn't have insurance. So I've been operating from that number since he said it. 
Although before you all kept saying 47 million. So I want to go from some evidence-based things and then I'll ask some questions, Mr. Chairman. I have here an article from Investors Business Daily and I'm going to submit these for the record so that if anybody wants to check out what I'm reading, you're certainly uh, free to do so. And I, I won't read all the, art, all the uh, articles, but I, I do want to point out why I think you get different comments made. Infant mortality rates are often cited as a reason socialized medicine and a single payer system is supposed to be better than what we have here. Will the general lady yield just for one second? Uh, no one here is talking about a single payer system or a socialized uh, system of, of, of health care. That's not re representing these in any of the bills that we have here today. So, I, I, you know, we can go down this road. And but I appreciate if you'd the... let me finish, sure, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I think uh, I can clarify this. All right, thank you. Because I'm going to be talking about some other countries with these systems. I'm not talking about what we're proposing. I didn't say that. I'm just, just let me finish okay. reading, if you don't mind. But according to Dr. Linda Halderman, a policy advisor in the California State Senate, these comparisons are bogus. As she points out in the U.S., low birth, rate, low birth weight babies are still babies. In Canada, Germany, and Austria, a, prematurely, a premature baby weighing less than 500 grams is not considered a living child and is not counted in such statistics. They're considered unsalvageable and therefore never alive. Norway boasts one of the lowest infant mortality rates in the world until you factor in weight at birth and then its rate is no better than the US. In other countries, babies that survive less than four, 24 hours are also excluded and are classified as stillborn. In the US, any infant that shows any sign of life for any length of time is considered a live birth. A child born in Hong Kong or Japan that lives less than a day is reported as a miscarriage and not counted. And it goes on and on and on to show that we're really comparing apples and oranges. And I think that's really the important point to be made here is that when you say we have a rotten uh, uh, infant mortality rate, we have, and you're only comparing it to other countries that have a different definition. We need to be sure we've got our definition. And if the right. gentleman would just yield one, one second. I mean, I think the definition that a lot of us operate off of is the World Health Organization, and they apply the same definition to all countries. So, I mean, well, different countries may come up with different, I, I don't know where you're getting that from, but I'm just saying that I appreciate the information and I look, I look forward to reading what you provided. Well, I'd invite you to bring that in so that we could see it. I'm just sharing with you what I have. And then I have another article from Investors Business Daily. It's entitled, Looking Closer at Pesky Stats on Health Care. Ezekiel Emanuel, a medical advisor to the president and brother of Rahm, the chief of staff, once told me, Life expectancy is one of the dumbest ways to measure the quality of a nation's health care. Quality of medical care does not by itself determine life expectancy. For example, deaths from accidents and murders are much higher in America than in other developed countries. And it goes on, and then it talks about personal behavior. Obesity leads to serious health problems, including heart disease. One third of Americans are obese, almost 50% more than the British and Australians. Over 100% more, over 100% more than the Canadians and Germans. 250% more than the French, and a thousand times more than the Japanese. And then it goes on to talk about infant mortality again. Teen mothers, we have a rate three times higher than Canada's. Uh, low infant weight. So don't blame the broken health care system for lower life expectancies. American health care actually copes, helps us cope with the consequences of unhealthy lifestyles, keeping our ranking from being even lower. So we, we I think, really need to be pretty careful about, again, comparing things. One other point that I'd like to share, and then I'll go on to my questions, and this comes from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, 
2001 medical expenditure plan panel, less than 1% of the population and 1.3% of the uninsured population has ever been denied medical insurance for health reasons. So again, I know we all have horror stories about people who've had problems with health care. I have my share of those. People who had pre-existing conditions and had difficulty getting um, help. But I think, again, it would be helpful if we could back it up. The last thing that I'm going to share with you, I think, that's pretty important is as we talk about Medicare, is um, from AMA's National Health Insurance Report Card, Medicare has the highest rate of denial of uh, claims than any private health insurance plan. Now, it is, uh, let me get the right statistic, 6.85%. And this was between March of 2007 and March of 2008. They denied 6.85% of claims. The next highest was Aetna, which had 6.80. But all the rest of them were about half of what Medicare denied. So as we look to put everybody in Medicare to take care of those pesky insurance companies uh, who are so mean and hateful to people, we need to think about why is this happening with Medicare, perhaps, and do some investigation. Because we may be creating some real problems for our citizens as we push them into this program. Now, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, would like to, um, I would like to ask um, Chairman Rangel a couple of questions uh, to start with. And um, I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, this has been a long session for you, and, um, but I appreciate your um, sticking it out with us. Um, of course, you were talking about uh, uh, AARP and uh, bragging about their coming in and helping with uh, eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to do it, but I know that, that um, there have been some questions about AARP. It's my understanding that their Medigap coverage plan imposes a six-month waiting period for individuals with pre-existing conditions. Are, are you real proud to have AARP supporting you in this? And when they do that in their own plan? No, I wouldn't be, but I don't know what you mean is true by, you know, but if they really are that bad, then we have to take a look at that too. Well, I, I think it would be a useful thing uh, so. to do because my understanding is that they're getting billions of dollars in kickbacks by overcharging seniors for their insurance policies and denying, again, seniors um, with pre-existing conditions. So. Tell me where AARP is going to help you with waste, fraud, and abuse, if you don't mind. Oh, I'm going to help you because tomorrow, with the information that you have, I'm going to do this is just as important to see that a proper inquiry would be made. That's what you're saying, Dr. Fox, is criminal behavior. And I would need your help in order to do this, but I assure you I'll be available tomorrow. We can do it together. Are you aware that they get most of their money from selling insurance and that the bill you've written is going to advantage them tremendously? Is that one reason why perhaps they were willing to support the plan? I, uh, I have a question really how they could effectively uh, critique uh, health insurance and at the same time participate in it, so maybe you and I will have something else to take a look at, but since he, he had so many people and so well respected for protecting the rights of aged people, that uh, yes, we were very proud to get their endorsement, the American Medical Association endorsement, and the pages of people that have, what happened? 
consumer. You look at their pages of people that have national reputation, and indeed international reputation, that have lauded the work that we've done. And quite frankly, all of these ideas have not been just members of Congress. They've been ideas that people have had for years, but just never had the political courage to stand up and to rep, rep, to enforce these things. And so if we made some mistakes and you think they were criminal, uh, I say publicly uh, and on camera that we have to get together tomorrow. The gentleman yield for just one moment. Yes, sir. I thank my friend for yielding. And let me just say that uh, when I heard the mention of the American Medical Association, I just would like to inform the committee of uh, a telephone call that I got two hours ago uh, from, I, I spoke with a man who happens to be a mayor of one of the largest cities in Southern California that I'm privileged to represent. He's a medical doctor, and he's right now at the AMA convention in Texas. And he called to inform me that the level of rage among rank-and-file doctors towards the board of directors of the American Medical Association is leading a group of them to, uh, and I see Dr. Burgess nodding uh, to my statement here, is leading many of them to launch a, uh, an effort to, in fact, uh, harshly criticize what they believe was a terrible decision that the board of directors of the American Medical Association board made in supporting this legislation. And he said that this is uh, a feeling that has been very pervasive, been very pervasive across uh, this convention. I just wanted the record to show that since my friend mentioned the AMA, and I thank my friend for yielding. No, thank I you. want to say that I don't challenge that. I've been in so many associations that people have been sidestep and they get annoyed and get too many people and send in protests. So that doesn't surprise me. Well, got this call and I decided to share it. Well, they, I got here the California Medical Association. <laughs> Are you familiar with that group? The California Medical Association? Absolutely. And sure. in fact, I know that the, I'm, I'm sure that my friend uh, Dr. Kurth uh, is, uh, is uh, probably a member of the California Medical Association as well as the American. part of those who protest at the endorsement? Well, he called me to say he called me to say that to this group? well he called me from the American Medical Association convention. He's a doctor in California. Is he a member of the California, California Medical Association? That's what I'm concerned about. The the I'm sorry. California. California. Right. I'm right. Sorry. I, I know. New York <laughs> accent. I guess. Yeah, I guess so. The, the, what what have they done? No, they've endorsed. Oh, of course they. So, so in other words, so in other words, what I would infer from that is that he not only is carrying his outrage to the National American Medical Association Convention, but he would similarly join with doctors in California uh, who are very critical, and I suspect well, he's he there with other doctors. All I'm saying, when you, when you said that there was the endorsement of the American yeah. Medical Association, all I'm doing is sharing the input that I received oh. from a medical doctor from California Please. who's in Texas. I want to you know you can it. always I depend on my support to listen to with a minority voice. Right. I've lived through that, so I know. Well, I don't know how minority a voice it is based on the statement that he made and based on the nods that I just had from Dr. Burgess, who's from Texas well, that's and a medical true. doctor himself. Well, let's see what action is taken today. I thank my friend for yielding. Could I, I thank you very much for yielding. I'd like Absolutely. to explain my I'm terribly sorry. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, according to the CBO, <laughs> H.R. 3962 leaves 6 million illegal immigrants uninsured because it predicted in the health reform bill that was passed by the three committees that 8.5 million illegal immigrants were going to be uninsured. But could you explain to us why H.R. 3962 expands the coverage for illegal immigrants by 2.5 million while leaving 12 million American citizens without health care? That turns, that turns out to be an incorrect statement. And CBO has posted on their site a correction saying there is no, there is, uh, despite the difference in the wording, CBO does not expect any significant differences between the two bills. Yes, I have to say that. So, that's so, so CBO is now backing off they, of their you, comment? You can characterize it any way you want. They put, in, they put out the correction. You read it for what it's worth. If the gentlelady will allow me, I will put a statement into the record that explains that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Without objection. Well, let me ask another question, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, section 307B, related to the establishment of the exchanges, states that, quote, the commissioner shall pay from time to time from the trust funds such amounts as the commissioner de determines are necessary to operate the health insurance exchange. Doesn't this provide the health czar with a blank check to run this new government program courtesy of the American taxpayer? Anything extended to uh, the exchange or the private option has to be repaid because the whole idea is transparency and competition. So it wouldn't make sense to give funds to one of them and put them at an advantage of the other. So anything that's extended has to be repaid. Could I, Mr. Camp, do you know any insurance companies who have uh, a, a, a well they can go to and just uh, pull up money to, to use to tide them over when they may need extra money like the government's going to have? Well, I think that's been part of the concern you watch a movie? You watch a movie? Watch a Just, uh, it, let me just say this. Uh, first of all, no one uh, has to choose the government option. That, that's totally up to them. But the main thing you have to, that I would say is that all these other insurance companies right now have existing operations. They have providers in their networks. They're up and running. Um, if you don't provide some upstart money, with, if you will, which is what that's all about, to get this uh, government option up and running, It'll never exist, and I mean, you know, it has to be paid back. But I mean, there has to, they're they're operating uh, when they start out at a, a distinct disadvantage because they don't have the network, they haven't existed, they've got to get started. I mean, I I, I know you you may be surprised, but I am my concern is just the opposite of Mr. Camps. I'm concerned that because they're the new player on the block, it's going to be very hard for them to get started and actually be competitive. So I, I mean, that's the reason why that uh, provision is in there, because otherwise they're not going to get up and, and running and never will be out there to actually compete. Well, actually, the Senate's finance bill does not have a government plan, and I, I think we're ultimately going to have to face this question. And I believe that the Senate will not have to remove the government plan from the bill. It's a very different structure, very different approach between the Senate finance bill and the House bill. Let me, let me pursue this just a little bit with you, Mr. Camp, if I might. It's my understanding that uh, this bill uh, that the Democrats have put forth ha needs eight years of higher taxes to finance six years of spending. And then it doesn't really come into balance without using a lot of gimmicks. So while there's been some criticism a little while ago, actually, about the Republican alternative in, in reading even the Democrat material that they've put out, nobody really gets covered till 2013. Is that right? But the tax is going to affect in 2010? The, the bill is not immediately effective, as you correctly pointed out. It is effective for a number of years. Yet the obligations under the bill are effective immediately. And, and, and we think, particularly given the fragile state of the economy, in fact, the unemployment's gone up to 10.2%. That this kind of financial obligation on Americans with no immediate benefit is, is, is not the right approach. And I would also say that CBO does not say that there will be lower premiums. Our approach does have the uh, express statement by the Congressional Budget Office that we actually lower premiums in the small group market. It's up to 10%, which is a $5,000 uh, reduction in premiums, which will be significant for families, particularly for small businesses. 
trying to maintain coverage and make sure people have coverage. If I could just uh, add, look, it, it's going to take a couple of years from the time of enactment until this health exchange is fully in effect. That's the reason for the 2013 date, because it takes a while to get up to snuff and all the things that we've talked about here. But we do have certain provisions that take effect immediately in that interim period. There are these high-risk pools where money would actually go to states to actually try to cover people who can't buy insurance right now. And we talked before about some of the anti-discriminatory practices that go into effect sooner. But the reality is it takes a couple years to set up this health exchange. And when we talked about the public option, that's going to take a couple of years to get it up to snuff so they can actually operate. You know, place, uh, Blue Cross and companies like that have operated for years. They're ready-made, but the public option is not, doesn't exist right now. So it's going to take time. I would just say that their bill has a on their high risk pools. And they give the Secretary the authority to establish waivers. But in our version, in our approach, receive coverage if you have three There's no wait list on in the Republican bill. No a six month waiting list and and the authority. I read the I, I read that in their bill that it's very clear they can even throw people out of the high-risk program. Dr. Fox, the general Dr. Fox, a closer look at the bill would see that there is a set-aside for any type of emergency that comes up with before the five-year period. And uh, that is one of the things that we have, we're, we're so proud of. So to pick something that, that is just so clear that the money's been allocated because we know there's going to be hardship stories for those people who can't possibly wait five years in order to get the care. So that's, you know, if, if whether or not I would vote for the bill or you would vote for the bill based on that, I'll take a gamble on you. Because really, quite frankly, it, there may be a whole lot of things that you can object to, and some of them may be true, but believe me, back off of that one because the facts are abundantly clear that every Democrat wants to make certain. That, what do old folks do in waiting for this thing to happen? And it was a legitimate question as you raised it, and we found that we had to put an answer in the legislation. So that one is, is a no-win that we've done. And with all the witnesses we've had, because you were concerned about this, this government uh, infusion of money, with all the insurance companies, not one of them said they had a problem in making a profit. Not one of them. So they don't have to look for a well. I, in the previous um, discussions that went on, I noticed that Mr. Klein didn't have a chance to uh, respond to um, some comments that Mr. Miller made about small business and the impact on small business. And I wonder, uh, Mr. Klein, if you would like to Put your perspective in about that. Yeah, thank you, General Lady. I was just struck when Chairman Miller was uh, asked a question, I think, from the, the lady in California, Ms. Matsui, what this bill does for small business, how small businesses. I couldn't help be struck that the first answer was, well, it exempts many of them from the bill. Um, if that really is helpful, then we might exempt a bunch. We, we might exempt a bunch of uh, businesses from this bill. Uh, it is clear that this bill uh, raises taxes. We've already talked about the impact that that has on businesses. It specifically raises taxes on small businesses where the owners are filing the sub businesses. So this tax on the wealthy is a tax, tax, tax on small businesses. In contrast, the Republican uh, substitute directly addresses the issues that are really facing small business today. It improves our savings account. Many, many small businesses are moving to do it. small businesses pull together into small business health plans, an issue that came up in the committee as an amendment that was offered and then, of course, was rejected. So this bill, unfortunately, puts a, a increasing burden on small businesses and the Republican alternative goes directly to help those businesses because we're, in fact, worried about those jobs, whether it's the one million or so that the NFIB says will be lost with this bill, or using Dr. Patina Romer's uh, analysis, the five million jobs will be lost. We're trying to spend that. I, I thank you, gentlemen, for giving me the opportunity.
Uh, Mr. Uh, That's I, the existing system. I mean, and, and businesses, small, medium-sized businesses. Mr. Miller, I'd like to reclaim. They're jettisoning. Mr. Uh, Miller. Uh, uh, you, you referred to me. Jettisoning uh, health care at record rates. So, you know, you've done tax credit health savings accounts. This has been going on for years and years and years. We're still sitting here with 37 million people without insurance. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses are getting rid of health insurance. So that system doesn't appear to be working because we have more people uncovered than we had before. And, and, and so let's, let's just get a grasp on what the status quo is here. People are exiting the field all of the time. So the suggestion, if you just do more health savings accounts, everybody will be happy. Uh, who said that? It just hasn't worked. Who said that? It's my time, but who I'll said recognize, who said recognize the gentleman from Minnesota. My question was about my testimony. If I might uh, engage here for just a minute, uh, I just found it striking, and it, it was, in fact, uh, Mr. Miller's testimony in response to the question of whether we still do the small business. They said exempts many of them. And, and I would think that we ought to be doing something more proactive, uh, making a comparison between the benefits of exempting some of them from the requirements of this bill and actually doing things to make it easier for small businesses to group together and get more rates. And again, I would go back to the CEO store where the Republican alternative is going to in that picture. Cent, and that's not the case in this bill. But, Mr. Camp. Well, I, I just also want to mention that you know, the president actually blew up. talking over each other, and I think this is a great debate for the floor on the House floor tomorrow, but I yield back to the Thank general lady from North Carolina you, to kind of wrap it up. Thanks. I appreciate your help, Mr. Chairman, very much. Mr. Wright, well, I'd like to ask you another question. Um, there, my understanding is latest uh, polls will tell you that uh, over 60 percent of the people in this country oppose government funding of abortion, but this bill makes it possible in lots of different ways. Please tell me why you all will not allow a vote that would take out government funding for abortion. And let's, let's just see in this body how many people really feel what really are pro-life, and how many of them are not pro-life? I have to yield because I understood that that situation is being discussed with the members as to 
how it was going to be taken. So I, I can't answer that. So you haven't been a part of any of the discussions uh, that have gone on about why we can't have a vote? I've been there. I haven't been able to make a substantial contribution to these all your questions, but that's why I'm If I could. If I could just say, look, I believe strongly, and I know the, those of us on the Energy and Commerce Committee, because we debated this and we actually put an amendment in there that says that um, if you buy a policy through the exchange, and that's all we're talking about, I mean, there's no change with Medicare, I mean, with Medicaid or any other government program, those prohibitions on using those public funds for abortion already exist under Medicare and Indian Health and everything else. The only thing that's at issue here is with the exchange. Somebody wants to go and buy a policy in the exchange. And what the bill says, and this was an amendment in Energy and Commerce, what the bill says essentially is that no public funds would be used. So you can buy a policy in the exchange and you can, you can pay for abortion coverage on your own, but it is not going to be subsidized or paid for uh, through any federal funds. And that's already in the bill. But what I think Dr. Burgess would like to respond. And that when the evening when that came up, and it was late in the evening, late in July, the CAPS amendment, their own counsel, in an answer to one of Mr. Barton's questions, said that this amendment was a sham. It was just a way to move money around to, to avoid the appearance that federal funds were being used to pay for abortions. In fact, the money would be moved from account to account, and no one would be able to tell that federal funds were so used. So their own counsel felt that this amendment was not being above board and honest as of how it was representing. I put it, in, I put it in much simpler terms. The public understands, I think. You put it in one pocket and take it out of that pocket and put it yeah. into the other one. Right? I, I don't, you take it in one pocket and you spend it out of the other one. I don't think pocket. that's accurate. Uh, but the main thing I would say to you, well, just one last thing if I could say. Look, everybody has their own opinion on you know whether or not you know, they want abortion coverage. If you didn't allow people to buy coverage privately through the exchange, if you will, that um, provided abortion coverage, then you would be denying people that want to buy it and pay for it out of their own pocket. So we have to come up with a workable solution that says if you want the abortion coverage, you pay for it privately, if, if, and we're not going to have the public monies pay for it, just like we do in Medicare and Medicaid. We believe that the CAPS amendment accomplishes that. Um, other, maybe you do not, but I, I believe it does. Well, if, I'm surprised the gentleman doesn't remember it because the Pitts Amendment that came up right after that, which originally passed, and then you'll recall Chairman Waxman changed his vote uh, as the amendment passed. The Pitts Amendment language was a little more stringent, and then the chairman later on recalled the provision when he had his votes in order and defeated the amendment. So it was... Uh, there was some significant discussion that surrounded this. It was not, uh, again, I'm surprised the gentleman doesn't remember. Well, I don't, I, I don't uh, disagree that there was a lot of discussion, but I'm trying to say we're both trying to achieve the, birth, the same purpose here, I think, which is to say that if you want to buy insurance with abortion coverage with your own money, you should be able to, but we don't want public funds used. Good. And this is how we think we're accomplishing that. You know, we may disagree over whether or not it, practically speaking, does, I believe it does, but certainly that is the intent that we all have with this uh, language that's in the bill. Good. Um, I'll wind up pretty quickly, oh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Flone, I want to ask you a couple of other questions. One is, you said that uh, when you're talking about insurance and you didn't want people discriminated against, uh, are you uh, prepared to say that people who smoke are going to be treated the same way? under the government plan as people who don't smoke because uh, <coughs> right now there's a lot of discrimination against people who, who uh, smoke in terms of health insurance. My, Will the government plan not discriminate against My understanding this? is, and again, you know, a lot of us don't necessarily agree on this, but my understanding is that that can't be a basis uh, for discrimination. It, I couldn't hear you. I'm saying that there was a lot of discussion and some disagreement on that, but my understanding is that now there can't be discrimination because the person smoked and had lung cancer or some disease that resulted from it. So no pre-existing condition under your plan, including people who smoke, right? My okay. understanding. The other question I have, uh, I, 
I'm really curious as to what you see in the future that I can't see because I have to base what's going to happen in the future on the past. You've talked about trillions of savings coming up, that, that we're going to just see trillions of dollars coming out of this wonderful plan that you all have. Um, and I'm looking at, again, and I know I'm not going to go over the numbers because they've been gone over before. When Medicare hospital insurance was first put out, it was said one number, it's 7.44 times more. Uh, when the DISH program came out, now it's 17 times more. None of the Medicare programs have been close to what was predicted, except the prescription drug plan. It's the closest to the predictions. It's the only plan that has the private sector involved. But my point, uh, how my are point you going to see? Just, really, that I am honestly interested. I know, and I, know. I think the I, public is. Where in the world are the trillions of dollars of savings going to come from? when you put the federal government in charge of a program, when never in the history of this country has the federal government done something less expensively than the private sector? Well, first of all, let, let me say two things. First of all, you started out before uh, talking about, you know, is this the government takeover and all that. I mean, I, I, I want to stress that that's not the case here. This is not radical. The only thing that's radical, uh, you know, from what we're doing here is that we're covering everybody, or at least 96 percent. No, you're not covering everybody. All right, well, 96 percent. In, in terms of what we're actually doing, you know, ideologically, there's no big change here. I mean, in other words, essentially you're going to continue to have most people covered on the job through private insurance that their employer provides, a huge group covered by a public program like Medicare and Medicaid that already exists. The only thing that's really new is this health exchange which again, like the others, is a combination. It's going to have private insurers for the most part and a public option. So it's, not, it's, it's a hybrid just like the existing system that has some public programs like Medicare and Medicaid and most people still getting private insurance. The big savings, what, what I was trying to point out before is that we spend so much time, both the Democrats and the Republicans, trying to fit what we're doing into CBO's numbers. But CBO really doesn't take into account the fact that if everybody's covered and everybody goes to a doctor on a regular basis and we really stress prevention and we have these new models that try to you know, do things in a better way, all these things, in my opinion, are going to save a tremendous amount of money that will never be scored. I can't put a dollar figure on it, but that's what's radical here. There's, not, there's no radical ideology in terms of the delivery of services between the public or the private sector. What's radical is that everybody is going to be covered and there's going to be emphasis on prevention. And I think that is what's going to drive costs down considerably. But I can't put a number on it because CBO won't score it. Well, Mr. Mr. Plum, if a frog had wings, it wouldn't be hopping along the ground. So you've what? made a lot of assumptions. Just one more comment. If that's the case, why in the world are there 111 new entities that have been established to implement what you're doing? You might make, you might get my attention with what you said, although I know all these other government programs don't have an impact. Well, I just feel that the problem with the system right now is that increasingly uh, insurance companies in the system are failing us. And so we do have to make some changes in order to make the system better. And the government gets involved in setting up the exchange and trying to encourage these new models like, you know, uh, uh, the Medicare homes, the medical homes, I should say. So we are trying innovative things, and that's why you need you know, some of these changes in the legislative language. But I don't think there's anything radical here in terms of the ideology. I really don't. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. And if we had more time, I'd like to figure out the frog has wings analogy. I've, I've never heard that before. But uh, since we've gone on for five hours, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll well, talk about it later. Well, no, I, yeah, no, yeah, no, it's all right. Yeah, no, I got to. Yeah, 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 yeah,
Okay. All right. It's Fat. a very simple Fat. analogy. Okay. He very said important. If, if, if. Oh, okay. Right. okay. He said if, if, if. Okay, okay. So if a frog had wings, right. they wouldn't be hot. Okay. Long. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yield, I'm gonna yield to Mr. Cardozo to bring us into the morning. I am going to be extremely brief in consideration of the, the panel that we have here and the fact that we have been here for five and a half hours so. and are still on the first panel. Um, I, um, I want to talk briefly about the fact that while I'm not wild about every aspect of this bill, as I'm sure I have never been wild about every aspect of the bill, it's gone through. Uh, a process that has too many committees to work on it and all the rest. And I think we ought to all acknowledge that. Um, I, I have to tell you, I have heard near enough talk, uh, especially from what I believe from the Republican proposal, which with regard to the 170,000 constituents that I have and have no whatsoever. And I will tell you that that's a big problem. It's a big problem for me, it's a big problem for this country. And, um, and so I have a lot of heartburn on a lot of different issues, and I am sort of offended by the fact that we dismiss that number so easily. Um, and so I want to get that, I, I want to make sure things are perspective. I want to make sure that people are covered. I want to first make sure that people um, get the services they need. We close, in my community, the neonatal unit of the local hospital, because we don't have any physicians take care of those patients. And so now babies die in transit as they travel 60 miles to Fresno to the nearest unit where they can be safe. And frankly, one of the questions I have to the chairman, because I've been working a lot on that issue of physician training and providing more physicians, is how we can better deal with some of those issues. And so I, I would leave that, I would ask the chairman uh, what you can explain to the committee. Some things on the bill, right? That's something that's great. And we don't have enough. We don't have enough positions to service the people. Right. That's a that's a big problem in rural areas and inner city areas. And and what we do is make a concerted effort to encourage uh, through incentives, financial, and, and all types of, of areas, uh, the training of primary care doctors. That is one of the major problems that all of the experts indicated could save us a lot of money uh, if only we did not have to rely on specialists in order to see people. And so uh, I've been, from a minority point of view, where we don't have a finished training academic, uh, I have been really trying to sell the idea from an educational point of view, an opportunity point of view, not only the healthcare, but the green economy as well. I really truly see a boom in the interest of healthcare by so many people. And you don't have to be a physician to get involved in healthcare. Uh, I forgot who it was that was talking about the community uh, health centers. Uh, everyone that's loving providing service to people in my district are not doctors and psychiatrists. And people are concerned about keeping people well and getting sick people well. So, uh, I can't just think of those and tell you how important this is to me, how revolutionary this is going to be, because I cannot think in terms of Democrats and Republicans sick people. And I don't think when you go and say, I want to see a doctor, that they could ask whether you want a Republican doctor or a Democratic doctor. So we have a shortage of primary care doctors. Everyone agrees. And we've got to emphasize what can we do not only to have more of these uh, but to give them the support system that they need in order to provide better care. I couldn't agree with the chairman. Mr. Cardozo, I'd like to comment as well because you mentioned the Republicans. We haven't heard enough from us yet. No, I've heard quite enough in many cases. Uh, Excellent. Time <laughs> Look, you get about half of your coverage by expanding Medicaid under your bill. And uh, that, I don't believe, is health care reform. That's simply expanding the current welfare entitlements that we have. Which the government can't afford, and neither can. Do you believe that health care isn't people aren't entitled to health care? Uh, Medicaid is an entitlement. And what you do is expand that entitlement, which we know is Mr. Samuel. Let me ask you to follow up. I'm going to finish my comment and I'll be glad to answer your question. Because it is an entitlement, 
Half the your expansion comes from that. We know the state can't work. We know the federal government can't work. We can't believe it. Let me ask my answer. You're the one who said you have to vote for the Well, let's, let's not talk over each other, please. I don't believe your proposal covers my people, and I don't believe it does. Now, I have concerns about a lot of different things and a lot of different bills, but I will tell you that I don't think you eliminate pre-existing conditions. You do. I do eliminate pre-existing conditions. I don't believe you do. You know, I don't believe it covers my folks that I'm concerned about, uh, because I just don't believe it does. But let me go on and say. Are you letting me have a chance to finish my statement or not? Yes, you can. I, I, let me finish my thought, which is we believe the first step to expanding health coverage is to reduce costs for families. We yeah, I do too. Can I do too? But that, but that doesn't that have that mean. scored by the Congressional Budget Office. Mr. Camp, Your bill don't bother my good. questions, and I would like to ask my own questions. Thank you. Well, this is how you get a seat on the show. Mr. Kemp and I are great friends. No, but we have a, this, this is how you get the uninsured is you start reducing costs and help them. That is the I am all about reducing costs, and that's what my questions are trying to get. That's all I want to say. Without having the physicians and without having other unique opportunities to provide coverage, we can't bring down costs. And as a blue dog, I'm very concerned about that. You um, that. As Americans, <laughs> I'm very concerned about that. Because we have to have a sustainable model. And so um, I, some of us call it bending the cost curve, whatever you call it, we've got to save some dollars. And I believe you're going to have to use technology. We're not, as much as I want to train everybody I can to be a doctor and a nurse, because I think we have extreme shortages, and I see the impact in my district every day. I look at some things like medical technology and, and mobile technology and remote monitoring and many different things. I've been working with some different individuals from the Scripps Institute in San Diego and other nonprofits who are focused on this and believe that we need to be, have greater efficiency. And I know not everything that I care about is in this bill today. But, and this is one of those areas that I think we can expand it. I'm just bringing it and raising the issue today because I want to work with the chairman as we go forward on this measure to make sure that other areas and other opportunities are not left behind. Great. Great. I want to thank you for the contribution. You have made the recommendations to me and to me and to the other chairman. And I want you to know that. Well, I thank the chairman. Uh, I look forward to working with all the members of the committee. And uh, as I will repeat, he's a dear friend of mine. And um, I will, rather than take any more time on the committee today, because I think it's very important for the rest of my colleagues who rarely get a chance to answer questions and ask the question down at the other end of the diet and have some time. And so I will reserve the rest of my comments. Thank you. Before. Thank you very much. Mr. Curie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Camp, uh, I have a, a few questions for you. Mr. Camp, I want to start off by uh, asking you, um, do you believe uh, that the stimulus bill is working? Do you think? Let me, well, no, no, just that, that's okay. I don't think my answer was picked up by the question. I was okay. My, my question to you was, do you the believe that the stimulus bill is working? jobs. We've seen massive job losses, many more than were predicted. In the so, so your answer is no? So the answer is All right. no. Do you think that the calculations that were made by the administration in terms of the number of jobs that were going to be created was flawed? Well, the calculations that... Well, I mean, flawed, either it was flawed or it was not flawed. Well, Do you think it was flawed? It's, it's the methodology that Christina Romer used, and we believe that that methodology... It's flawed. Uh, no, I don't, I don't necessarily believe it's flawed, because we're continuing well, to well, use that well, to predict the number of jobs this bill well, wait a minute. is going to cost. Now, wait a minute. You, you, you don't think that it is working. You don't think that the methodology was flawed. But the methodology that you used in calculating the 4.7 million jobs that you have been talking about is based on that methodology. Well, her, how, how could that be? Her methodology underpredicted the job loss under the stimulus mm -hmm. bill. She's probably underpredicting the job loss as a result. Of well, well now, now wait a minute. Now let's well, let's we'll, we'll get back to that in just yeah, a couple I'd minutes. Yeah, I'd actually like to get another economic analysis 
All right, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let me ask you this. Um, the, the Republican bill, uh, Mr. Barton says, uh, under it, under your, your alternative, that any person who wants insurance can get it. Is that your understanding of, of your bill? Any person that wants insurance? Are you referring to a pre-existing condition? Well, yes, if they have a pre-existing condition, they're able to get coverage under our Well, but any person, that, he wasn't referring to a pre-existing condition. He was referring to any person who wanted to go out and get insurance could get insurance. And is, is, is that what well, your bill does? We believe that the best way to reach the uninsured is to reduce costs in healthcare. And particularly in the small business market, which our bill does, but, but you would agree with Mr. Barton that any person under your bill that wants insurance can get it? If you're, you're referring to pre-existing conditions. No, I, I'm referring to any... No, I'm not referring to pre-existing conditions. I mean, can, can you get insurance? Well, yes, certainly if you're low income, you qualify for Medicaid. If you are not low income... How about if you're not... You don't quite qualify for Medicare or Medicaid and you can't afford insurance? That's can you get exactly it? what we're trying to get. But, but can you get it under your bill? Many can you get it without people, subsidies under your bill? Many more people. Well, no. Yes, can you get it without subsidies in your bill? Your bill has $600. Well, wait, that's not my question. If you, would just, if you would answer my question. Well, can you, you get it without subsidies? Right, well, but but my, my question was, can you get it without subsidies yes. under your bill? Your bill has $605 million in taxpayer subsidies. <laughs> what our bill does, we don't spend the money that you do. And we don't consider this to be the last approach to health care. We believe it is a good step to comprehensive care, and we do it by lowering premiums. So, so your bill then assumes that if you can, that everyone can afford insurance, and if you can't afford it, that's your problem, well, basically, we it, under your bill. Well, we, we do it in a number of, we, we don't believe that this is the only bill that No, but, but based upon tomorrow, or, or when the bill takes effect. share the your goal. Of right. universal access to health insurance and, and having every American have health insurance. We share that. Yeah, we have a lot of goals that we but share, we but, but the fact of the matter is, your does your bill do it? And when your, when your bill takes effect, will someone who can't afford insurance be able will to get it? Will 100% of the Americans have health insurance under either of our bills? No, but 96% will under the Democratic proposal and significantly less will under your proposal. Well, and you do it primarily by expanding Medicaid. But, Which is nothing new. No, no, but, but that's not, but that's not that. just that. It's and not just that. And you do it by spending six hundred and five million well, and do nothing to lower premiums. Do you give any tax term. breaks to individuals? Do you give any tax breaks to individuals to help and, afford and it? Let me just say the Do you? Does your bill no, I'm curious. Does your bill give tax breaks to individuals so. to we afford have, it? We, we believe that we should strengthen health savings. It doesn't, does it? Well, we do through health savings That's a tax break that goes to the That's not the side. Let, 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 let's move on, because obviously you're not going to answer my question. So, you're, the, well, you're, but you, well, you're not answering the question. You're, you're, you're giving basically your talking points, which, which is okay. Um, let me ask you this. Um, there are approximately 180 Republican amendments that have been filed. Are any of those, or how many of those, I should ask, are included in your proposal? I've not reviewed any of the amendments. As you know, typically bills that come through Ways and Means are not amendable by rules. I'm not well, okay. You, you don't know if any of them are. I'm not any of them. Now, I want to move back again to, to the fact that, that you say that the bill would cost four to five million jobs, and I take that I take it that you base that on the fee that's being assessed, uh, the eight percent on, on business services. That's part. Of it. Okay, that's part. Of it. And would you say that it would be correct based upon your analysis? that um, you estimate that um, it would be about $300 billion, the cost to employers? Uh, that might be accurate. I don't have a great front. I think that's, I think that's what, what, you, we, what I, your I estimate think, is. I think the, the, the employer portion is about $135 billion. But your estimate's about $300 billion that it would cost. the individual is about $33 billion. And then the small business portion, or as you call the millionaires, it's 460 okay. Those so are the, the I first time that I saw that 300, that, that figure of four or five uh, million jobs, was um, in a column on August 31st by John Carter, uh, Congressman John Carter, on a website called the Christian Coalition of America. Now, 
that was based, I take it, on the figure of $250,000 that was the first bill, was it not? I, I wouldn't know what he based well, his article on. But, but th these, these are the estimates of your committee that it's going to be four or five million jobs. I, I mean, what did you base it on? I haven't seen his article. I can't comment. Well, you have a copy of it? I'm well, well, well no, but, but, but he says that, that he says it's going to be four or five million jobs. And that's what your estimate is from your committee, is it not? From his side. From your side? Show me the Carter article. Well, well, to, uh, could, uh, let me ask you, your, your estimate is four or five million jobs, is it not? I believe that using the methodology of Christina Roma, the President's top economic advisor, that the costs associated with this bill So who, who came up with that figure? Would result though? in between four to five million. Was that a workup by your committee? We have, we have, yes, it was okay. on the ways and means. Okay. So, it, and you base that upon, again, the 300 billion figure? Well, it was based on using all of the data involved in the bill. And, and it was Just done before the first bill, was it not? It was done in the summer. We analyzed it with the second bill, okay. which we got about a week ago. We, 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 we well, it's a, the analysis. Okay, well, because if, if, if the analysis is based on $250,000, then when, we, when it's doubled to $500,000, does not that change your figure? I'm just being told, it is not based on that number. We used the new numbers and redid the analysis. And you Your came up with the same figure? Information, we redid the analysis, and it's an approximation. So, it's, so not, it's not an exact you, appro you approximated four or five million loss of jobs with 250000 and then with a higher figure of 500,000, you estimated the same loss I of jobs. Four and a half to five and a half. Now. So, and you think there's more loss of the jobs with the fact that the, the, the figure is now 500,000. How does that make sense? When, when we've raised the level, how does it make sense that more jobs are lost? Yeah, because the total tax increases end up being about the same. So you end up having, look, I'd be happy to share our analysis with you and walk through it with you. Well, but, but, but that doesn't make sense. If, if you start at 250,000 and you have four point, and your estimate is 4.5 million jobs lost, and it's raised to 500,000, which means significantly less employees are hit, that has to lower the number. I would gentlemen, try to make this point again and again. Would you yeah, yeah, I would, I'd be happy to tax, do that. And we I, use all of the policies. I would say to the gentleman, I agree with you, and that's why we need to, and I'll invite you to sign the letter. We need somebody that, like CBO, who looks at the numbers so that the gentleman, Mr. Rangel or Mr. Kemp, does not have to guess or use something okay. that's extrapolated. All right, I, I, I'm reclaiming my time. Go ahead, well, finish. finish. I'm sorry. The the same boat I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think <laughs> you're in the same boat I am. So. There finish. was a change in the surtax between the two bills, between the earlier one and right. later. But then there were also additional taxes added to make up for the change in the figures. So well, I would like to have a chance to walk through okay. the detail. But that explains, well, yes, that particular tax was changed. There were other taxes. So I, no, it's not a 250 anymore. Well, I have another problem in, in that if you estimate that it's $300 billion, the CBO estimated that it's $163 billion. Are you familiar with that estimate by the CBO that that's what the cost will be? I have to see it. All right. And, and that was based on 250000 And I think the CBO has indicated that that will change with 500000 You have to look at the total tax. But, but the fact of the matter is that CBO is saying that the number is significantly lower than yours. So doesn't that change the number of jobs that you think are going to be lost? I would agree that the surtax tax is different than the second. So, so you, you, you really just throw in these numbers out there. I mean, you don't have any real basis for this. Well, no, we, we do because we're looking at all of the taxes, and you're focusing on the surtax alone. The surtax does change from the first bill to the second bill. It goes to higher income level. Well, it was at a much lower income level in the first bill, but as a result, there were other tax changes made in the second bill that have an impact. On our economy and on Sir, when, when, you're, when you did your calculations, when your staff did your calculations, they estimated the tax increase size as a percentage of GDP, didn't they? I believe so. They did. Okay. Now, but when you did this, you, def you divided it by the total tax increase over 10 years, correct? The $300 billion, right? The same methodology. Same methodology. But, 
But the, you only, the, the, the figure that you divided it by was the GDP for a single year, $14 trillion, rather, the G, rather than the GDP for 10 years. That is a flawed methodology in terms of calculating it, and it dramatically changes probably 10 times the figure that you estimate. Wouldn't you agree? Well, we are using the same approach that the chief economist for the president Well, used. that's not exactly that true. That is the methodology that you take issue with. I mean, that is not the exact methodology. methodology. Well, I don't think that that's the methodology. And, you know, there, there were two things, I think, that, uh, that you're citing when you talk. Because when you say methodology, I mean, you're just estimating what the White House, what she meant by this. I mean, you don't know. She never came up with these numbers. These are what you base it on based upon her analysis of something totally different. We have always said, based on the methodology used by Dr. To, to estimate what the stimulus estimate, bill, to, to estimate the stimulus bill, which you think is flawed. Yeah. Right? Was I not clear when I said that before? But, but you, you did say that you thought that the stimulus bill wasn't working that the estimates were flawed, but you're using that methodology to calculate four to five million jobs. You said you didn't think it was flawed. It wasn't flawed. She is she is attempting to estimate the impact of tax policy on jobs. We know that tax policy will affect employment. That is what she was trying to do. But, but, but she's talking about apples, and you're using her methodology to, to, to evaluate oranges. I mean, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I have no further questions. Right, thank if you. the chair would, I just have yeah. one more thing. If the, chair would, if the chair would just indulge me, I, I'd just oh, like okay. to read a very short article into the record, if I can, sir. I'll be very okay. short. Um, the president of the American Dental Association opposing any health care plan urge Congress tonight to strengthen and expand the current Kerr Mills program. The association's president, Dr. Fritz Pearson of Lincoln, Nebraska, said the program proposed would provide health benefits for a segment of the population without regard to the needs of individual benefit beneficiaries. Speaking at a dinner of the Chicago Dental Society, he said, the association does not believe the government should assume the additional responsibility of providing health care to persons who can easily afford it simply because such person happens to be in one group or another. I just read that because that is not, although it sounds much like something that you would read today, it's actually from February 23rd of 1965. And we see the very same things that people were saying about Medicare, they are saying today. And, and, I, and I want to make one more point. When the Medicare bill came up for a vote, there were about 40 Democrats that voted against it, and half of the Republicans voted against it. Seven years later, Richard Nixon, President of the United States, expanded the largest expansion of Medicare ever in the history of this country. And there was one vote in the House and Senate altogether that voted against it. This program that we are doing today, the, 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 we're listening, is much, they're saying much the same things that they said about Medicare and that they said about Social Security. It's different. People are always suspect of something that's different. But this is something that's good. This is something that ensures Americans. And I think it's something that uh, is very important to move forward with. Thank and I think you're not yield back. Thank, 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 thank you very much, and thank you for giving me one thing that Nixon did good. So, um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Mr. Camp was, oh. was uh, making an attempt to uh, <laughs> I would say it's the assumption that you put into this, which I think is typically the only flawed. But actually, she had another peer-reviewed study that was used to in, uh, estimate the impact of taxes on jobs. So we really are kind of talking about two different So the assumption wasn't flawed, the bill certainly <laughs> was. Well, I, I, I think Mr. Curie Can I have my point. time now? Okay. And Mr. Perlmutter. Mr. Perlmutter. Still I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> and I just applaud the panel, all of you, for uh, sitting and being peppered with questions. Uh, and uh, I mean, this has been a long, uh, long period. We have another. We have 200 amendments we have to address after we finish with you. We've been going. Almost six hours now. <laughs> so I just thank you. I've got a couple of comments, and I'd like to just sort of bring it back to my reality of, of this. And it, it Im involves a couple, three things. And first, it involves my daughter, Alexis, 
who has epilepsy. And as a result of that pre-existing condition, she's not insurable or she's only insurable at, at rates that are sky high. And she didn't ask to have epilepsy. That's just part of her chemistry. And um, that's why Dr. Fox and Mr. Sessions, I referred to the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, which says nobody will be denied equal protection of the law. And the system that we have today, I think, denies her equal protection of the laws. And both Republicans and Democrats are trying, I think, to address that. But it needs to be addressed. It's immoral and I think unconstitutional. So start there. Second point is I was at a gas station when we were in the middle of August, um, sort of in the heat of the discussion of uh, health care, and a gentleman came up to me. I was at the pump, and he said, Ed, you guys have to pass this health care, and you've got to stop this discrimination. My wife has Crohn's disease, and I work for a little roofer. I'd like to start my own company, but I can't, because if I leave this roofing company, I can't get coverage for my family. And I am stuck, and I can't be the entrepreneur that I would like to be. So will you please do something and get this bill passed? The third part would be as to my law firm that I uh, used to work with. Hundred, we had about 50 lawyers and 50 or 60 staff. So nice sized firm offering coverage for at least 40 years. But each year we see our premiums go up, we see our deductibles going up, and the coverage to the, to the attorneys and to all the staff shrinking and becoming more expensive. And all companies across this country, especially small businesses, are facing the same thing, and individuals with any kinds of conditions are being declined or denied coverage or only covered at, at high rates. So I'm, I'm proud that this Congress has tackled this subject. It's one that really needs uh, to be tackled. And I believe under our bill, the Democratic bill, based on the analysis we've done for my district, this bill, the Democratic bill, improves employer-based coverage for my constituents for 396,000 residents. It provides credits to help pay for coverage for up to 160,000 households. It improves Medicare for 85,000 beneficiaries, including closing the prescription drug donut hole for 10,000 seniors. It allows 18,600 small businesses to obtain affordable health care coverage, and it provides tax credits for up to 17,500 small businesses. This bill will protect up to <coughs> 1,700 families from bankruptcy due to unaffordable health care costs. That's another part of this. Representative Matsui discussed this as, as a bankruptcy lawyer. The biggest single factor of bankruptcies is health care costs. That people just can't pay the freight and they'll take a Chapter 7 or they take a Chapter 13. And we can do better. We can do better than that. So I just thank the gentlemen who have testified today. I do want to uh, ask a couple questions. And uh, Mr. Camp, you and I started our day together. We'll, I guess we'll finish our day together. Um, in, in the Democratic bill, in Section 211, it's, it, there's clear prohibition of pre-existing conditions, OK? It says uh, conditions which impose any limit or condition on the coverage under the plan with respect to an individual or de dependent based on any of the following health status, medical condition, claims experience, receipt of health care, medical history, genetic information, evidence of insurability, disability, or source of injury. Can you show me in your bill where you have any language like that? Please. The, the language that we have in our bill on the pre-existing condition to ensure that Americans would get access to the And we would also uh, reduce the amount that states are allowed to charge high schools with 
Until we move to the exchange, and then it just abolishes it, period. And then you mandate um, uh, pre-existing condition coverage. We abolish the discrimination against pre-existing yes. conditions. That's how I term it. And the way you do that, the only way you can do it in that way is to require a guarantee issue and individual mandate. And we believe then the taxes that you have to raise or the penalties. And, and the bill for CBO, we still are actually doing tax just that people can still go to jail. But they don't pay the fines under the individual mandate. Joint tax just said that today. So the approach you take is a much more command and control. But yes, you accomplish in a different way what we do with, with, um, with the high-risk pools. And All right, so th th I guess that's my question. You have... You have a different pool, and in that pool, the uh, premiums can be at least 150 or 175 percent of standard rates. Isn't that right? Our, our approach is the same for the first several years. Yours actually has a, a six-month wait list. Possibly. Okay, but my question to you is you have a high-risk pool for people with pre-existing conditions, and I don't know how far it reaches out, but it's at 150 or 175 percent of the fee for anybody else, correct? Isn't that right? Yes, it's at okay. 150%. Now, the law is 200%, so we, we try to make this more affordable. Okay, but it's still, you still allow, in effect, a discrimination. Isn't? No, yes. I mean, you, you, the charge can be different. And, I, and really, I'm, I'm not going to get entangled with you the way Mike did, but, uh, no, but, but I mean, I, 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 you need to show me the language there. We also put, we, we also put uh, $25 billion in private schools. We, significantly increased spending on these to help the state stream of cost out. We also have state innovation grants in our, our bill, which gives states the flexibility to reduce costs in health care uh, all across the board. Those are all scorable. And so I, I'm just trying to explain to you some of the additional things our bill does. But no, we don't go... You don't abolish it. ...that you do because of the... That is a decision that you cannot make without, without also having... It, yeah, it, it, there's, okay, now my turn, all right? Yeah. I mean, there's no question that when you eliminate the discrimination against people with prior illnesses and conditions, it changes the actuarial numbers. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it, and that's more or less what you're saying, and I agree with you. Then, then it changes, and you have to have a bigger pool of people so that it works out fairly for all. And that's what the Democratic plan does as opposed to maintaining this high risk pool as I read your bill. We would and also I'm, that I'm not asking a question. That's there was no question. There was no question mark on that. We do I didn't completely describe everything we do on pre-existing conditions. If you're changing jobs or have health okay. there's there's a you know, similar you cannot deny anybody coverage for any reason. So uh, we do, we do address that. Yeah. Um, I guess my next question is, according to article, and I think the CBO scoring on both, both bills, the CBO uh, begins with a baseline, and I'm referring to an article from uh, yesterday's Washington Post. The CBO begins with a baseline estimate of 17% of legal non-elderly residents won't have health care in 2010, and under the Republican plan in 2019, after 10 years of the Republican plan, CBO estimates that 17%, the exact same amount, of legal non-elderly residents still won't have health care insurance. Have you done any analysis of of whether it changes over time, because apparently this, the CBO doesn't think that you cover anybody, anybody in addition. I don't want to keep being repetitive here, but let me just quickly say, <coughs> we think this is the first step to making sure all Americans have comprehensive coverage and access to health this, this one bill is the first step to getting there, and we want to do it without take any approach that you do, and without the spending, given the state of our economy and the state of our, our federal debt, that's why we're approaching 
And, and, and I appreciate that. I, you know, it's a good, it, you think of it as a first step. You know, uh, Morton Kondracki yesterday um, was a little more critical in that. He said, Republicans will offer a single substitute bill in the House and multiple amendments in the Senate to show they aren't, as Democrats charge, the party of no. But it's largely a charade. So I appreciate that it's a first step, but at least according to somebody who generally has a conservative take on things, it's a charade. And, you know, and that's what voting is all about. And, and I didn't characterize it that way. He did. I think everybody's been here being over the years, so. <laughs> right. Last uh, couple things is I'd like, you know, US today, USA Today was equally uh, tough. And they said uh, there aren't many advantages to being the minority party, but one is the freedom to not stick your neck out while going after your opponent's jugular. House Republicans showed this was their 11th hour introduction of an alternative health care plan. This minimalistic approach, uh, in that spirit, perhaps the best appraisal we can offer is this is not enough. The plan would not deal significantly with the 46 million or so without insurance. It would not help many of those who can't buy insurance at any price because of a pre-existing condition. And it doesn't make the necessary, though politically difficult, efforts at medical cost control. Its main purpose is to give the Republicans something to vote for before they vote against the Democrats' plan. And that's uh, the USA uh, Today editorial from uh, today. And, and let me just say this. Uh, we've been working with the Congressional Budget Office since May on language in our bill. And as you know, under this system, the majority gets their bill scored first by CBO. So we've been at the very end of the line after the House okay. and the Senate. So this is not something that has not been put together in the, in the last minute. But until we didn't feel it would be a straightforward alternative without the analysis of the Congressional Budget Office. So we wanted to have that analysis there, and that's why we had to wait. And, and I'm sure the Chairman will say, in his dealings with the Congressional Budget Office, they do it on their time, not yours. No. And then I guess uh, the last thing I'd like to. Um, Say and, and Mr. Sessions has uh, has left, but um, in connection with the doctor-owned hospitals, I know that I have been a terrible pest towards the chairman of the Ways and Means and to anybody who will listen to me about my hospital, which is five hundred million dollar project in my district, of which three hundred million has been or will be spent by the end of this year. And I, I will just want to be on the record that I will continue to be a pest about it. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Pingree. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to thank the panel for all the hours they've already put in with us. Um, and I appreciate the incredibly good questions uh, that the committee has already asked. And I know that the hour is already late and we have a lot of amendments in front of us. But I feel like I would be a little bit remiss if I didn't say at least a few words about this, and uh, I'll try to limit the questions that I have for you. Um, I, much like my colleague, uh, I feel like I, I have a story here that, uh, for me, is really almost all I need to say uh, tonight. And for me, it just sort of personifies why I want us to finish this evening, get to the vote, send this bill on so that we can eventually, before the end of this year, see the president sign this bill. I have the good fortune of being down here at the freshman end of this committee. So I feel like I got to come in on the issue of health care. I've, got I've gotten the opportunity to watch the last 10 months as we have talked endlessly about this topic and worked very hard, particularly these three committees, to getting to a solution in a final bill which we have in front of us today. And for me, this has been a very long journey. In my own personal story, I have a brother who was diagnosed with melanoma. Malignant melanoma, I hope nobody ever has to face this disease, either personally or with a family member or a loved one. Um, it's a terrible disease. My brother happened to be in a very difficult position in his life at the time. He had just taken a leave from his job um, because he had a two-year-old son and he wanted to be the stay-at-home dad. His wife had a slightly better job than him. And so it was a perfect time for him to stay home. 
Now, of course, he was on a temporary insurance policy, and he could not find an insurance company that would cover him once he was diagnosed with cancer. He thought about lying to the insurance companies and not telling them, but he decided to tell the truth. He was unable to find an insurance company, and subsequently he was unable to find a doctor who would see him. So he did what many families in this country did. As a young parent, he and his wife took everything they had out of savings, got rid of every asset that they possibly had, and made themselves eligible for Medicaid. Now, we talk about not wanting to put more people on Medicaid, but this is how we do it every single day. So he was eligible for Medicaid. He got the chance to see a doctor, but frankly, within 14 months, he was dead. He didn't survive the disease. Perhaps he would have if he'd had the opportunity to have private medical care or an earlier diagnosis, but he didn't. And this is a story that we hear over and over again. Now, I wish this story was just last year or two years ago, but actually, this story happened in my family 20 years ago. And when I was running for office, I took out the old VCR tape because what was interesting was during the time my brother had the disease, Good Morning America did a segment on people who got rejected by their insurance companies because of their pre-existing condition or couldn't find insurance. So I got to watch my brother in this position and think about the fact that this was 20 years ago, 20 years ago that we were talking about this exact problem. Now, I personally after this tragic loss in my family and the sadness that we all went through, decided to run for the state legislature. So back in 1992, I became a state legislator. Healthcare failed at the federal level in the early 90s, and like many other state legislators, I spent that decade working on ways to expand coverage in my state, and Maine has been a true leader in making sure that we had guaranteed issue, that we made sure that we did a variety of these things in our own state. But frankly, I can tell you, when my daughter, the Speaker of the House in Maine, called me last night, she said, Mom, when are you going to pass this bill? We don't have any money anymore to cover people uh, in our health care program. We can't begin to cover all the people with issues. We've had it up to here. What are you going to do? So for me, I am tired of the waiting game. I am tired of all the questions that we endlessly ask to keep ourselves sitting in committee so we don't have to go to a vote. And while I deeply appreciate the importance of reading every page of this bill, of making sure that we all know what's contained, and making sure that every provision works. I'm so proud of the people who've worked hard to get this bill to this point, who are willing to move forward and actually getting rid of problems like this, like pre-existing conditions. And I just want to say to my colleagues, let's just get this done. Let's just stop dithering along the way and pass this bill. So I, I'm here in the memory of my own brother, but of so many people in my district and everyone else's districts who wish they had medical care, wish they didn't have to sell all their assets, wish there was a public option that they could choose when an insurance company turns them down, and wishing that we could all just pass this bill. So thank yeah, you. Yeah. I yield back. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Mr. Polis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I know everybody here is happy. <coughs> The last uh, member of the committee is up. I think we can also be grateful that the Rules Committee is a very small committee <laughs> compared to other committees. Uh, we certainly appreciate your patience. Um, but, you know, this is a, uh, an issue of great magnitude and importance, so I think it's, uh, it's fair that we're having this discussion that there have been many discussions yeah. over time. Um, I certainly, I'd like to begin by echoing something that my colleague from uh, North Carolina, uh, Dr. Fox, said earlier. Um, and, you know, I would agree. It can be uh, offensive if people say of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle that they don't want to cover every American. I, I believe that most of them do. Um, but, you know, that's a matter of reciprocity there. So, too, it's equally, if not more, offensive to members on our side of the aisle if there are gross mischaracterizations uh, of what we're doing or our opinions uh, with regard to people who have said that we are trying to establish death panels or killing grandma. Uh, or are supporting some kind of government takeover of health care. These are all things uh, that are as offensive to Democrats and as factually incorrect as saying that somehow Republicans don't want to cover everybody. Uh, I believe that Republicans do want to cover everybody. Uh, maybe there's a plan to do it. It's not this current uh, plan before us, and we'll get more into that in a moment. Uh, but there would be hardly any Democrats among our caucus, on our committee, and any of the committees of jurisdiction that would support any kind of government takeover of health care. The truth of the matter is that after this bill passes, health care would continue to be privately provided. Uh, most people would still have insurance through their company, through their private insurance. We would have an exchange. It would be a hybrid, much as we have today. We have Medicare and Medicaid uh, that are public programs. Uh, there is nothing uh, in this bill 
that is any way, shape, or form of government takeover, and certainly nothing uh, that could be characterized in any way, shape, or form as uh, detrimental to the health of the elderly. Um, I'm proud to say that this bill addresses many of the concerns that were raised uh, by the public over many months of input. Uh, you know, I think the time that we spent on this bill is about right. How do I come to that conclusion? Well, I was asked by two different constituents today. One said, why have you taken so long to pass this bill? And the other said, why are you rushing to pass this bill? So I know that when we hear both sides about equally, we're probably taking about the right amount of time. You can't please everybody, but um, I think that we are uh, taking the right amount. The fact is that the input that we received from patriotic Americans over the course of July, August, September has led to a number of improvements in the bill, a reduction of the cost, starting to make an impact in reducing our deficit through this bill, even though this bill is not primarily a deficit reduction bill. I think we can all take pride in reducing our national deficit by over $100 billion in <coughs> 10 years. We, I think, can all agree we need to do more to reduce our deficit, but it's certainly a good start. Uh, we have added elements to it that have come from public interests, like increasing interstate competition, making sure we address the issues of tort reform in this bill. Uh, another thing I heard from a lot of constituents is we want to make sure that Congress uh, can choose the public option. Uh, what, what a great idea. I've pledged to do that. I'm a supporter of the public option. And I think the initial bill didn't have that opportunity for members of Congress. This bill allows members of Congress to choose the public option. Now, again, there has been a bit of a mischaracterization there because sometimes I hear from constituents, and many of you had as well, I think Congress should be, quote, unquote, put on the public option. Um, the mischaracterization there is that no one is put on the public option. And what I, I tell them, in deference to our Republican colleagues here today, I know that many of you are not supporters of the public option, and I would never support forcing you onto the public option, just as I wouldn't force my conservative constituents, who are distrustful of government, to, to take the public option. They're welcome to continue to choose the many private options that are out there, and I afford the conservative members of Congress, and even liberal members who, for whatever reason, don't want to be in the public option. I afford them the same choice, and this bill affords them the same choice uh, as other, uh, other Americans. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chairwoman Slaughter, uh, Acting Chair uh, McGovern, and of course the chairs of the committees for listening and incorporating many, many concerns into this bill, uh, a difficult task. In particular, uh, I'd like to applaud one element of the bill with regard to the investment in community health centers. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey mentioned, highlighted it earlier, certainly one of the areas that will create jobs. Uh, the gentleman from New York mentions job creation areas. We're increasing investment by $12 billion, in, $12 billion over five years, community health centers low-cost providers doing an absolutely terrific job. I have a couple quick questions about the Republican substitute motion uh, from, I believe, Mr. Camp, if you can help me here. Uh, my first question is, where does the money, and I think it's a $61 billion, where do you get the $61 billion you need to cover your bill? Are there tax increases? or Because uh, another part of it says no tax increases. So is this deficit spending, or are you getting the $61 billion somewhere else? No, we, we don't raise taxes, and we don't deficit spend. The major <coughs> Now, how, what, now how, how does that save the government money? I mean, because we're talking about government expenditures. How does lawsuit reform can save doctors, malpractice insurance? Why does that save the government $61 billion? Well, that, that is only the savings that would occur in Medicare. If you added in private insurance, uh, CBO would suggest that we double that. So that is only the government side of the ledger uh, with regard to that. <coughs> My, my next question for you is, um, is, this is just a simple yes or no question, if uh, you would indulge me, I'll, you know, if you want to elaborate after yes or no, that's fair, but, but uh, my question is, is it true that under the Republican plan, the number of uninsured people in our country would increase uh, over 10 years? Is that true? No. Okay, because I have an a estimate in front of me, the Congressional Budget Office, and I'm uh, it sounds like you're establishing that it's incorrect. It shows the number of uninsured would grow by about 2 million people from 2010 to 2019. Well, the answer is no, not as a percentage. Well, no, the, the question was the number of uninsured people. So uh, the number of uninsured people in our country, would that increase over the next 10 years under your plan? Not if the country doesn't grow. Uh, do you expect the country to grow in population over the next 10 years? The answer is no, not a percentage of well, I, I think it's a, it's a reasonable assumption. Every demographer would show the, the growth of our population. Uh, certainly people can disagree with how much we're growing. So uh, I know you you're, you're, you're keep referring to percentages, but the number of uninsured 
people in our country would be higher under uh, the plan that you are so, articulating and, and today, correct? There is, there is an effect there because of the estrogen bill, the fact that it terminates after five years and people lose coverage there. So that, that um, analysis you're referring to takes into account that factor. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, for one of our chair people. It probably falls under Mr. Pallone or, or, or Mr. Miller, uh, perhaps. Uh, no, the question is with regard to um, undocumented immigrants. Now, uh, I think on both sides of the aisle, we have uh, proposed solutions to the fact that we have 12 to 15 million undocumented immigrants. Very few of us would say it's a good thing to have them. Uh, my own solution would be to normalize their status. There's probably those on the other side of the aisle and even on our side of the aisle that would like some other solution. But the fact is, uh, we have undocumented people who live here or work here. Uh, should, doesn't it save taxpayers a considerable amount of money to allow them to buy insurance with their own money so that the burden isn't shifted onto other taxpayers because they're, they're showing up and not able to pay for their health care? The answer is clearly yes. I mean, uh, the only reason that, um, you know, in my opinion, that we have a prohibition on, um, on uh, the undocumented is because Politically, uh, the majority of uh, members do not want to see them covered. I mean, if you look at it from a rational point of view, um, you know, by covering them, you'd save a lot of money. And all the other arguments that we've been using here about how uh, if they get coverage, they go to a doctor on a regular basis, they don't go to the emergency room, they don't drive up the costs. But I think a political, the political reality is that we can't... Um, we can't include them uh, because, uh, you know, we can't get the votes. Now, to be clear, uh, they are not included in any subsidies that arise under the bill. Uh, to be correct. equally clear, uh, under the House bill, they, with their own money, uh, they can buy insurance. And the reason that I asked this question, to get it on the record, is we have several amendments, one before us, uh, and I'm sure we'll get to them shortly, but I wanted to establish this answer, one from uh, Deal Heller, Wilson & Johnson, and one from King, among others, that would propose that taxpayers subsidize illegal aliens by not allowing them to buy insurance on their own. So these, these amendments would actually increase the amount of money going from taxpayers to fund medical care for undocumented immigrants. Uh, and I wanted to get on the record the fact that uh, it would save taxpayer money to the extent that undo our undocumented population is willing and able to buy insurance with their own money. Preventing them from doing that uh, would force taxpayers to subsidize uh, illegal aliens. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Um, again, I want to uh, <laughs> applaud the work of our – this was not easy. Uh, I happened to serve on one of the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, we met until 6.30 in the morning, uh, thanks to uh, Chairman Miller. Uh, Mr. Andrews as well on that committee. I'm hopeful that we can dispense with this out of this committee and not set another record and before 6.30 in the morning. That would be nice. Um, but I, I uh, appreciate all the hard work that has gone into this on both sides of the aisle. Uh, we certainly appreciate a thoughtful Republican substitute amendment, although, again, it does uh, actually leave less pe more people uninsured than we have today after 10 years. Uh, but I appreciate the work and thought that went into it, and there are some perhaps some good ideas in that as well. Uh, that might be able to incorporate it in a later legislation. And I'd like to yield back. I thank you very much. We have set a record. I think this is the longest sing panel we've ever had here, six, six hours, over six hours. And we need to pass health care because you're going to need health care to recover from this uh, experience here. But we appreciate very much and are very proud of all your work, both Republicans and Democrats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, no. Sure. Thank you very much. Well, we got people here. We got Try to bring everybody up. 
Uh, this is a Mr. Dry's suggestion, so that we can go through this, uh, go through the, uh, I don't know if we can no, or we not. don't have to if you don't want to. No, so I, I'm just trying to figure out how many people we got here. Yeah, Mr. Deal, um, Mr. Walden, Mr. Burgess, what? Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, why don't we begin with this panel? Yeah, that's what I'd say. Four or five people, and they're only going to call three or four minutes. Yeah. Any, are your, uh, your amendments to the Republican substitute or to the Democratic bill? Are your, all your amendments included in the Republican bill? Are yours in the Republican bill, Ms. Blackburn? Yeah, okay. Mr. Yours in the re some. Some are, okay. Mr. Walden, are yours in the Republican? No, but is your, is your amendment already included in the Republican substitute? Well, these are filed to the No, I'm just curious. These are filed to the No, I, I'm, just, I'm just curious I mean, because. We have a substitute before us, but. Mr. Chairman, don't yeah. mind arguing. Okay. The underlying issue is not relevant. Okay, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just curious. So why don't we, Mr. Burgess, you've been here the longest, so. Oh. Mr. Deal, go ahead. Thank you, and I will be brief. I know that you appreciate that. Um, I have several amendments, and I will try to go through them very quickly. Uh, the first one is one that deals with verification of the citizenship. Uh, the underlying bill moves to a Social Security based identification system, one that uh, relies on Social Security number, which we all know does not uh, have a foolproof method. It certainly, I think, will exacerbate the problem of uh, stolen ID, the uh, use of fraudulent social security numbers. My amendment would propose that we go back to where we were under the Debt Reduction Act, uh, which uh, would require verification not only uh, of your citizenship, but of who you are as an individual. So the social security card does not have a picture of it. There's no way to know that the social security card and the name associated with it is in fact an individual that is proffering it as identification. The second one would deal with answering that. The first one is in the general Medicaid uh, portion of the bill. The second part uh, deals with the affordability credits. It likewise would require identification other than simply using the social security. Uh, the third one uh, would be to uh, not allow uh, illegal aliens to participate in the health insurance Change. And this is consistent with the language that is in the Senate Finance Committee version uh, relating to this very same subject. I, I would hope that it would be included in whatever final version of anything that was passed on that issue. The, uh, the next area is a totally different area. It deals with disproportionate shares, dish payments to hospitals, even though the goal of both uh, proposals here is to eliminate uninsured, we recognize that both plans still have significant numbers of uninsured and to eliminate the dish payments as the bill would propose to do will leave those hospitals who do still have uncompensated indigent care a huge financial burden and I don't think that this dish payment uh, provision uh, should be eliminated from the existing law. The last provision I have uh, is an option for the states. The underlying bill requires the states to enroll up to 150 of the federal poverty level into their state Medicaid programs. Many states, uh, such as mine, are very concerned about the increased cost to be associated with that, even though initially there is a proposal that the federal government will pay the vast majority of it. Uh, it then becomes an unfunded mandate as those proportions shift. Uh, this proposal would simply give the states the option to elect to opt out of increasing their Medicaid eligibility levels uh, and would, uh, I think, put them in a much better position to control their destiny and the dollars that they have to raise to continue to participate in the Medicaid program. I would believe that an opt-out provision on the expansion of Medicaid is a very uh, necessary component to let states make those choices rather than under the underlying bill force it upon them and to, in fact, have their citizens automatically enroll without their having to say so in that process. Those are the amendments that I have tendered to the committee. I hope that you have Thank you. Mr. Walden. Mr. Chairman. Yes. 
Before Mr. Walden begins, I'd like to welcome him back as officially the only member of Congress that really did have H1N1. Uh, and uh, we, we, you may want to clear the room now. We're we, we, we floor mates. We are floor mates, and, and I have managed to survive, but it does heighten um, our concerns, and I'm glad that Greg is uh, uh, feeling better. Um, and for the information of the general public, uh, we do not have, as members of Congress, uh, uh, the access to H1N1 uh, 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 fl uh, flu shots. Right. And, uh, some people I've gotten calls saying you got it and I don't and I just want people to know that we don't have it and uh, had Greg had it maybe he would have been a little bit better off. Okay. Thank you for reminding us Elsie. <laughs> Thank you Elsie. <laughs> Thank you for your well wishes when I, I was sick and, and those of my colleagues uh, as well. It's uh, not a bug you want and it's not a bug you want to share so I followed both the doctor's advice and the CDC's recommendations and stayed away from all of you. Uh, for the full uh, time period uh, that they suggested, including two days after your fever breaks. So um, it is, uh, it's one that uh, is not fun. So thank you, and thank you for your well wishes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I come before you this evening uh, with two amendments, uh, creatively called Walden 1 and Walden 2. Um, these both were amendments that we dealt with in the Energy and Commerce Committee and were some of the very few amendments that were adopted by voice vote. And they're pretty simple. Somehow along the way, though, when the uh, bill was rewritten from 3200 to H.R. 3962, these amendments were stripped out. And let me tell you what the amendments do, and I hope I can earn your support for, their, for your consideration to include them back in the uh, base bill. The bill establishes a Health Benefits Advisory Committee, which I know you're familiar with, which would dictate what benefits would be offered through a government plan. So the first amendment was offered, again, it was one of the few adopted by voice vote bipartisan, that specifically said that uh, there would be proportional rural representation on this committee. Now, I represent a district that's 70,000 square miles. We deal with access to health care issues all the time in this district, and they're very unique. If you're trying to get home health care, um, distance is an issue. We have home health care providers may drive an hour or two hours to, to go visit somebody who needs this assistance. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that as you delineate the various interests that are on, these, on this new commission that will be determining what these policies look like, that at least you had a, a, a proportional representation. Rural America comprises a quarter of the U.S. population, and I think it should be represented uh, accordingly. Those living in rural areas face very specific and unique challenges accessing health care. And frankly, only those uh, who have delivered care in these rural areas can fully appreciate what those challenges are. Government agencies receive representation on this committee, which they do. Shouldn't the taxpayers in rural America that make up almost a quarter of the population have that kind of representation? Um, this new health care committee will be uh, highly political in nature. The Surgeon General will chair the committee. It'll be comprised of nine non-federal employees appointed by the president, eight federal employees appointed by the president, nine non-federal employees appointed by the Comptroller General. So my amendment would simply revise the bill so that not less than one quarter of the members of the committee will be actual practitioners who have legitimate experience practicing in rural areas for at least the five year uh, preceding their appointment. So that's the first one. Do you want me to address the second one, yes. Mr. Chairman? The second amendment I offer today uh, was the other one uh, that was adopted again by voice vote without opposition, bipartisan, um, 58 members of the committee. This particular amendment, labeled Walden 01, would ensure that the Medicare beneficiaries and rural health care providers are appropriately represented on MedPAC. Now, you all know that MedPAC is the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Um, and this is the commission that's nonpartisan that advises Congress on issues affecting the Medicare program, such as access to care, quality of care, and appropriateness of Medicare payments to health care providers. Rural America continues to be challenged by shortages of health care providers, barriers to health care access, and limitations in the ability of providers to access integrated health systems and electronic networks to efficiently manage the delivery of health care services. My amendment, again, is pretty straightforward. And by the way, it doesn't cost a dime. 
It would give rural Americans a voice on MedPAC by requiring the number of MedPAC commissioners representing rural beneficiaries and providers, again, to be proportional to the number of rural Medicare beneficiaries in the Medicare program so that our seniors in the, in the rural areas have the kind of representation they need on this important commission. Um, about 26% of Medicare population lives in the rural areas today. However, only two of MedPAC's 17 commissioners have rural health care credentials. In the past, it's been as low as just one commissioner. So fair representation on MedPAC would require five commissioners be rural representatives. Um, following adoption of this amendment, by the way, in the committee in July, the National Rural Health Association issued the following statement, and I quote, this amendment is a huge step for rural America, which has traditionally been underrepresented in MedPAC despite statutory requirements that a balance of its commissioners have rural experience. This amendment, again, is identical to a bill that I authored with Congressman Earl Pomeroy. We co-chaired the Rural Health Care Caucus in the last Congress. That bill had 58 co-sponsors, 29 Democrats, 29 Republicans. Again, both of these amendments were agreed to by the Full Energy and Commerce Committee without objection. They were in the underlying bill, H.R. 3200. When it went behind closed doors, they disappeared. And so I would beg of the, uh, rural, of the Rules Committee your full consideration and support for this simple fairness in terms of getting that voice represented on these two very important commissions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have several amendments, and I'll go through them one by one. The First Amendment is uh, Amendment 23962. It is included in the base text. Part of it is included in the base text of the Republican substitute. The First Amendment it would make Medicaid the payer of last resort. Uh, by statute, Medicaid is the payer of last resort, which means anyone else, any third party, should and uh, must pay first. Within the Deficit Reduction Act, we provided funds for states to set up electronic verification for third party responsibility. The reports from the field have not been encouraging, with third parties not wanting to pay their share and states lagging on passing needed legislation to establish these programs. In 1996, Congress passed HIPAA, which in Sections 1, uh, 1171 and 1176 provided a mandate that health plans reply to standardized electronic commerce messages. In 2003, audits of six Medicaid authorities uncovered problems with 20 percent to 36 percent of claims sampled. These audits, expo audits expose the ineffectiveness of the standard pay and chase third party liability program. In 2005, California and Washington each audited their claims and found that between 16% and 19% of those claims were fraudulent or abusive, roughly bearing out prior surveys. The Government Accountability Office has backed up these findings, assuming a national error rate of 20%. The waste of taxpayer assets on unlawful Medicaid claims exceeds $45 billion per year. The amendment requires that all states show compliance with the statute that Medicaid is the payer of last resort. States that are certified to be in compliance get a $2 million bonus. States that become compliant get a $1 million bonus. States that are not in compliance after one year would see a 1% reduction in the FMAP they receive until they become compliant. This is simply a good government amendment and should be accepted. The amendment will ensure that all states are taking needed steps to enforce current law and keep their programs up to date in the realm of the payer of last resort. No third party should shirk their responsibility. The third parties we're referring to here are the private insurance companies. They should not shirk their responsibility and with the expansion in the Medicaid provided under the bill, a strong third party electronic verification system will become even more important. I would stress that in the GAO report that came out in 2006, the rate of non-compliance of this was estimated between a low of 11 percent for California, a high of 25 percent for the state of Iowa, but across the board it is a significant amount of money. At the end of the day, no one wants a medical provider to bill the wrong payer and no one wants the wrong payer to pay. We all want to know that the payer who is required to be the primary payer, in fact, pays the bill. Um, again, that is part of the underlying Republican substitute, and I offer that as an amendment to the uh, base bill 3962. Second amendment gets to one of the issues that Dr. Fox brought up earlier in, uh, in the discussion with the committee chairman. This uh, would rate insurance policies, because, uh, would allow insurance policies to rate for tobacco use. 
the current bill under discussion has very strict rating rules and generally I'm sympathetic to limiting insurers' ability to use loose rating standards to their advantage and for adverse selection. However, I believe not allowing some variation for smokers is an oversight. This amendment is not without precedent. Private companies are now charging employees more to cover health care costs if the employee smokes because of the increased cost of the company to, to insure or cover them. In fact, a growing number of private and public employers are requiring employees who use tobacco to pay higher premium, premiums and actually using that as an incentive, a negative incentive, to motivate some of them to stop mo smoking and lower health care costs for the company and, of course, result in better health for the employee after they stop smoking. While the amounts range from about $20 to $50 a month, it is an important point. Smoking has, despite the fact that it's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, smoking has absolutely no health benefit and should absolutely be discouraged. With smokers costing companies about 25% more than non-smokers in the area of health care, it just makes good business sense. This amendment would allow rating as long as it should not vary by more than 1.5 to 1. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates $92 billion in lost wages annually in the United States from smokers who die prematurely. In addition, the economic cost of smoking includes 75, over $75 billion per year in direct health costs. Insurance companies spend more on medical expenses for smokers than on non-smokers. Overall, for every package of cigarettes smoked, that smoker costs the nation uh, over, uh, over $7 in medical care and lost pro productivity. Each year, a staggering 440,000 people die from tobacco use. One in every five deaths, one in every five deaths is related to cigarette smoking. Allowing a slight variation in rating for smoking makes economic sense and it makes medical sense. The third amendment, which is included in the base Republic, included in the Republican substitute also, but I'm offering it as an amendment to the, uh, to the uh, 3962, is regarding medical liability. Of course, we've all heard that many doctors are forced to practice defensive medicine and face the constant threat of lawsuits and unsustainable medical liability insurance rates, which result in millions of dollars in unnecessary tests and procedures. I should know. The profession of obstetrics and gynecology is one of the strongest where, where defensive medicine has to be one of your strongest subjects because you're constantly under threat. Seasoned medical professionals are retiring early because staying in practice is no longer financially feasible, further contributing to our nation's doctor shortage. There's a growing crisis that, pushing, uh, that is pushing affordable health care beyond the grasp of millions of amendment, uh, Americans. The amendment would require a national across-the-board change in the medical justice system that would lower costs and improve care by lessening the threat of, from uh, unmerited lawsuits, cap non-economic damages at $250,000, an aggregate cap, though, that uh, totals $750,000 in sum, $250,000 cap for the doctor, $250,000 cap for the hospital, a $250,000 cap for a second hospital or a nursing home if one is involved. Caps on wrongful deaths would be cap, uh, wrongful death awards would be capped at 1.4 million. Expert opinions relating to physicians may only be provided by physicians who are actively in practice. Payment of future damages or on a periodic or accrual basis. Limitations on liability for good Samaritans providing emergency services. This is not a theory. This is a fact. It has worked in Texas since 2003. Lawsuit reform in Texas has created a magnet for doctors and provided the funding mechanism to improve access to care and enhance patient safety through significant savings. In 2003, Texas passed sweeping medical liability reform, and the results have been better than expected. According to the Texas Medical Association, charity care rendered by Texas hospitals rose 24 percent in the three years following the reforms. Texas has licensed almost 15,000 new physicians in the five years since the reform passed, a 36% increase from pre-reform. But this is what is very important. 33 rural counties have seen a net gain in emergency room physicians, including 26 counties that previously had none. After years of decline, the ranks of medical specialists are growing in Texas. In my field of obstetrics, Texas saw a net loss of 14 obstetricians in the two years preceding reform. 
since the state has, since then, the state has experienced a net gain of 192 obstetricians. Uh, 26 rural counties have added an OB doctor, including 10 counties that previously had none. A vote against this amendment will reaffirm that uh, the commitment is not to our nation's doctors, but to the nation's trial attorneys. A vote for this amendment will tell America's doctors that we are committed to putting in place reforms that will allow them to do their job. Interestingly, we were talking about the American Medical Association just a few moments ago. This is one of the, the top priorities for the American Medical Association, and one of the reasons, quite frankly, that they, that they endorsed the Democrat, uh, the underlying bill. Uh, not doing this will actually negate any of the benefit to America's doctors that might occur within the bill. One of the other things that is so important to uh, the nation's physicians is uh, my next amendment. How, how many amendments do you have, Mr. Burgess? Eight. Okay. Next amendment uh, would require Medicaid payments to be 75% of what would be standard in a government insurance or standard in one of the state-based programs. For too many, Medicaid is, uh, puts, puts, uh, is an empty promise. It puts care beyond uh, the, the reach of the poorest citizens. Those with Medicaid find themselves unable to access services because Medicaid pays less for comparable service than private insurers. It pays even less than Medicare. Patients then soon realize that coverage does not equal access. Medicaid payment shortfalls lead providers to cost shift to reduce charity care. At worst, providers simply refuse to accept Medicaid patients or limit the number that they treat. We can reform health care in this nation, but the first step, the very first step, should be to fix that part of the medical care in this country that is already known to be broken. Time after time, providers cite lower reimbursement and paperwork concerns as the two most important reasons for limiting their participation in Medicaid and SCHIP. While doing business with the government will always include excessive paperwork, we can help fix the issue of reimbursement. The amendment states that payment for all services under Medicaid must be paid at at least 75% of the rate of, state of a state employee plan or the FEHBP plan most chosen by families. In the case of vision and dental, 75% of the rate of the state employee supplemental plan or the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan Supplemental, most often chosen by families. Nearly one-third of pediatricians report they would accept more Medicaid patients if reimbursements were increased. The Michigan Medical Society found that Medicaid pays less than half of what private insurance pays for the exact same service. Instead of tying rates to Medicare, which has reimbursements of its own, let's try linking to private rates. I don't think there's any question what uh, the nation's doctors would prefer. Another point that needs to be considered is uh, the, uh, the, Medicaid, the Medicaid provider networks. As a practicing physician for over 25 years, I'm really one of only a few of our colleagues who's actually treated patients under the Medicaid system. It's, it's, it's startling when I hear that some believe that expanding Medicaid in its current form is part of the solution in covering our nation's uninsured. The bill seems to recognize some of the shortfalls in the program by linking some payments to Medicare, but Medicare is problematic itself. But then you add 16 more people, million more people to the program, and we really see that we need fundamental Medicaid reform. And the, clearly the question is, if we don't do it now, when will we do it? Well, what if members of Congress were required to get off the sidelines and, and walk the talk in health care? I'm a Republican. I don't... Uh, it's not often that you'll hear me advocate for a new mandatory population, but what if we created a mandatory population of all 535 members of Congress so that they would know what it was like to be insured under the Medicaid system? We can reform health care in this nation, but the first step should be to fix what's broken. Perhaps we could be more creative and successful in making meaningful reforms to our country's health care system that would be a step forward for all Americans. This amendment would allow members of Congress to sign up for Medicaid, just like uh, any other of their low-income constituents, to see what, Medicaid, uh, what a Medicaid patient uh, has to deal with. Members of Congress would now be a mandatory population in statute, and all asset tests would be waived of necessity. The federal government would assume 100 percent of the cost of the coverage. We would not push the, uh, push the FMAP onto the states. 
The next amendment uh, deals with ensuring a network adequacy before Medicaid expansion. Gets to some, to some of the things that um, Mr. Cardoza was talking about with his pediatric network for, for uh, neonatologists. In Medicaid, like other federal programs, we clearly see the need for reform. Research has shown that Medicaid enrollees face significant challenges in finding a health care provider that will accept Medicaid coverage. <coughs> Medicaid patients soon realize that the promise of Medicaid does not always provide them access. A 2006 report by the Center Studying Health System Change found that nearly half of all doctors polled said they had stopped accepting or limited the number of new Medicaid patients. In contrast, 95, over 95 percent of the doctors polled in the same survey said they were accepting new patients that were covered through private health plans. This amendment <coughs> would require each state to certify to the Secretary of Health and Human Services that they have enough primary care providers to see patients and children currently under their program. Each certification shall be accompanied by a survey demonstrating network adequacy conducted by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the State Medical Society, or an other qualified provider-based organization. Once such certification is received and accepted the secretary, by the Secretary, the Medicaid expansion provided for under the bill would occur in the following year. One of the things that concerns, the next amendment deals with the CBO scoring. One of the things that concerns us with this bill is, are we accurate in our projections on what this bill were co will cost? We're presented today with a CBO score that says this bill will cost approximately a trillion dollars and cover 96 percent of the people, and we say the bill will be fully paid for. In fact, the President's own words, add, what, add not one dime to the deficit. I'm oftentimes frustrated with the Congressional Budget Office. I know they are individuals with great integrity, and I believe their estimates are based on sound math and science. However, <coughs> what happens in year 11 of this bill? How much of the bills, uh, how much of the pay-fors will be counted as part of the baseline after 10 years? The taxes you raise on Americans under the bill will continue to generate money into the future, but the bill <coughs> is not paid for indefinitely it becomes yet another unfunded liability in the next decade of its existence. For those who might plan on being here in 10 years, after tonight I'm not sure about myself, but here are a couple of problems that await us. In 2017, Medicare Hospital Trust Fund goes bankrupt. 2018, the Social Security Trust Fund will start paying out in benefits more than it's scheduled to take in. 2019, how much money will Congress have to cut or raise in taxes to keep this bill going? I don't know the answer, you don't know the answer, but we do owe it to the American people to try to keep tabs on this process as it goes forward. All this amendment does is create a yearly report card for our efforts under the bill. This will allow each generation <coughs> to know how well the bill is succeeding or failing on delivering the President's promise of universal coverage that will not add one dime to the deficit. Mr. Chairman, I don't want you to be disappointed. This is the last amendment that I have. You have a lot of stamina, Doc, but I have more. <laughs> now, we heard earlier, we talked about setting up the public plan, about uh, the capital reserves that would be necessary for setting up the public plan. We acknowledge that it's going to be difficult to set up the public plan. In fact, without even uh, naming an administrator for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, it is going to be a Herculean task to get this public option up and running. This amendment would require that uh, there be capital reserves uh, required to carry sufficient liquid capital to prepare, pre pre to prepare for or prevent a worst case scenario. The regulatory reserves are expressed as ratios of premium income and claims experience. The buyer of insurance pays a premium against the promise that he or she will receive a payment if a specified random event occurs. If the insurer does not hold enough reserves to fulfill this promise, the consumer is being cheated. I will tell you from my experience in private practice, if you have somebody in the insurance business who is not sufficiently capitalized and does not have sufficient liquidity and the economy hits a negative patch as we are in now, that insurance company may go away, leaving that patient to rely on a state pool that is in existence. And if many people tap that fund simultaneously, it becomes problematic as to whether or not that patient indeed has any coverage. A potential failure without adequate reserves undermines the confidence on which the market is based. 
it will be necessary for the public plan to have such a fund. And that fund should not be the United States Treasury. We're going to be risking more debt to enact this, uh, to enact this proposal. So the amendment <clears throat> would prohibit the United States Treasury from being used as a means for capital reserve funds. The amendment also clarifies that the public plan would need to seek investments or use premiums to create a capital reserve fund similar to that which is required of other health plans. Allowing the United States Treasury to be the ultimate backstop will incur could encourage a plan to act recklessly, and we've already seen what happens in other industries when this, when this, uh, when this is applied. While this bill prohibits bailouts of the public plan, using the Treasury as a promise of government backing, is allow, uh, indirectly we're allowing such. The public plan can still use the full faith and credit of the United States Treasury to stabilize their risk. If it's good enough for business, it's good enough for insurers, even casinos, it should be good enough for the public plan. Shouldn't the public plan play by the same rules as everyone else? It's a simple amendment, and if the majority is committed to a public plan that competes with private insurers on a fair and level playing field, it certainly should be accepted without objection. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the amendments that uh, I am submitting tonight. And again, I uh, offer them for your consideration. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burgess. Uh, before we proceed, um, uh, um, Congressman Deal was here earlier and left, and I don't know whether um, anyone had any questions of him, but if any of the, uh, those of you that are remaining uh, do leave, then um, uh, Ms. Berkeley and Mr. Cooper um, and Mr. Johnson, who may have left already, have been here a very long time and uh, were here earlier. So if uh, any of you leave, I'd ask uh, those members to come forward. Ms. Blackburn. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for your courtesy tonight. I have six amendments. Uh, I will speak briefly to the six amendments, and I, they are numbered Blackburn 1 through 6 for you all. I would like to speak to them in the order of amendments 1, 4, 5, and 6, those four uh, first, because they deal with lessons that should be learned from TenCare, a program that we have in the state of Tennessee that uh, while it was established as an executive order of the Office of the Governor and put into place in 94, the end of 94 in our state, um, it is something that as a state senator in Tennessee we had to deal with, and it also was the test case for public option health care. Uh, Blackburn Amendment number one prevents the increased cost of private health insurance, and it prohibits the federal plan, the government plan and exchange from being established until the HHS secretary certifies that the establishment of the government plan and the exchange will not either directly nor indirectly cause the cost of the average price of private health insurance premiums to increase. And Mr. Chairman, this is an amendment that I felt was important because of one of the lessons learned in the cost shifting that we saw take place in the increase above the national average, the increase in the cost of employer-based insurance premiums and private insurance premiums in our state. Uh, Blackburn Amendment number four prohibits excess spending. This amendment uh, deals with the cost of the reforms that are made under the bill and when that those costs consume 25 percent of the federal budget, then the bill would be repealed and re we would return to the system that was in place prior to the enactment of the bill. And Mr. Chairman, the reason for this is because of the accelerated growth in the cost that we had for, uh, that we saw in TenCare. And Mr. Chairman, we would love to have the chairwoman take, take the chair, and I thank you, I thank you for that. But in Tennessee, we saw uh, the TenCare program grow to the point that it consumed over 30 percent of our state budget. And as a state senator dealing with the balanced budget amendment, every year we had to deal with the impact of this, the growth in the cost of this program to the point that it was consuming every new dollar that came into our state revenues. So an amendment that would prohibit that growth, the excess, excess spending on that program, and when it hits that 25% trigger, then we would begin to backtrack. 
uh, Blackburn Amendment number five deals with unfunded mandates to the states. And because of the increase in the Medicaid uh, expansions in this program, we feel like it's important to offer an amendment that would eliminate unfunded mandates to the states via the health reform plan that you all have brought before us. Uh, amendment number six would uh, deal with current health care coverage, and it would suspend the operation of the government plan unless the HHS secretary certifies that no American will lose access to his or her current health insurance due to the establishment and operation of the government plan. And this would be an annual certification. And Madam Chairman, we think this is important. The President has said one of his stated goals is if you like the health care that you have, the health insurance that you have, you should be able to keep it. We agree with that. And as I have previously stated, there are so many good lessons that could be learned about public option health care from what was offered in Tennessee. And we know that many individuals lost that employer-sponsored care and moved or saw that they had to move to the government plan. And so having that there provides us a, a stopping point and a review point and every year for the HHS secretary to be able to say that people are not losing the health insurance that they have, and indeed they are able to keep the insurance that they would like to have. Uh, the two other Im amendments that I am uh, proposing, amendment number two uh, deals with HSAs and the HDHPs. And it simply states, nothing shall preclude an individual from purchasing or maintaining insurance qualifying for health savings account deposits, and nothing shall interfere with their ability to continue to make deposits according to the schedule created in the existing HSA legislation. And amendment number three prevents rationing. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, so many people that we talk to uh, are questioning if this is going to cause rationing. They look at the Comparative Results Board, they look at how decisions would be approached, and they simply want an assurance from us that they are not, that they are not going to be faced with addressing health care rationing. We all know that as you limit access and as costs rise, a natural outcome of that, and it may be an unintended consequence of the legislation, but uh, rationing many times takes place. I thank you for the courtesy. Those are my six amendments. Those, that is a brief description of each amendment. Right. I, um, yeah, Dr. Gingrey, I guess uh, we go back over this side. Now the panel enlarged itself before we got to questions. Go ahead, Dr. Gingrey. How many amendments do you have, sir? I have seven, Chairman Davis. Um, uh, I'm afraid that we cannot. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank uh, both you and Ranking Member Dreyer and all the members of the Rules Committee for me the opportunity to testify uh, regarding the amendments that have offered to H.R. 3962, the Affordable Health Care for America Act. We all agree that we need to find common sense bipartisan reform to fix those parts of our health care system that do not work. However, over the past several months, countless numbers of my constituents have told me that H.R. 3962, formerly known as H.R. 3200, is not the answer for our health care problem. They have told me that at $1.2 trillion, it costs too much. They have told me that it taxes too much, over $700 billion, to business and families while taking $500 billion away from our seniors and billions more from our states. Most importantly, my constituents have told me that this bill will lead to a government takeover of our health care system. Mr. Chairman, despite my professional background as an OBGYN doctor for nearly 30 years, as a Republican in the minority, I and my 12 Republican colleagues of the GOP Doctors Caucus have tried to use our professional expertise to help inform and to shape this debate. Unfortunately, like the vast majority of Republicans, do, do you have amendments, Dr. Gannon? Our constituents have been shut out of the process of crafting this legislation. Mr. Chairman, chairman I do have seven yeah, amendments, uh, and I'm I going to describe mm -hmm. those. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to be as expeditious as possible. Some of my colleagues uh, have taken uh, a good little 
little bit of time testifying, and if you'll be patient with me, Mr. Chairman, I'll try to move move through those pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very uh, concise, uh, concisely written amendments, uh, easily understandable, uh, and I think I can complete. I'm sorry, I asked. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I continue? Proceed. Thank you very much. During the committee consideration of H.R. 3200, 20 Republican amendments were adopted. Of those, those amendments, only five were included as part of H.R. 3962. Unfortunately, this is only further evidence that the office of the bill did not want to include much, if any, input from our side of the aisle. Mr. Chairman, I'm joining a number of my colleagues who have submitted amendments to the Rules Committee with the hopes of getting a full and open debate on these issues on the House floor. And I personally submitted, as I told you, seven amendments that I believe all reflect the will of my constituents and many others around the country. I believe one of my amendments in particular, this is Gingry number 50, will be the one of the biggest cost savers in the health care debate. This amendment, Mr. Chairman, provides meaningful medical liability reform, one issue that both patients and doctors agree will drive down the cost of care and end the practice of defensive medicine. Even the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office provided a cost analysis of this particular proposal, citing that liability reform will provide $54 billion in savings over the 10-year budget window. I've also offered various other amendments that address final points of the bill to maintain the sanctity of the doctor-patient relationship, prevent the rationing of care, require members of Congress to enroll in the so-called public option. Specifically, my amendment to prevent rationing was voted on and included unanimously in the Energy and Commerce mark markup of 3200, the original bill, back in July. Yet after this bill had gone behind closed doors, this amendment now is nowhere to be found. Mr. Chairman, I believe that each of these amendments address critical points that embody the concerns voiced throughout the country during August and beyond. For the sake of transparency and the future, of health care in America, I ask that all of these amendments are made in order so we can have an open and full debate on these issues. Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, I will very quickly go through these seven amendments. Angry number one, members of Congress and their staff will no longer be eligible for the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan, but they will receive their health care benefits from the public plan. It's good enough for the American citizens, it should be good enough for their elected representatives. Gingrey number two, the individual mandate is an unconstitutional provision that takes away American civil liberties like never before. Therefore, the amendment would simply require the secretary of HHS to provide for an opt-out process from this individual mandate for every American citizen. Gingrey three, this amendment was originally added to H.R. 3200 on a bipartisan basis in the Energy and Commerce Committee markup, but it was dropped by the majority party. The amendment would simply say that CMS cannot use comparative effectiveness research data to make coverage determinations on the basis of cost. In number four, this amendment represents H.R. 1086, the Health Act, that I wrote. which seeks to enact medical liability reform in the state. The bill would include caps on non-economic damages and other reforms included in the CBO score that showed a $54 billion savings over the 10-year budget window. Amendment number five. This amendment would simply bar non-economic, I want to repeat, non-economic damage awards when a provider is following best practice guidelines as developed in the bill by the Center for Quality Improvement. Angry number six. This amendment would require that the Secretary of Health and Human Services shall provide for a methodology that ensures that any savings to the Medicare program resulting from H.R. 3962 be retained in the Medicare program to make seniors' health care more stable and affordable. And Mr. Chairman, my last amendment number seven, it would simply state that nothing in H.R. 3962 shall be construed to allow any federal employee or political appointee to dictate how a medical provider practices uh, Mr. Chairman, those are my seven amendments. If you have them before you, I'd be glad to respond to any questions. Thank you. Mr. McKeown? Thank you, uh, Chairman Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Breyer. Uh, in the interest of time, and 
with the hope that you not have to spend all night like the education committee did. I would just ask that my full opening statement be submitted for the record. Without objection. The right to the chase on my uh, uh, first two amendments. I have three. This amendment would require the members of Congress, very similar to uh, Mr. Gingrich's uh, first amendment, require the members of Congress. I, I've held several town hall meetings, as I'm sure all of you have over the last uh, several months, and these amendments address two of the most asked for uh, amendments that, that my constituents wanted. Over 80%, and in one case 90% of them wanted these amendments. First Amendment will require members of Congress to enroll in the public health insurance option through the health insurance exchange. The member spouse and any dependents would no longer be eligible for private health benefit plans. It would be, it would be mandated that they have the same plan that would be extended to our constituents. I would imagine that all of you would be in agreement with that. Uh, the bill, as now states, the members of Congress may apply for those plans. <laughs> Interesting, we have 3,425 shells in the bill. I guess one more shell uh, would not be bad, uh, but we would just ask that the members be asked to take the same kind of insurance as all of the people that we're mandating in the country today. And number two, this amendment requires verification of citizenship for qualified alien status of any individual in order to be eligible to participate in the Medicaid and Medicare programs or obtain coverage through the health insurance exchange established under the Affordable Health Care for America. You know, in California, we're spending probably $4 billion a year. Now, all of that is on health care, much of it is on education for people who are in the country illegally. But this is um, a real problem for my constituents, as I'm sure it is for yours. And then as a uh, ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, um, I joined with the ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee. I think that this, this just had to be uh, something that was overlooked in the, in the pulling of the three bills together, the 1,000-page bill and then the 2,000 pages, because all of us, I know, support our veterans and our servicemen. And, and if you look at these three amendments very closely, you'll see that they just fix, I think, or probably some unintended consequences of TRICARE coverage for the veterans. And I would encourage you to put these amendments in there. Otherwise, the 9.4 million active duty troops, families, and retirees currently eligible for TRICARE comprehensive medical benefits will be uh, cut back. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, um, if you like, I'd be happy to give the seat to somebody else unless somebody has some very <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McCune. Um, I'll, I'll begin by uh, just making a very brief statement of, uh, to Mr. Walden, and that is if your amendments are not made in order, uh, there are some of us that are more than sympathetic, and uh, while it serves perhaps in this forum uh, no particularly useful purpose, I certainly will make the commitment, and I believe others will, uh, that we will try to do this as a uh, standalone uh, at some point. Uh, obviously, all of us recognize that this isn't the end of health care reform. And we will be tweaking this uh, uh, beyond the careers of most of us uh, as time progresses. So you have my commitment that I would be prepared to do that. I have no yeah, questions. Mr. Mr. Dry, you have Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And let me begin by expressing my appreciation to uh, Ms. Blackburn and uh, Mr. Burgess, Walden, Gingry, and uh, my California colleague, Mr. McKeon, for being here and offering what clearly are very thoughtful amendments and uh, as I listened to the, uh, the lengthy statement, especially the one that you provided, uh, Dr. Burgess, um, I'm, again, just struck with the fact that we have this bill before us, and this is the one and only committee that is giving any consideration whatsoever to this measure. And that's why, while you especially, Dr. Burgess, and I, I know that Ms. Blackburn was here part of the time, but I had dinner with her, so I know that she snuck away more than you did. The fact of the matter is, uh, you've been here for a long period of time, and it's unfortunate that you are relegated to this committee only 
for consideration of these measures. And uh, I will say that uh, Mr. Deal had uh, a couple of very thoughtful amendments, uh, one uh, of which is uh, very close to what I had proposed to establish a smart counterfeit proof social security card to deal with the, uh, with the uh, issue of um, security and potentially uh, abuse by people who are in this country illegally. And then flexibility on Medicaid. I uh, spoke yesterday to our governor in California, and he was uh, referring to the need for state flexibility. And that's something that apparently, unfortunately, is lacking in this bill and the mandates, the imposition imposed. And Ms. Blackburn told me over dinner that uh, her Democratic governor, in fact, raised concerns about the mandates that are being imposed by this. So let me just express appreciation to all of you for being very thoughtful, for being very patient. And I'd like to uh, take this moment to uh, introduce two special guests who could have watched this on television. I suspect if they had watched it on television, they wouldn't be here at this moment, but they uh, chose to uh, come up. The, the father and niece of our colleague, uh, Mr. Sessions, Judge William Sessions and Pete's niece, Virginia, are both here, so we should welcome them. Virginia. Hey, Jared. How you doing? Real gluttons for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you all very much for your, for your hard work. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was on the bench along the same time as uh, Judge Sessions, and it's just a pleasure to see him. Uh, I've known him for uh, a number of years. It's, um, I really uh, know that he has the patience to uh, put up with this kind of stuff on television or otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Do any of our other colleagues have uh, any questions of uh, this panel? Mr. Session? I do, and I appreciate that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to ask each of you, and I recognize you're on the Commerce Committee, but uh, this bill also contains within it uh, uh, words that say HR 3962 provides an individual, husband, and wife in the case of a joint return who do not at any time during a taxable year maintain acceptable health insurance coverage for himself or herself and each of his or her qualifying children uh, is subject to an additional tax. If the government determines that the taxpayer's unpaid tax liability from willful behavior following penalties should apply up to $250,000 fine and imprisonment uh, up to five years. Uh, and I'm interested in finding out your feedback of what you think about that. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the lowest cost family non-group plan in this bill would cost around $15,000 in 2016. I I'm very fortunate to have a job, and my wife has a job, but if one of us lost our job, I could very easily see a circumstance where where we would be stretched not to provide health insurance under normal circumstances, perhaps to one of us, as a result of circumstances that we have with the same child at home. I would always understand that we would take care of the same child, but families sacrifice for their children, and families take care of themselves in different ways. And I think it's interesting that we've spoken tonight about how under bankruptcy, we don't want that to happen, but if someone does not any time during the year as disregard for doing this, they go to jail. What do you think about this? Mr. Chairman, I mean, I mean Mr. Sessions, I, I'll be happy to, to He's start. He's chairman of the NRCC, you know. Which, I guess it's wishful thinking yeah. uh, late at night, but it uh, might be wishful thinking all day long for me. But, uh, Mr. Sessions, I thank you for the question. And, and, and of course, I think it's outrageous. Uh, I think it's outrageous to have a, a mandate of American people uh, under the threat of a 2.5% modified adjusted gross income tax to put them further in the hole. And as you point out, 
uh, under under the threat of, of a, a fine of $250,000. And, and, and actually even going to jail uh, for, doing, for not doing something that they could simply not afford uh, because the federal government had mandated. I, uh, I as a physician, uh, I would uh, encourage everybody who could possibly afford it uh, to have coverage, to have health insurance, uh, but it wouldn't mandate. And the only mandate that I'm aware of, other than that, uh, Mr. Sessions, is a mandate that every male age 18 to 26 uh, register for the selective service system. We no longer have a draft, but uh, that's still a mandate. Uh, but there's nothing like this in the, in the history of this country that I'm aware of, and quite honestly, I think it's unconstitutional. Uh, mandates have no place in a free society, and that's been one of my big struggles with this with this bill. As much as I'd like to see more people covered, and you know, this bill is full of unintended consequences. And one of the other perversities is that the richest couple in America, if they have a child, that child is immediately covered under the public option on the taxpayer's dime. Uh, so the middle-income family could go to jail for not having maintaining coverage for the year. But the richest family in the country could have a child for which they did not get coverage, and that child is immediately covered from day one. It's, it's uh, again, we're going to find all, that's the problem with 2,000-page bills. We pass them in a hurry. People then scrutinize them and scrub them and find all kinds of little hidden gems inside that we didn't know about. And that's, that's one of the reasons you saw the fury you saw this summer. It's too big. We don't read it. We won't take the insurance ourselves. Why should the American people take it? Just to add a brief comment about the taxes and the penalties or punishments that are included, Mr. Sessions, as we have talked with women around the country on the issue of health care and how it affects female small business owners, uh, which is an enormous sector of our small business uh, economy, they have brought this point out repeatedly that uh, there is the punishment, there are the increased taxes. Uh, it is a penalty for choosing to be an entrepreneur, for choosing to want to own your own business and hang out your own shingle. And they have raised this very point repeatedly with me. And Mr. Sessions, if I might add, you know, I, I, my wife and I for over 21 years were small business owners, and we provided insurance for the people who worked for us. And I never could... Uh, figure out how, how high to th throw that dart on the board when we were trying to budget for the next year. I know the Republican alternative has come back and shown that we'll actually reduce the cost of premiums, group plans and certainly for individual plans, and expand coverage uh, along the way. It, it's an incremental step, but I think a solid step. And I, I guess I've always approached this, in, including the five years I served on a nonprofit community hospital board in the small town I live in in the state legislature where I worked on a lot of issues relative to expanding access to affordable health care in this great state of Oregon, is that I, I try to do this from the, the positive side, from the incentive side, from the support side, not from the punitive side, not from the kind that will um, kill jobs. And, and for gosh sakes, on a day when we've learned that the nation's facing the highest unemployment in 26 years, uh, it, it troubles me that the, the penalties and the taxes and everything <coughs> else in, in the larger bill um, would, would hurt the economy and, and hurt jobs. And, and there's another way to do it that's, that's positive, effective, deals with the issues of lowering premium costs, deals with the issue of expanding care, deals with the issue of medical liability reform so you don't have these, these junk lawsuits, um, and, and, and is, a, is a good positive step forward. But as you know, I'm here tonight because I, I represent a district that was stretched from the Atlantic to Ohio bigger than any state this side of the Mississippi, and we had bipartisan agreement in the committee to allow for rural representation voices of providers on these committees are going to decide what health care looks like going forward should this bill become law. And, and that's why I think there are, there are areas where we can find common ground. That was one we had, and it, it just it, it is really quite frustrating, frankly, to find out the revision somehow stripped that out. And so uh, I, I appreciate your comments. I I will tell you that one of the sad parts about reading the bill is you can't say it was an unintended consequence. You have to say straight up, I voted for the bill and I should have read it or should have known. And yet I'm just finding out, as perhaps as Dr. Burgess said, I'm just finding out a lot of these things that really 
scare me to death. And I am really concerned, and as you, as this group walks out, we will still be here, but we're going to ask once again, and I will ask on the floor tomorrow, that we simply defeat this legislation and work on it uh, together again. This is scary where we are going to take many, many people at home who don't know the law, and, and just because they don't know the law doesn't mean they won't be found guilty. And to take people and put them in prison for not paying the government fee is horrible. I would yield. I thank my friend for yielding. And uh, I have to say that I, uh, as I sit here and look at Drs. Burgess and Gingrey and then over their shoulder at two great uh, new members here, Dr. Rose, talked repeatedly about the 10 care challenge, which Ms. Blackburn was talking about, and our new colleague, Dr. Fleming. I'm reminded of the nodding of your head, Dr. Burgess, when I had the exchange earlier with Mr. Rangel on this AMA meeting that I think is taking place in uh, Houston uh, at this time. And I, uh, well, I, I uh, you, you didn't hear this, Phil. I got a no. call from a doctor uh, who's a mayor of Rancho Cucamonga, California. Don Kurth is his name. And he uh, made it very clear to me that there is absolute outrage spreading throughout the membership of the American Medical Association. In fact, they're looking to put together a vote of no confidence to the board. And I wondered if, if Dr. Burgess was, didn't, didn't comment at the time, but I wondered if he might comment on that since he's here at the table, and if you want to as well, Phil, certainly. Very kind of you to, to offer the time. The, uh, in fact, I was scheduled to be at the American Medical Association this weekend at the interim meeting in Houston. I was scheduled to speak or to be on a panel with Dr. James Rohack, the president of the AMA, at noon tomorrow. Obviously, we've got stuff going on here, so a quick trip to Houston is likely out of the question. I was trying to set up the, uh, have them set up for a video capability so I could do it remotely, and they finally got back. I can watch you right here, maybe. Yeah, maybe, that, maybe this would be enough. Uh, they got back to me late this afternoon and said, because of all of the efforts they are having to do with crowd control, they will not be able to be able to spare someone to set up the technical features of a, a video conference. So they have some challenges there in Houston today, and challenges <coughs> because of the, uh, the discomfort that the membership has with the decisions that the leadership has made. Well, I, I, I appreciate the feedback. I will tell you this. Thank you for you. It, it cannot be an unintended consequence that if you vote for this bill, you are voting knowing that we're putting people at risk. And these are the kinds of things why we will ask tomorrow for us to defeat this bill, not vote for the rule, defeat the bill, and go back. And every member can have their own reason. <coughs> this is incredible. <coughs> incredible. Five years in prison for a family, a person that who does not at any time during the taxable year maintain acceptable health insurance. And I thought we lived in a free country. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Sessions. Mr. Cardoza. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask him for the question first that I have, and then I'll respond to other things. But um, Mr. McKinn, you mentioned uh, you are mentioned, uh, that we are mandating what coverage individuals get. Now, I grant you there's an exception to this mandate for coverage, and I have a hard time about that myself. Excuse me, what, in, what did I say again? In your testimony, you said that we were mandating that, that we were going to require members of Congress to get the same coverage that we are mandating on individuals. No, what I what I what I what I meant to say is no, I check the record. That's not, uh, that's not the, well, I'm not the bill to say. says that we that members of Congress may okay. apply Where are for the same coverings that we're asking all of our constituents to have. And I, and my amendment would say That's the point. We're not asking our constituents to have a particular kind of insurance. We're telling them they have to have insurance, but not particular time. Or jail. That was the first time. No, no, I'm sorry. No. I, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you that I have some concerns about the, the 
family. Uh, oh, and, yes. and I've had those concerns. I've, I've indicated those. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can get past that because I think that is um, a But I will also tell you that I don't think the mandate is to recover from this bill. The reason I raise it is because I don't accept the public insurance or the city insurance that we get as members of Congress. My family and I use my wife's home. And so um, uh, I just want to make that perfectly clear. And uh, I don't think that we're uh, doing this in the bill. And I will also tell you that I haven't decided how I'm going to vote on the bill. Made that very clear. Uh, I, have some, I have a number of issues that I have to work through in order. Uh, and one of them I'm going to get to in just a minute. But I wanted to just share with you. The one that, that, um, that no, I'm going to. Well, uh, I'll determine what's enough uh, on how I vote. And you can do the same for yourself. But um, I just wanted to respond to you. And since you have to leave, and I know we're going to do that, I just wanted to. I didn't want to talk about you after you left, so thank you for I think that, the opportunity. You know, um, I'm, I'm sorry to have to admit I haven't read every word in those 2,000 pages. Um, but I did go through the first bill, H.R. 3300. I was ranked member on the that was part of the administration, but it wasn't under jurisdiction, or was a part of the Concept. I think we're, I hope we're in agreement with, and I hope at the end of the day it will be included in the bill that we do not provide insurance at government expense for people who are in the country illegally. I think we're talking about different amendments. But I Let me go back to the other one. That we will require that members of Congress have the same insurance that others get. Now, I went to Guantanamo. One of the Democrats, uh, after we saw the treatment, the medical treatment that all of the detainees got, he said the next town hall meeting I go to, when the, when the constituents say, I want the same coverage you get, he said, I'm going to tell them they can have it. I want the same coverage that the detainees get. <laughs> because they have probably two or three medical practitioners. I've been there, I've seen the facility. Yeah, you're not yeah. far from wrong. You agree? Yes, I do. Thank you. We're, we're done. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Walden, with regard to your amendment. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I, I strongly agree with your sentence. Thank you. Uh, I have discussed this issue that, as Mr. Hastings mentioned, you know, that mm -hmm. there's your views in the neighborhood. Um, I've, I've spoken at length today with Secretary Stilius and the White House about the concerns. Thank you. And I'm going to work on it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it will be made in order tonight or not, but I am definitely. Appreciate that. It. It's one of those things that is on my mind as we move forward. And so uh, I pledge to you, sir, this is something that I take very seriously. Thank you. In a way of my final decisions on how we proceed, either whether I decide to support the bill or, or uh, in confidence for how we proceed. Uh, this is something that's incredibly important. Thank you. I, I, if I might respond, I appreciate. I applaud your efforts. Well, and I, I appreciate your support on this, and and, and again, it's one of these that uh, seemed to be without objection when it was considered originally. So maybe it was just a drafting error. Uh, I have a question, and one of the yes, things that gives me a little pause when I have to check with others is how we determine what, who is in a rural area. Does that mean you practice in a rural area? Oh. I, I have not reviewed in detail every aspect of your amendment. We get summaries uh, because there's so many amendments. I haven't, I haven't read yours in, in great detail. But that, I, I want to make sure that as we move forward, all the definitions and this kind of language as the uh, other committees have, have, have reminded. So that's one of the things you can take pause. That's one of the reasons. I mean, uh, Mr. Cardoza, if I, if I might respond, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, rural is actually the definition used by the Census Bureau. No, no, I know. And then, Does that mean you live in it? Do you work in it? Yep. Did you pass through it once? No, no, no. You know, we're how, not going to allow that to happen. <laughs> it says not less than 25% of the members of such committee shall be practicing health care practitioners who, as of the date of their appointment, 
practice in a rural area and who have practiced in a rural area for at least five years preceding such date. So well, we attempted to get it. Here's why, I mean, in my hometown, we used to have a doctor that would come in and practice once a week on one issue, and then he'd go back to San Francisco. And, and in fact, we have a lot of doctors like that in my area who aren't really rural doctors. So I have problems about construct. Um, I mean, we had an allergist that would come into town sure. once a month. And, and yeah, I'm getting close to Mr. Kagan's territory here. He's, he's, he's gesturing behind you. But I, I mean, those kinds of things, I, I'm in total support of I'd what you're happy talking to about. Work with you. But I, I, we got to make sure it's tight as we need it to be. Okay, so that's one of the concerns, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a little hesitant to just accept um, what you've offered tonight. But I think you're absolutely dead on with the concept that I'm concerned about. Well, and, and I've made inquiries on, on behalf of your amendment today already. And, and I appreciate that, and uh, I, I would be more than happy to work with you and the committee. I, I would. Uh, I would say that in the construct of the committee itself, the appointees, uh, under uh, H.R. 3962, uh, here's, what, who's, here's who's listed now for the, uh, the Committee on the Health Benefits Advisory Committee. Providers, patient representatives, employers, labor, health insurance issuers, experts in health care financing, experts in health care delivery, experts in oral health care, experts in racial disparities, experts in ethnic disparities, experts on health care needs and disparities of individuals with disabilities, representatives of relevant government agencies, at least one practicing physician or other uh, health professional, and an expert in child and adolescent health. Obviously, there's some flex room among those where adding rural proportional uh, representation shouldn't be. Very important concept that needs to be included in that thing. And, and as you know, sir, um, on, on MedPAC, that's really the uh, other issue that's so important because that's the committee that evaluates the cost of providing care. And if you only have one or two, they, they've, they've actually had meetings where they have, have had to suspend their uh, discussion because they didn't feel like they had enough rural voice there on an the issue they were trying to address. Right. It's one of those issues that those of us who come from rural communities deal with in, in so Every many day. areas of government. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's, just, it's one of those important things, and I'm glad you raised it. Thank you. It's one of those things we've got to deal with. I don't know if we'll deal with it tonight or next week or next month, but it's got to be dealt with. And, I, and, I and it's one of those things that's sort of like a few weeks ago when uh, the, the dreaded cap and trade bill was going through with some of us on the uh, agriculture committee that said the EPA wasn't going to go on the farms and we tell farmers right. not to do business. And that was sort of a line in the sand with us. And I think this is an issue that you've raised that is very important well, I want to that tonight. Um, on the last issue, uh, Mr. Henry, you've raised the question of tort reform. Um, and I've sat here all night as a supporter of tort reform. I was one of the ones in the legislature in California who supported it and kept it at the current cap. And I fought and laid my body on the line on a number of cases. I almost got thrown off as chairman of my committee because the speaker wanted to remove me because he was so mad that I was supporting this particular issue. So I've been down this road. Um, and uh, um, I was the only Democrat, actually Mr. Hall and I were Democrats at the time. Mr. Hall then became one of yours. Uh, but there were only two of us that went to the White House with Mr. Bush and talked about a court reform and this is good and that's not practice. So I have a long record of voting on the floor of this house and in California on the court. And I agree that there are concerns about costs. But I will tell you, based on the numbers that I have seen in California, where we have one of the toughest medical malpractice laws in the country, mm -hmm. that based on the CEO estimates and stuff, I don't know that our cost estimates are right. And I will tell you, I'm not a strong supporter of it, but I'm not sure it's the pay for that can pay for an entire bill. And um, the testimony I heard and I'm not in any way diminishing that we should do it, because I think we should do it. I think the President was right when he came to the floor of Congress and talked about it as one of the many things that we need to do. I've talked about it in Blue Dog meetings. I've talked about it in a number of areas. And I, I think it was just a topic. Gentlemen, you? Let me just finish off. Oh, okay. I just want to ask a question about that. But, but I think that there are some concerns. I just share with you in an honest, honorable way that I don't think these numbers are quite in fact, I thank my friend for yielding, and I just was going to, I was just going to ask, <clears throat> I mean, I know that the level, the, the number was $54 billion that we had from CBO 
on the California number, and I just I, mean, I, I just, heard five. Um, Fifty-four is the number that I saw from the CBO on that. On California. Yeah, okay. if we took if we took the California model and utilized that at the federal level, the savings number would be fifty-four billion dollars. Um, was what I saw it, from the CBO. I, 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 that's not because. I don't think that's the kind of dollars we're saving in California. My wife is a practitioner, you know. I just meant if it were national. I know. Were national. You know, I mean, for example, my wife pays pretty much the same, a little bit more, but pretty much the same medical malpractice fees as for, in Maryland she did in California where they don't have the same plan. So, um, you know, I just don't, I, I think that these things need to be careful how the rhetoric and so my last point is on the rhetoric. Uh, we should not scare people. And Mr. Uh, Sessions and I, I'm sorry he's not still here, but Mr. Sessions is talking about scary talk. And, and some of the things, you know, are a concern. But I'll tell you what's really scary. And I, I told you I'm undecided on this bill, but I will tell you what's really scary. Scary is when you have like 28% or 26% of my no health care insurance at all in your baby sick. That's scary. That's real life scary. Scary is when you're a small business owner like we were, and we were having difficulties. We saw we were in a declining market and our clothes in the military base in my hometown, and we couldn't sell our business or get out of business because my brother had severe pre existing conditions and couldn't get any other insurance in the other thing. Those kinds of issues are real life, and record scary should not be the thing that decides. Now, I will tell you that I think we have a lot of things that we have to do to make this the, the health care bill for America. But I really get offended when we ratchet this up and don't understand how scary today is. Today is very scary. So almost 20, almost a quarter of my constituents, it is real life scary. Right now, tonight, if they're babysick, they can't get coverage, they don't have a doctor, they don't have a baby. And so, I was here as an intern 30 years ago, and my job, and it just so happens that 30 years ago today, or this, this month, this summer, uh, I watched Senator Kennedy cover for all America. And we're still talking and using the same rhetoric that we were using 30 years ago, and nothing's improved. And I'll tell you, scary to me is also not good. Cool. And so I get we all have to do it right. I get that we have ideological opinions. I get there's tea baggers and union folks and everybody else in the world marching on our windows and our doors at home and in our offices. But let me tell you, we got to do something, and we do have to do it right. Mr. Chairman, may I respond briefly since uh, Mr. Cardoso? Very briefly, if you would, Dr. Very, very briefly. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Cardoso, as you know, two of my seven amendments pertain uh, to the issue of uh, medical liability reform. And, and you said, of course, you weren't sure about the numbers. And uh, I think the $54 billion over 10 that CBO says uh, that this would save is a, is a very low number. I mean, the numbers that I've heard from the Rand Corporation and others is a much higher number. And you said even even if the higher numbers were accurate, uh, that this wouldn't adequately be an adequate table. It certainly wouldn't in HR 3962 uh, with a cost of one trillion fifty five million dollars. Uh, but it, in the Republican uh, alternative, it would be a significant pay for in that our bill doesn't cost anywhere near that, uh, and, it, and it lowers the cost of health insurance by ten percent across the board. Oh. The gentleman yield very briefly. I, I, I thank my friend for I'd just like to say that there has been a lot of distress this evening, but for me the most distressing thing is the fact that you were an intern as I prepared to begin my first year of service. <laughs> thank you for yielding. Doc, yeah, you're back. Be, be, before Dr. Fox and Mr. Polis, uh, this, this committee is um, one of the few uh, committees that doesn't have time constraints, and I'm not urging that. But I would beg our colleagues, both um, uh, members on the Rules Committee and those uh, uh, that are waiting to um, uh, testify, 
uh, to take into consideration uh, that we are reaching that profile period that we hear so often as members, and that is everything that needs to be said has been said, said but you just haven't said it yet. Uh, so I would ask you to please um, uh, consider time constraints. There's a long road ahead of us here this evening. Mr. Chairman, uh, I mean, we are exploring a lot of new territory, and virtually every member took 20 to 25 minutes with opening statements up here. And I think that there are a lot of very creative proposals before us. I agree. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. I agree with that. Uh, and you can talk about creative things um, and be uh, succinct as well. Uh, Dr. Fox? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want uh, Mr. Ian to uh, speak to a little more about the impact of the Supreme Court Veterans uh, being asked to um, to object to this bill because of what it will do to veterans, and I'm wondering if uh, if you'd mind saying again what yours and Mr. Booyer's amendments would do, and why you're doing it in terms of um, what the bill does to veterans. Yeah. Uh, just, just got the bill a few days ago. <laughs> I'm to go through my age potential sometime every time I'm going to sit. I really am afraid or hopeful that that's what this is going to be. But um, on the, for instance, the Second Amendment, as currently written, would provide the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of Veterans Affairs to retain the sole authority over the respective health care systems only with respect to subtitle A. Now, in, in the uh, markup in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, the Booyer Amendment was accepted, but then when in, in putting the three bills together, it was overlooked in, in uh, some of the subtitles. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at here. And the unintended consequences would, would result in a cutback of benefits for the 9.4 million um, members of the Armed Services and veterans and families who are now on Friday. So I'm just hoping that you'll really, really look at that. I think it's something that would not even be controversial. But we have a pattern here tonight of amendments being accepted in committee and then suddenly disappearing when the bill uh, comes forth to be considered and to be voted on. So I, Mr. McKeon, I think you're very generous in saying you I think it was overlooked, but it seems to me that there's a, a pattern here of Republican amendments having been left out after Democrats and Republicans accepted them. And I think Mr. Cardoza's comments uh, indicate that uh, lots of us, particularly I'm very concerned about the rural aspect. Uh, many of us represent rural areas. And if you want to talk about discrimination, as far as I'm concerned, uh, rural areas are one of the largest discriminated areas in our country. Uh, I don't think that adequate attention is paid uh, to the challenges that people face there. So I, I wanted you to clarify that again, and, and especially the part about it having been passed in the committee and then being left out. Well, I'll, and I'll try and keep my comments brief, Mr. Chairman. Um, but that is the frustration in the policy committee that dealt with that particular section of the bill, the Energy and Commerce Committee, we had a, I think, a pretty thorough debate about the issue, and there was no objection to just making sure that rural uh, voices of practitioners, health care providers, who actually practice in those areas, had a seat at the table in two areas. One, in MedPAC, which provides all the recommendations to Congress on reimbursement rates for Medicare for every procedure. And now rural areas are completely underrepresented. And the second is this new commission created by then H.R. 3200, now this new bill that has just come out and not been before the Energy and Commerce Committee, the compilation of the various committees work, but it's a whole new bill. Uh, in the commission there that will determine what everybody's health care policies look like going forward, there is a long list of people to serve on that commission or entities to serve on that commission, and yet 
the room got stripped off. And I, right. Now, that all happened behind closed doors somewhere around here. It didn't happen in the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, it, it didn't happen here in the Rules Committee. It happened in no committee, but it happened. And, and it shouldn't have happened. And I think that's why people are so frustrated, why many of us in the Republican side are so frustrated, that when we do have an amendment that is bipartisan, even it doesn't withstand uh, the, the scalpel. And that's just bad medicine for this process in this country, and especially the rural areas of this country. I, I'll M stop. Mr. Chairman, I'll just make one other brief comment. Since being here in the last five years, I have worked uh, hard at trying to deal with people at CMS, uh, and getting things changed that make a lot of sense, that people there say make a lot of sense. But getting those bureaucrats to respond is almost impossible. And I, I know one of my first experiences here was such a shocker. In a committee meeting, the uh, chairman of the committee said to a bureaucrat sitting right in front of him, you know, two and a half years ago I asked you for this information and we still don't have it. And I, I saw... I was on several committees that had that experience. Uh, we really don't have any way to make bureaucrats respond, uh, either to us or to our constituents. And it's maddening, which is one of the things that frustrates me so much about turning over so much authority to these non-elected people who are appointed and then have no interest in responding to the people we serve and are not being able to get them to well, do that. And, and Dr. Fox, on, on, the, uh, on the rural health care piece, uh, Congressman Pomeroy is a Democrat from North Dakota, and I co-chaired the rural health care coalition for four or five years. This was one of our issues, was to get proportional representation on MedPAC. Um, and that's why it, it, it is so disappointing and strange that, that that provision, once adopted by the Committee of Jurisdiction, is then stripped out in the bill going forward. I just don't understand. Yeah. What, I don't see this is. as a partisan issue at all. I don't all. either. And that's, it, it's a policy issue. I, I mean, I, I won some, a national award from the Home Health Care Association for the work I did to try and make sure that rural areas were served with home health care. And, and, and yet, I believe one of the funding cuts in this bill is to home health care. And, and I got to tell you, I, all my, my parents are gone. Um, they died. My, my, in -law, my, my wife's parents are gone. They were all beneficiaries of home health care. And I have been out to homes in very rural parts of my district where very sick people are able to stay in their home, not in a hospital, not in a nursing home, both of which are more expensive, get that home health care. That's the sort of care I think Americans in rural areas are going to lose if, if we don't have the right representation on these committees. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, yes. Uh, Gentlemen, yield. Sure. Uh, I know about mandatory car insurance, but you're not mandated to take out collision. You're only mandated to take out liability. Isn't that correct? Because of the damage. It, it, my guess is it depends from state to state. Do you but know you're any? Right, you're right. You're right. Do you know but any? It's still mandatory insurance, so but, it isn't like it's a new concept. But that's because of the damage you might do to somebody else. 
Uh, we're even mandated to have uh, out-of-state coverage, so in case somebody, or uninsured motorist coverage, well, in case yeah, somebody... I, I would take my time back, and I appreciate my friends. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, we're all paying for people to go to the emergency room who don't have insurance. That's the bottom line here. So we're paying it in our insurance as we see premiums increase and deductibles increase, and we see it in the cost of care that's provided by the emergency rooms, which is the most expensive type of care. With that, Madam Chair, I'll go back. Mr. Perlmutter? Yes. Would you... Uh, I, I, I was listening to Mr. Cardozo and he made some really great comments about a lot of his constituents that can't afford insurance and they're scared to death. Now we can up on the jail if they don't get it. I think we're going to be a little more money. Well, I'm taking my tie back then. In the bill, first of all, there are so, all sorts of um, sliding scale as to who pays uh, for the insurance goes from twenty thousand up to eighty eight thousand there are credits that are available there's a hardship uh, section in here there are exemptions in here with respect to the tax code so this is something designed to provide those people with the ability to have insurance so that they can get a doctor so that they can have primary care so I, I appreciate both your comment and Mr. Cardosa's that there are a lot of people out there that are hurt. And then to add on top of that, that they have no insurance and their only place, their only recourse is to the emergency room, which is what costs everybody else so much money. And that's the purpose, one of the key purposes of this bill, as I understand it. So I appreciate what the two of you, you know, the, the, your comments, but I think that's what we're trying to address. Gentlemen, you my friend from Texas, yes. Bottom line is, the law is there. If for, if for a reason that you willfully make the decision that you are not at any point, at any time during the taxable year, maintaining acceptable health coverage for himself or herself and each of his or her qualifying children is subject to an additional tax. If you choose not to read for reclaiming my time, and if you, you are... You are can't get away from the law. No, but the law is that if you willfully fail to file your tax return or you lie or cheat on your tax return, that's when it's a that's when it is a jail penalty. It is for fraud, it's, not failure. It, it, it's, it's the same thing. If I choose, now let me tell you what. If I choose not to because I can't afford it to take out the insurance, and then when it comes time. I'm going to have to pay that tax, and I do nothing. I, I'm guilty. That's true. I'm guilty. And because right, you and I will end up debating that. Well, that is that a willful fraud. If I don't pay them the 2% for the same reason that I didn't go get the insurance, because I don't have any money left. As I said, if you take a look at it, there's a hardship exemption. There's all sorts of exemptions. And it's what do you want to know about the hardship exemption? Well, then they committed fraud. And that's exactly correct. And it should not be in this bill. You can do what you want to, but don't put them in prison. Right. They commit fraud on their taxes. Don't put them in prison. Well, you and I are reading that very differently. No, we don't have to read it differently. I don't Come on, gentlemen. Enough already. Mr. Pearl Muta, will you yield to me just a brief comment on that? I, I, you know, because I, I discussed that a little earlier, but. You know, you make the comparison between uh, mandatory automobile insurance and uh, this mandatory uh, health insurance to individuals. And the difference is, on automobile insurance, an individual does have an opt-out. They don't have to drive a car. They, they, they absolutely uh, can take another mode of transportation. And the other thing is, in automobile insurance, there is no community rating. Uh, the young 19-year-old uh, driving a Mustang is going to pay a lot more than the 52-year-old woman uh, driving a, a car. Uh, so there is a huge difference. There is nothing to compare to this mandate that's in this bill on individuals requiring them, I think unconstitutionally, to, to have health insurance. And I appreciate your comments. I'd ask my friend from Texas, where, where in... 3962 is the state of five years. It is uh, section 7203, section 7201. Yeah, I understand. Is that microphone's off? Are we here? Uh, 
Madam Chair, I'll yield back to you, look at the sections that he's referring to, and then he and I can get into an argument later on. I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Madam Chairman, part of these hearings are about people to be able to understand more and to communicate about the bill. And I uh, really appreciate and respect the gentleman for asking questions and talking with me. This was done under their hearings. It's being done at town hall meetings. This thing is taking a long time. Others stayed up till three and four in the morning. This is part six. It's part of the process. And I appreciate your second gentleman, respect gentlemen. I don't think this was an unnecessary or a bad thing that we talked like this. Mr. Sessions, uh, that's very nice. I think we've been very generous here with time. We've been here since yesterday. Uh, and uh, our job is not to oh, go over the bill section by section, piece by piece. Madam but to Chairman, get it ready Madam for Chairman, the floor. with all due respect, if I may, um, no committee in the Congress, no committee in the Congress has had an opportunity to look at this bill. This is the one and only opportunity. What? For any member to look at this bill. It's been on and the we, internet for days, maybe weeks. I don't know. Uh, but, it madam, has. the internet is, is not. Isn't a that committee. what everybody wanted? The internet is not a. I think that what you promised us was regular order. And to have this measure that was introduced one week ago, 1,990 pages, and now a manager's amendment, which continues to be a work in progress, which is not. Apparently, if we do, in fact, have this vote tomorrow, going to have the three-day layover that the American people have determined they wanted based on action taken in this committee last June. And it seems to me that this is the responsibility of this committee now because no other committee is doing it. And that's Mr. why Fryer, we're here. this has never been the responsibility of this committee, will never be the responsibility of this committee. Because we've gone through regular order. But we are going through a great deal of sufferance here to try to get this moved. Uh, and we've Madam got Chair, Mr. Hastings. Like make the observation um, uh, that the distinctions that exist between 3200 uh, and 3962 and the manager's amendment are de minimis. And for one to argue that all of us, particularly those of us in Congress, are not mindful is counterintuitive in the sense that we are here talking about measures and they're bringing them up. And therefore, I, I, I find it incredible um, uh, that uh, one would argue that substantive matters, the only opportunity you have to have that hearing is in the Rules Committee. No. Uh, I've been here a little while now, and I don't recall us having uh, all of this original jurisdiction. I've seen manager's amendment at 4 o'clock in the morning for the first time. So I, 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 I dare to say uh, uh, that, and, and 6 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and 8 o'clock in the, the morning. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, I will oh, not yield. Come on, gentlemen. Chair, may I be can we please get on? I, some Madam of the Chair, witnesses would like to speak. Uh, Madam, Madam, uh, okay. Mr. McCurran's had his hand up there for some time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with all, all due respect, um, I guess friend before Mr. Hastings, uh, as I said, I was right when we marked up 3,200 in committee. We started at 10 in the morning. We went all night till 6 the following morning with a couple of breaks for votes. But it was 1,017 pages when it was given to us the day before the markup. When we got into the markup, it was 1,040 pages. It was a new bill because the manager's now. That's Half the size of this. That's de minimis. So, so no, no of the committees of jurisdiction have actually looked at this bill. It was taken, it was passed on our committee, it was passed out of the Committee of Commerce, and it was passed out of Ways and Means HR 3200. Then a few people went behind closed doors, and this is what came out. It went from 1,040 pages that went through our markup. And, and unless this is all just filler in the other thousand pages, it's Mr. not. Mr. McCune, it's a huge difference. Mr. McCune, you yeah. said yeah. earlier, yeah. you you said earlier that you didn't read the two thousand pages. Now you've I had. Said, I said, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. What I said was, I, I'm sorry, I have not read all of 3962. Right. I did say that I went through 3200 very thoroughly. 
Because yes, we weren't no, no. That's what I'm talking about is what we are here about tonight, 3962. And I'll make the argument, and I will later point out that it is de minimis. There has been an evolution here. And what happens in legislation, this is a unique. Everybody is trying to present this as some kind of process that just started. This is this particular measure. I've been here when others were either similar or worse in terms of the process. My point to you and my point to the members is uh, that in this measure, 3962, the changes that are there from 3200 are such that almost everybody in here has had an opportunity to know something about it, and I'll prove it later. The chair wants me to move on, and rightly so. But I have the information concerning the distinctions between 3200 and 3962, and I will prove to you that they are de minimis. Well, they spent 1,000 pages not saying much. Well, you spent 47 pages in your We're substitute and didn't say anything. Ms. Pingree, Ms. Pingree, please. Do you have any questions? No, but, uh, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just have two uh, brief questions, uh, one for Mr. McKeon, one for Ms. Blackburn. Um, we'll start with Ms. Blackburn. Um, with regard to your amendment uh, prohibiting the unfunded mandate, um, I, I, one of the elements of the Republican plan uh, is that the establishment of the high-risk pool requires states to spend dollars on high-risk pools, and it actually keeps states on the hook for permanently funding these pools after the federal assistance ends. Uh, and the, uh, the Democratic, the Dingle bill, uh, establishes the high-risk plan uh, in the interim, of course, ultimately replaced with the bar on pre-existing conditions. So in this instance, would you agree that the unfunded mandate, which is a subject of your amendment, uh, exists in the Republican substitute amendment, uh, but not uh, in the Democratic? Dingle bill with regard to the uh, high risk pool. Ms. Black, would you please get um, into the microphone? We're getting. Thank you, Ms. Fox. I, I forgot. That people yeah. can't hear and they want the benefit of this being. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. And Madam Chairman, if the gentleman will permit me to speak to him with my back. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't. Right. That's, that's fine. That's fine. I, I feel so awkward in doing that. Uh, but I, as we talked about uh, the 10 care plan and my amendment that would address the unfunded federal mandates, one of the problems I think we have is the fact that Washington pushes these mandates down to the states and then say, says, fund them. Now, I'm one of those individuals that would prefer to see none of the federal mandates pushed down to the states. And then they have to find a way to fund it. And I appreciate the gentleman's point on this because there are ways that you say address this pool, get to the universal access via the Republican plan with using the reinsurance and using um, the high risk pools. And this is something that there was a great deal of discussion on. I do, I think that that is the perfect solution. Uh, having any of the unfunded mandates, I'm just one of those that would prefer to uh, not walk that path. And uh, I know that in our Republican bill, that is a way that they funded it. But I think also in answering uh, the question, we have to look at the impact that this has on our budgets. We know that the five-year number for our state on uh, implementing this bill would be $1.4 billion. We know that the 10-year number adds another $2.4 billion. And that is just the initial estimate. That is the initial estimate. And when you're looking at that type impact on our states and how incredibly difficult it is going to be for states that have balanced budget amendments to meet that very high hurdle. It causes, it does cause me concern. Thank you. Uh, and again, I appreciate your efforts. Uh, the unfunded mandate issue is clearly not a Democratic or Republican issue. I think the prior administrations from both sides uh, have been guilty. And I, I did want to point out that the Republican substitute does have an, an unfunded mandate in it. My next question is for Mr. McKean. It actually started out for uh, Mr. Deal, who left, but it's of the uh, it's with regards to an amendment that has the same operative element in Mr. McKean's amendment uh, as Mr. Deal's amendment, uh, namely 
uh, a prohibition with regard to our undocumented population uh, from purchasing uh, insurance with our own money uh, through the exchange. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know whether uh, Mr. McKean was here or not when I had an uh, interchange with uh, Mr. Pallone of New Jersey, uh, but the question I have um, with regard to this proposal and this amendment, uh, the second part of the amendment, Mr. McKean, not regarding the Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, those are, those are benefits. My question is regarding coverage through the health insurance exchange. Um, if we prohibit undocumented immigrants from buying unsubsidized insurance with their own money uh, through the exchange, uh, it would increase the cost of the bill uh, by tens of billions of dollars because we uh, effectively, the cost would be shifted onto others and these would be uninsured taxpayer subsidized uh, care. Uh, and my question is how would you plan to pay for covering all these illegal immigrants that you would prohibit uh, from covering themselves would you do it with additional deficit spending, would, uh, or would you propose a new tax that we would use to subsidize the illegal immigrants under your proposal? I, I'd, uh, based on the parts to you, I'd send them home. Okay, uh, and if I can address that. The tax yeah. Should be asked yeah. Yeah, I think you, you and I agree, and I made this clear again when I was asking the question to Mr. Pallone, there are many of us who agree we should not have a large undocumented population. I think you and I would both hope that in three years there would be zero undocumented people. Uh, now, we might have different ways of getting there, and we do, uh, but, but neither of us want to have this large undocumented population. I hope that Congress, as a body, succeeds in passing comprehensive immigration reform in a bipartisan way. Uh, and we move on a route to having zero undocumented population by the time the operative clause of the exchange even goes into effect, and then this problem will be hypothetical. Uh, however, the CBO-based assumption, and when we're planning public policy, we're assuming the baseline, we're assuming that we can't fix immigration, that we're going to have, I don't know, three years, five years from now, 15 million undocumented, and the question is, under your proposal preventing them from buying their own health care, how do you propose to pay for putting them, uh, the unreimbursed care, showing up at emergency rooms, would you, do you propose a new tax or do you propose additional deficit spending? Also, I would have gave you my answer. Sorry? I would have gave you my answer. I do not well, accept yeah. the premise that we can't fix the immigration problem, and I think that we could find the people in the country and I do think we could follow the law, send them home. And I think it's a national security issue. Yeah. If we can do, if we can come here tonight and pass this uh, 2008 bill to totally change the whole way we do 16% of our, or 18% of our national economy, like from the ground up, ripping out health care and changing it completely, why can't we solve the immigration problem and why do we have to put up with having billions of dollars of expense out of taxpayers' pockets every year for education, for health care, especially when we're in such tremendous um, financial problems as we are. And then we see today, again, we lose another 190,000 jobs. For now it's 10.2% uh, uh, of uh, unemployment. I, I just think that we, we, we can't bury our head in the sands without fixing the issue. I, I, I certainly agree with you. This bill is not an immigration bill. Uh, it is a health care bill. I agree with you. I, I share your optimism that Congress can pass comprehensive immigration reform next year, and I, I uh, encourage you and your colleagues to join me in supporting it uh, next year, and I yield back. Ms. Blackburn and gentlemen, we thank uh, you very I, much for your testimony. Uh, I but we, I, I just want to make a clarification here. Um, there was a claim that uh, the veterans' amendments were removed after the markup, and that's not so. I remember the markup, but this is something... The legislation does permit veterans to enter the exchange. An amendment was, uh, was adopted by Energy and Commerce Committee and said that nothing in a particular section would affect DOD VA coverage. H.R. 3962 broadened this to the whole subtitle further than Representative Boyer really went to, wanted to go originally and has been more helpful to the vets. So this was, this is, you know, none of this None of the veterans' amendments were removed after markup. We would not do that. If there's, what has happened was is that he talked about the section. So then there's no section, so broaden this to the subtitle. That's what happened. I am correct. Madam Chairman, 
Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. I just think that before this panel leaves, uh, with the exchange that we had with Mr. Hastings, that this would be a propitious time to remind our colleagues of uh, a document that was entitled A New Direction for America, which was uh, provided by uh, then Minority Leader Pelosi when the uh, campaign was going on to uh, win the majority. And I'd just like to share a couple of paragraphs which I think are very apropos to the experience we've had that began at 2 o'clock this afternoon. This is uh, a Congress working for all Americans, and uh, some of you may remember the, uh, the document itself looked like this, a New Direction for America. It reads as follows, Madam Chair. It said, bills should be developed following full hearings and open subcommittee and committee markups with appropriate referrals to other committees. Members should have at least 24 hours to examine a bill prior to consideration at the subcommittee level. Bills should generally come to the floor under a procedure that allows open, full, and fair debate consisting of a full amendment process that grants the minority the rights to offer its alternatives, including a substitute. Members should have at least 24 hours to examine a bill and conference report text prior to floor consideration. Rules governing floor debate must be reported before 10 p.m for a bill to be considered the following day. That was a new direction for America. It's now 10-11, according to my watch here. And I think that as we hear about how horrible things were, and I will say that when I sat in uh, Mrs. Slaughter's chair for uh, eight years, that I didn't do things perfectly. But we were promised something different than what we've gotten. And we've never seen anything like this, which completely subverts the commitment that was made by Speaker Pelosi when she was seeking to become Speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Ms. Blackburn, thank you very much. And I don't call uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. You've been here since the day before yesterday. <laughs> we have me to call you up, Ms. Berkeley, Mr. Brady, Dr. Rowe, and Dr. Kagan, please. Mr. Johnson, you've had no sustenance at all, am I right? You've had no dinner. Did you have a little? You snuck okay. out. We didn't notice it there, Mr. Johnson, eh? Yeah, well, they noticed it when we sneak out. Okay. Mr. Polis, would you want to take that outside? Madam Chair, may I just say that I'm sorry I failed to recognize Dr. Kagan when I was talking about all the other doctors. He was hiding behind Mr. McKeon there, so I should have mentioned Dr. Kagan. It was his Dr. fault. Fleming, <laughs> Dr. Rowe and Dr. Gingry and Dr. Burgess. Thank you very much, Mr. Dreyer. Um, let's begin with Mr. Brady. Yes, Ms. Bob. Yes, I need to remind all of you, please, to pull the microphones up closer because the people who are watching uh, on C-SPAN have trouble understanding you. So, Mr. Brady? Great. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairwoman Slaughter, Ranking Member Dreyer, distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I've introduced 10 amendments to this legislation. With your permission, I'll testify mm. on one of them tonight. All right. Um, the 10 amendments, just so you know, are designed to protect seniors from health care rationing, to make sure cancer patients don't get stuck with substandard care in the government-run uh, public plan, and to provide the public with information about wait times in the government-run health insurance exchange. Another amendment would freeze new taxes under the bill for states with very high unemployment rates. That amendment also requires the government to certify that tax increases contained in this bill won't hurt small business jobs or cause existing jobs to be outsourced overseas. Obviously, with the 10.2 percent unemployment rate, it's important this bill not cost job losses. The amendment I would like to testify on today would block cuts to the Medicare program contained in this bill unless the Secretary of Health and Human Services certifies that implementation of the cuts would not result in rationing of health care, would not result in reduced health care services for our seniors would not result in longer patient wait times for the elderly or the reduced availability of health care providers participating in the Medicare program. This amendment is so important because the uh, bill, Democrat bill today, contains more than half a trillion dollars in cuts to our seniors. These half a trillion dollars of cuts 
uh, would affect our hospitals, our skilled nursing facilities. It would slash money to hospice cares, which seniors used in the last few days of their life. Uh, cuts to clinical laboratories and durable medical equipment. It affects nearly every senior in a serious way. This amendment would ensure that we don't sacrifice our seniors' health care uh, to create a new unsustainable entitlement program. Before we make any of these half a trillion dollars of cuts to Medicare outlined in this bill, cuts that will certainly be felt by our seniors, my amendment would simply require that the HHS certify we're not rationing uh, our seniors' care. Seniors are, I will tell you, over August, September, uh, I held uh, 53 town hall meetings, health care roundtables. Seniors are scared. Uh, seniors know that uh, when the government cuts reimbursements to doctors, there are fewer doctors to see them. When they cut reimbursements to hospitals, there are fewer hospitals, especially in rural areas. They know when you cut home health care, the visits stop. And they know in, intuitively that when the money runs out, senior care gets rationed and they are damaged. So I think earlier tonight, a number of members said that this bill will not ration hair, uh, um, cuts to our seniors, would not uh, cut uh, Medicare Advantage plans, would not force seniors out of that plan. I know in Texas, uh, 660,000 seniors will likely be forced out of their plan. This makes sure that health care is not rationed to the elderly, the most vulnerable, the most scared among our population. I know this is something that will have bipartisan support, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Ms. Berkeley? I thank you very much, Madam mm -hmm. Chairman. And I must say, at the risk of sounding as if I'm pandering, I have newfound respect for my colleagues that serve on the Rules Committee um, after listening for so many hours. And uh, Dr. Fox, I will agree with you. I, too, have tried to work with CMS, and it's like banging your head against the wall. Um, Madam Chairman, I would like to flash back 13 years. I was sitting in my kitchen, and I got a telephone call. It was from a gentleman that I knew very well, telling me he was very concerned that I was living my life alone. And he asked me if I wanted to go out with a Jewish doctor. Uh, my DNA dictated that I, of course, well, of course. would accept that. <laughs> so um, I was fixed up with a Jewish doctor, and the next day he asked me out, and we started dating. Eight weeks after we started dating, and I was running for Congress at the time, he invited me to come to his office to see his office. Mm -hmm. I felt like going like I felt like getting a toothache, but I went because he is a Jewish doctor. So I walked into the reception room. He was waiting for me. I complimented the fact that the drapes matched the carpet, and then we went into the nurse's station, and I complimented that, and the billing room, and I complimented that and the, um, uh, the examination rooms, and I complimented that. And I was trying to figure out a way of extricating myself from this very awkward position that I found myself in. So I said that I had to leave. And he said, oh, I, he says, I, I really wanted your help with something. He said, I have a new machine, and I was wondering if you would try it out. And I said, we should save that for the next visit. And he said to me, he said, it will only take five minutes, and you don't have to take your clothes off. I I thought that was an interesting offer from a man. So I decided that I would go and have this test. Um, what it was is a bone density test. And I got on the bone density test. I didn't take my clothes off. 10 minutes later, there was a printout that showed graphically that I had osteoporosis. Now, this was a guise um, by Dr. Larry because he suspected I had osteoporosis. And he didn't know any other way of um, uh, asking me to get uh, to come to his office and have the test. Now, both of my grandmothers were bent over little ladies. And when they got older, they started breaking bones. I remember very well, one broke her wrist, one broke her elbow. One, uh, another time, uh, one of my grandmothers broke her arm. And I believe they had osteoporosis, but they were never tested. I do, in fact, have osteoporosis. Now, I tell you this story with, for some levity, but also because you shouldn't have to be dating a Jewish doctor in order to get a bone density test in this country. Now, it can't the, hurt. <laughs> well, it, it didn't hurt. Um, and now, of course, because I was tested, I was able to get on the appropriate medication, and I'm on the calcium, and I'm on the hormones. I will never break bones like my grandmother did. Never going to have a straight back, but I'm never going to be in the hospital with broken bones either. I tell you this, 
because osteoporosis is responsible for more than 2 million fractures in this country annually. 87% of the osteoporotic fractures are incurred by people, particularly women, but not solely, over the age of 65, which means the government is paying for these fracture costs. Medicare spends about $19 billion annually as a direct result of osteoporosis-related fractures. Now, this is the problem. Since 2006, cuts enacted as part of the Deficit Reduction Act have reduced reimbursement reimbursement for DEXA scans by 50 percent, and they're going to fall further in January if no action is taken. These cuts are making it impossible for physicians to continue or ordering or offering these important diagnostic scans. Many are returning the machines to the manufacturers. They want them out of their office. My husband no longer has his DEXA machine in his. Now, currently, 15 percent of eligible women in Medicare receive this bone mass a measurement, despite the fact that the scans are included as part of the Welcome to Medicare program. According to one study, the Lewin Group, that many people cite, even assuming the additional cost of the screenings, and that would be a cost of $100 million over a two-year period, over a 10-year period, excuse me, um, the treatment this legislation would actually save $1.14 billion in health expenditures over the next five years. I know that members of this committee agree with me because six of you are co-sponsors of the legislation of Medicare Fracture Prevention and Osteoporosis Screening Act. Now, I understand, Madam Chairman, that there are many competing priorities for health reform, so I'm not asking for full restoration of these cuts. What this amendment will do is restore reimbursements for this important preventative screening to just 70% of what it was in 2006 and just for two years. Why those strange numbers? Because this will allow enough time to carry out the study already included in the bill on the effect of the 2006 cuts. The cost of uh, extending the screening and restoring the money to 70% of 2006 numbers is $100 million over the next 10 years, which is a fraction over the next two years, which I am asking for. I know, and I don't have to wait for this study, to know that this bone density test and uh, actually saves lives. Because another very frightening statistic is if you are over the age of 70 and you break a a uh, hip, and 300,000 Americans um, are in the hospital with hip-related fractures due to osteoporosis. Within 10 months, you will be dead. And that is a statistic that is plain and simple, and all of us can understand it. I ask you with this amazing piece of legislation, put in the $100 million, and let's save lives, and let's get men and women that have osteoporosis but don't know it. It is a silent disease. I would never have known it if I hadn't stated, uh, started dating Dr. Larry. And even with osteoporosis, he married me anyway. So <clears throat> with that, I yield back the uh, whatever time I don't have left, and I thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, you looked a little impish. I think they probably know that story. We'll find out. All right. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Kagan, I believe you're next in seniority. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I really appreciate it. I thought you were going to ask uh, our good representative what they did on their second date. <laughs> we found out that she came up a little short on her calcium deposition. I'm sure that you're being treated appropriately. Uh, I'm here before this committee to discuss this health care bill a health care bill that uh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm here to discuss the health care bill before the House, mm -hmm. a bill that has a tremendous impact on every single one of my thousands and thousands of patients, a bill that will affect every small business owner, a bill that will affect every senior citizen in the country. And I want to reassure all the seniors, contrary to some other comments made here this evening, that they should be reassured that we have every intention of making certain that Medicare will be better and stronger for any number of reasons, partly because we're closing the donut hole, partly because we're going to be negotiating for steeper and deeper discounts from the big pharma, which today has been taking more and more of our elderly and seniors' money. So be reassured, as a senior citizen, we're doing a great deal in this bill to make certain you have a very uh, comprehensive care. 
all throughout the bill, all 1,990 pages of it, there are two references to the word transparent and transparency. Now, when you look at the financial crisis that we have gone through in the past several months, the financial crisis came about in large part because of dark, opaque, and non-transparent markets. Markets where we didn't know what we were buying, markets where we didn't know the price. There are three essential elements that we have to have within this piece of legislation to guarantee that every patient has access to the care that they need when and where they need it. Two of them are in this bill. The first is no discrimination. We're bringing an end to the discriminatory practices used by insurance carriers that cherry pick people out of their neighborhood. That's in the, our bill, it's in the Senate bill, it's in the President's mind, and it's something I ran on in 2005 and won two elections on. We're applying our civil rights that we worked so hard to get in the 1960s, where we got equal treatment at the lunch counter, we want to get equal treatment at the pharmacy counter as well. The second element has to be transparency, where any individual or any business that offers medical services and products for sale to the public must at all times openly disclose their prices, all of their prices to the public, and that is the amendment before you today. There's also going to be a standard plan. Won't it be nice when finally you can compare one insurance company with the other when they're selling the same standard plan? Now, if you check, and I'm sure the staff will follow up, on page 1140, assure, section 1783, assuring transparency of information. Well, what kind of information are we guaranteeing in this bill? Under hospital price transparency, Section 1921A, we're going to get to see the charges for the most common inpatient and outpatient hospital services. The charges. That's not what they take as full payment because everybody knows health care in America is upside down. If you go into the hospital and you have no health care coverage, you get the big bill. If you've got insurance, you get a discount. So we don't need to see the charges. We need to see all of their prices that they've accepted as payment in full. On page 123, the second area of this bill, where it talks about transparency, it's addressing pharmacy benefit managers, transparency requirements. Well, I don't think we should be too impressed by this. And I'll read part B to you. An estimate of aggregate average payments under the contract per prescription. Well, that's really great. The consumer gets to see the average price of the prescription. I wonder if I paid twice or three or four or ten times what Mr. Brady did. Without open disclosure, without transparency and pricing, we'll never know. And that's what my amendment to 36, that's what my amendment will seek to address. Now, this is not a strange subject because I've discussed this with my colleagues, six of whom are on the Democratic side and who have signed on to the idea of transparency. So I'm sure I'm going to get at least six votes on the Democratic side. I won't read your names into the record, but I'll submit it later. But I don't just have the support of Democrats. I have the support of constituents across the country. I have the support of Republicans and Democrats and independents. I've also got the support of Treasury Secretary Timmy Geithner, whose nomination I openly opposed. And he is quoted to have said, well, I have to be perfectly honest with you, Mr. Cardoza. If you have problems paying your taxes, that's an issue. Quote, the lack of transparency in the OTC derivative markets combined with the insufficient regulatory policing powers in those markets left our financial system more vulnerable to fraud and potentially to market manipulation. Without transparency, you don't have an effective marketplace. If you don't have transparency in this bill, you don't believe in capitalism. I've also got the support of Gary Gensler, well, he's chairman of the CFTC, and he's quoted as saying, quote, economists have for decades recognized that transparency benefits the marketplace, close quotes. Well, I've also got one other person, President of Barack Obama, and his quote is, transparency promotes accountability. Well, I think we ought to have accountability in the healthcare marketplace. I think we should finally establish a marketplace with complete and open and honest, transparent pricing, where each and every person that seeks to purchase a prescription drug, if they've got a prescription from their doctor and they go to the pharmacy counter, number one, they should know the price of the pill before they get there. Number two, if you and I have the same prescription, 
we should be allowed to pay the same price and ought to be the lowest price they accept as payment in full. Now, this morning I picked up this. This is something that most members of Congress have bought into. This is the insurance offering for this year. On page 32, it highlights any number, two, four, six, eight, ten different plans one can sign up for. Some are Cadillac, some are Chevrolet, some are foreign born. But all together they show you the price that they'll offer to you. And I'll just read two into the record. The APWU health plan, if you're, your share of your premium for yourself only is $111. Well, that's what they're charging you. I'd like to see all of their charges because maybe they took $50 from somebody else. It's not enough just to know what they want to charge you. I think we ought to see all of their prices at all times. When we finally establish a transparent medical marketplace, we'll be able to use the leverage in the marketplace with large purchasing pools to leverage the price down. I'll finish with one example. This is not uh, theory. This has been done in the state of Wisconsin where we have the best prescription drug purchasing plan in the country. It's called senior care. If you're a senior citizen and low income, you can sign up for $30 a year to be in a buying group. We have over 100,000 people in that buying group. My mother's one of them. On senior care, her medications are about $113 a month. January of 08, I was a bit busy here and I forgot to kick in the $30 for her because she's my dependent. And that price went over $300. So being in a buying group really does work. I think we're going to finally pass legislation by working together. If you're a citizen, you're going to be in with no discrimination. If it's in your body, it should be covered to some degree. And we have to finally get to the point where we know the price of something before we buy it. Like Mr. Sessions has that Coke over there. I'm sure he didn't buy it without knowing the price first, but that kind of transparency is not taking place in health care. I duly appreciate the time that you've given me here tonight, and I appreciate more and more the uh, stress that of everyone here is under because there is not a conversation we're going to have this century that's more important than talking about the health and the lives of all of our constituents in this great land, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity to uh, testify today regarding my amendments to H.R. 3962, the Affordability, the Affordable Health Care for America Act. I appreciate uh, the uh, entire committee's consideration, and I thank you all for, uh, for allowing me to uh, testify as well. Um, I'd like for you all to uh, rule that my amendment is in order, or my, my two amendments are in order. Uh, Madam Chair, the goal of health reform is to expand access to quality, affordable health care. The underlying bill makes commendable strides to expand access, but I believe that we must go a little further to ensure that Americans can afford the care that they need. Many Americans, our relatives, friends, neighbors, suffer from a debilitating uh, disease and chronic illnesses such as multiple sclerosis or severe uh, arthritis or lupus. Um, the medications available, <coughs> excuse me, the medications available to them are so expensive that insurers create so-called specialty tiers uh, within their formularies for these medications. People living with chronic conditions incur heavy financial burdens for treatment and for prescription drugs, and they are, Madam Chair, uh, at the breaking point. High out-of-pocket costs limit access to care and ultimately reduce these uh, people suffering from these chronic uh, diseases, uh, it reduces their chances of living a healthy life. In a recent study uh, of medical bankruptcies, as, ha as has already uh, been pointed out, um, 
medical expenses uh, uh, are, are the number one reason why many people file bankruptcy. And, and also, uh, I think it wor it's worth noting that, um, that if, we, if individuals have to uh, cut up their or divide their medication uh, in, in four ways or in uh, half, uh, to share with a loved one, or just to uh, just to save on the cost of uh, next month's prescription, you just take take this month, have it up, and then you don't have the cost for next month. Those uh, people who are taking the medication at a lower dosage than what was uh, recommended by uh, their doctors end up in bankruptcy, they end up in the emergency rooms of this nation, which local taxpayers end up uh, paying the cost for, for uh, a serious uh, 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 illness that could have been mitigated, the effects of which could have been mitigated if they had only followed the doctor's instructions and had the money to be able to follow through with their uh, prescription uh, purchases. Uh, Madam Speaker, my First Amendment would cap out-of-pocket prescription drug costs at $200 per monthly prescription and $500 per month total. This would apply to all insurance plans, including Medicare Part D. My amendment would also amend the current Medicare Part D exemption process uh, so that low-income beneficiaries can request an exception for specialty tier drugs that would lower their costs. The amendment would also request two MedPAC studies of uh, discrimination and cost sharing. This amendment uh, is supported by the uh, Arthritis Foundation and the Lupus Foundation uh, by way of, uh, or as evidenced by uh, letters uh, dated uh, November 6, 2009, <coughs> from the Lupus Foundation of America and from uh, the Arthritis, Arthritis uh, Foundation, which I'd like to submit uh, for the record. Thank you. My second amendment would build on the underlying legislation by reducing the cap on out-of-pocket medical expenses from $5,000 annually to $1,250 quarterly. People whose care results in high out-of-pocket costs could easily reach the $5,000 limit in a one or two month span. This is potentially unaffordable for people with chronic disease and dividing the cap quarterly would achieve the same policy outcome while increasing its uh, affordability. According to a 2008 study by the Commonwealth Fund, more than half of chronically ill patients did not get recommended care, fill prescriptions, or see a doctor when sick because of the costs. My amendment will reduce out-of-pocket costs for the most expensive prescriptions, thus making health care uh, affordable for some of our country's neediest citizens, and that includes our, our elderly. And with that, uh, I appreciate your consideration, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a brief comment on the gentlelady's uh, amendment here. I didn't mean to, but, but there are some really very dire statistics for osteoporosis. One, if you fall and fracture your hip and you're over 70, 40 percent of the patients in one year are not alive happened to two family members of mine. Forty percent are institutionalized, which costs us tremendous amounts of money, and only 20 percent of patients are actually at home taking care of themselves one year after a fracture if you're over that age. So it is extremely important. If you die, you just die. But, but uh, I had a grandmother and a father-in-law, both had died that way. So just, uh, just to comment, um, my amendments are fairly simple, uh, and then I want to discuss uh, very briefly uh, our experience in Tennessee with a public option. One is to remove from page 32 to 38. In, in 1973, we had an issue in Tennessee very much like what you're hearing here, is that we had rising health care costs, and we're not a very rich state, so we had a lot of uninsured folks. And we had Medicaid, and we asked HHS for an exemption 
uh, from that program to try a managed care plan. We put eight managed care organizations together in that plan, <clears throat> and you could compete for the business, much like you hear here and now. Uh, ten budget years later, our costs had gone from 2.6 billion to 7.5, and then 8.5 billion, causing a real crisis in state revenue. As as Congresswoman Blackburn said just moments ago, uh, it absorbed all the new state dollars and a third of our state budget. We found that 45 percent of the patients who got on Ten Care had private health insurance and dropped it and got, or their companies dropped it, and they got on, much like I think what will happen here with this plan. The other problem with the program was this, is that Medicaid, and, and in our instance, TenCare, paid less than 60% of the cost of providing the care. It was a real issue and problem. Our Medicare patients paid 90, about 90% 90 in our area, and obviously we heard about rural areas here a minute ago, extremely important because I live in Mr. Cardozo's interested, and I certainly am living in a rural area, paid about 90 percent. The rest of those costs are shifted to our private patients. And in Tennessee, it was as much as $1,800 a year of that money is shifted. What I am concerned about in, in the public option is it will be another government program that won't pay the cost of the care. And the issue for me as a physician was I couldn't find private, uh, I mean, the primary care physicians to take care of those patients. And that's where you hurt quality. When you have a patient that doesn't have access to a physician, and you know that the quality is not going to go up. So that is the problem that we're dealing with, and it was a huge problem in Tennessee. And what our governor is concerned with now, Governor Bredesen, who's a Democrat and has done a, a, a yeoman's job in that state, his concern is with the Medicaid, uh, new, the expansion of Medicaid, it will expand our state's, uh, once again, uh, the state's share of that. We can't afford it, and as a matter of fact, in the current economic crisis, we can't even accept any more children on S-CHIP right now. We can't even match the S-CHIP. That's the kind of physical problem we're in. Um, I, I would be glad to answer any questions that you or the other panel members may have, but I did want to bring that in front of this committee, and, and I would like to, at the end of the uh, testimony, I'll withdraw my amendments, if that's uh, okay with the chair. <clears throat> discussions with Dr. Kagan throughout this process, and uh, I think that transparency is a very, very, very important thing. And, uh, nice to have Mr. Johnson, Mr. Brady, and Mr. Rowe here as well. I have no questions, but I also thank all of the, our distinguished uh, guests for first their patience uh, and then uh, their participation and ideas. I did pediatric allergy, asthma, and immunology. I was thinking that was correct. I was not clear in my mind. Uh, how, and I'm for what you said about listing prices. How uh, realistic is it to assume that you would front prices up for people? And, and, and would you have to have one for one insurance plan or another? Or, well, let or me, are you suggesting, look, it's, it's $18 for this and 16 for that, but if I do this and this, can you effectively do that? Let me give you a few examples. And, and you're going to be surprised to know that the hospitals are ready to compete with one another. The outpatient medical clinics are ready to compete with one another, not just about price, but about the quality of their service, quality, price, and service. So when you go to the hospital for an MRI of your knee, many members are walking three or four or five miles on this pavement here in this this is a tough job, and they might hurt their knee like uh, some people I know, and they go for an MRI. Well, if they don't have insurance, they'll say, well, what does it cost? And the hospital will tell them, well, for you, it's going to be $1,400. But wait a minute, what if I've got Blue Cross? Well, then it might be $900. What if I got Medicare? Well, then it's $413. So I think it's compelling to say to the hospital, just show me all of your prices so that when you go to the hospital to get your MRI, you get to see that somebody got that test for 413, but they're asking you to pay 400. It will begin the conversation, because I think that offering of 1400 is the first offering. It's the initial offering. At a doctor's office, if you're going in for an office visit, yes. I think they should show you what prices they're charging. 
based upon what insurance you've got. If you call up any medical care facility today and just ask them, what does it cost for a bone scan? The answer you get is, well, what insurance do you have? Well, that's true. Well, that's the wrong answer. It ought to be, well, here are all of our prices. And I think it ought to be online. And I think that the uh, gentleman who developed Google's search engine could really provide a service to everybody. They can map out the pharmacies and the prices of gas stations. They can map out the prices of hotels. They can show you prices for Priceline and other competing uh, entities for airline tickets. I think it's really good old American competition that will drive prices down. Now, you're going to hear the argument that transparency in prescription drug purchasing for the federal government, according to a CBO study, may, and I repeat, may drive prices up to the federal government. Well, the CBO has been wrong before. They were wrong with the uh, Medicare Modernization Act of 2003. They were only off by 40 percent. They said it would cost 40 percent more than it really did. It was 40 percent cheaper for the federal government. But one of the major problems in health care today is the federal government, because the federal government is underpaying for Medicaid services, don't cover the overhead costs. They underpay for Medicare, Medicare so. most of the time, and that leads to the cost shifting. So when you've got all that cost shifting to the private sector in an economic time like we have today, in a severe recession, the private sector can't absorb that cost shifting hit. And that's why you see and hear from your constituents, particularly small business owners, we can't take this hit anymore. People have to understand they're either going to have no job and good luck with your health care coverage or a job and no health care because the prices are going up by 30 percent in my district in January 10 because they can because these insurance carriers don't compete against one another. That's why we want to get that idea in. It was brought up by every party member to get rid of totally the antitrust exemption for these insurance carriers. Let's allow them to compete head to head. If they're selling a standard plan and showing you the prices, then you've got real competition. What's interesting is Dr. I've Rowe. had no small business come to that conclusion. They came to the conclusion, let me get all of my health care on a free tax basis well, I'm, and, yeah. and allow me to be, instead of the small plans, into a larger plan like uh, roofers, like you know uh, construction, and be in larger pools. They've never said to me, you know, the, the reverse of that, that we well, watch necessarily what, have to do something. They wanted the cheaper plan. Take a look at what would happen. In my uh, region of Green Bay, a large employer in Green Bay sent me an email, and it said, don't give up the public option. I just got a quote from Blue Cross. It's going up 29.3%. Yeah. I need some way to keep them honest on a level competing playing field. But I would say with transparency... If Blue Cross gives a large employer a significant discount, yeah. then the single mom and the small business mom and pop shop will say, well, that ought to be my price too. Well, I, I, I would hope that every member of this body who voted for it, those who vote against it could say it, but voted to increase those costs too and put a significant uh, cost factor on that, the rising of, of the cost, which is... Uh, so we need to take responsibility for what we this do. Dr. Good old American Dr. Economic, Dr. Economic, Dr. Economic. Just yes. one brief comment. And the, the problem, and I agree with everything you said about transparency, the problem with it is Medicare and Medicaid fix the prices. And when the prices are fixed lower than the costs, it's very difficult to have a competitive environment. And that's the problem when you get a urologist or a family practitioner or someone who has a disproportionate share of our Medicare patients who, who desperately need to be seen those costs, those prices that are fixed, they're not, they're not in a competitive market. And so the, the, uh, the, the free market system can't work there. That's the problem with, with, with what he was saying. All right. I yield that myself. All right. Appreciate it, thank you very much. And I thank you all, gentlemen. You know, I'm here long enough to see more physicians come here, and it's helpful. However, I do feel that you all are running us lawyers or, or race for our money about being able to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you all. The next, the next panel, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, uh, Ms. Dahlkamper, Ms. Emerson, uh, Mr. Fleming, and Mr. Klein.
Oh, uh, well, Mr. Klein, then we'll call you up, Ms. Dahlkamp, please, Ms. Yeah, okay, you want to come with the rest of the panel, okay. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee and Mr. Klein. Mr. Scalise, are you with this crowd? Come on. Um, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, uh, many members have said that, but we do thank the Rules Committee for its indulgence. And I might add, I am also here supporting what I hope you'll get a chance to mark up, which is H.R. Uh, 3961, the Medicare Physician Payment Reform Act of 2009. Uh, I support the underlying premise of this legislation, which is universal access uh, to all Americans uh, for health care, uh, and primarily note uh, some very important changes dealing with no pre-existing disease will deny you the right to insurance, uh, lowering premiums for all Americans, and certainly uh, the public option. The first premise that I mentioned is the basis of my amendments, which are amendments two and three, which have to do with physician-owned hospitals. I'd like to utilize the terminology physician-aligned hospitals. And I just uh, share generically with my colleagues uh, pictures of current physician-owned hospitals that have state-of-the-art equipment, that have emergency rooms, uh, and are serving uh, communities, both rural and urban, and frankly, uh, provide a great deal of service. In my own state, uh, for example, physician-owned hospitals employ 20,525 people in the state. Uh, the hospital projects under development in the state would employ another 13,250. Uh, those jobs, obviously, <clears throat> as the amendment is presently constructed, uh, the legislation presently constructed, would probably be interfered with. Nationally, there are more than 65,000 people employed at physician-owned hospitals. And if the new 124 new projects are completed, another 25,000 jobs will be created. Again, jobs don't equal <clears throat> access to health care, but it is certainly